Good morning. I'd like to call this meeting to order and thank you for your patience. Uh, could the clerk please call the roll? Supervisor Zaragoza? Here. Supervisor Long? Here. Supervisor Huber? Here. Supervisor Parks? Here. Supervisor Bennett? Here. Could you stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Hand over heart. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And um, I'd like to modify the agenda a little. We're going to go with the uh, moment of inspiration, and then we'll have our election of the chair. And this morning, I'm really pleased for our moment of inspiration that we're honored to have uh, the Reverend uh, Dana Warson, uh, Orsop of uh, the United uh, Universalist Church, uh, brings us uh, her passion uh, to grow our spirits. And uh, I had the pleasure of watching her in action. It was uh, while we had the celebration of uh, really a remarkable man, and I'm going to ask the board to adjourn in memory um, of him uh, later today. So, Reverend, thank you very much for being here. Right. So, uh, I'd like to thank you, Board Chair, still, uh, uh, Bennett, for, for this invitation, and I am honored to speak um, to all of the supervisors. And first, I want to thank you for your public service. It takes courage and commitment, passion and, com and compassion to serve your communities in this way, perhaps more than ever now in our fraught times. And I am the Reverend Dana Warsnop, Minister of the Unitarian University. Universalist Church of Ventura, a congregation that has been serving this community for more than 60 years. Uh, we you use are guided by two overarching principles. We affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person, and we have a profound awareness of the interdependent web of creation of which we are all a part. And this guides our personal spiritual paths and carries us out into the community. Every human is worthy of respect and dignity, and deep down each of us is connected to each other and to all of creation. Um, this, um, we need each other and we affect each other on the earth, whether we fully realize it or not. And I do thank you for your service in these complicated, divided, and sometimes rancorous times, because I think that governance on the local level may be our greatest hope in finding our way through. Uh, we are living at a critical time, and even in Earth's, in human and even Earth's history, a Buddhist teacher of mine has said that we are alive at um, what might be a great turning, a shift in our understanding of humanity and life on our precious planet toward interdependence and cooperation, or it could be the great unraveling when things fall apart. We need to do all we can to support this turning toward one another, toward a sense of how issues are ultimately all connected. I suspect that you know of my congregation's devotion to serving people in our community who are without homes or shelter. In this, we are guided by the dictum in so many faiths that we must care for the most vulnerable. What, great, what the great teacher Jesus called the least among us. Yet that, our call also carries us to be equally concerned to creating, uh, about creating a sustainable environment and working for the rights of immigrants to our land and for greater income equality. Everything is so connected. I, th I thank you all for your part in creating the shelters in both Ventura and Oxnard um, for our homeless neighbors. It is an ongoing challenge, and we well know that this is only the beginning, the only a part of the solution. We need more affordable and very affordable housing, yet more housing means more people who need water and transportation even as we live in a climate emergency that requires us to conserve water and reduce our 
fo and reduce our use of fossil fuels. We need resources to help people get off, get, get off and stay off the streets at a time when families are feeling squeezed by incomes that aren't keeping pace with expenses. And these are just a few of the intersections of the work before you. And it's going to require a change in our thinking, perhaps a whole new framework in the way we all operate. And yet this needn't be a zero-sum game with winners and losers. I truly believe that there are ways to address these issues that will benefit us all. Um, changes, yes, and yet I think we can live richer, more meaningful, and deeply connected lives. The decisions you are making at this powerful and local level will affect generations. And sometimes I don't envy you. <laughs> And yet, sometimes I completely envy you. You are sitting in a place where your work can make a real difference in so many lives. And so, I leave you with this prayer. Holy One, gracious God of many names and no name, mystery beyond all naming, Spirit of life which dwells within and among and beyond us this day and always. May these good women and men who have committed themselves to the service of a greater good, our common good, may they move with compassion, wisdom, and courage. May they listen carefully carefully to the voices of the poorest among us, those poor in spirit and resources who often are not heard above the voices of those more powerful and privileged. May they listen well to each other. May they lead from faith and not from fear, even in these perilous and anxious times. Oh, tender, loving presence, may you encourage them. Indeed, put courage into these good men and women, reminding us all of how much we need one another. Amen. Blessed be. Namaste. Salam. Shalom. Peace. May it be so. Thank you very much. Your words, as the last thing that I do as the chair of this board, uh, were as we expected, quite inspirational. The work of your congregation has been inspirational over the years for many of us here in Ventura County. And I think uh, Harold uh, Cartledge, probably more than, more than anybody in the congregation, represents that. And um, I asked the board to adjourn in memory of Harold. Um, Harold did a tremendous work in the homeless community, helped create the Social Services Task Force, worked down in River Haven all the time, and I, I'm sure he would have been at our homeless shelter that's getting ready to open up at the end of January constantly, um, but is just a representative of how much the Unitarian church community and congregation steps up for one social issue after another. If we have a cause in the city of Ventura, you find Unitarians rallying around that cause. And so thank you very much, and I think it's really appropriate to have you uh, end uh, my term here as the chair of the Board of Supervisors. Appreciate that. Thank you. And now uh, we're ready for the election of the chair and vice chair. I'd like to uh, <clears throat> nominate um, Kelly Long as the chair and Linda Parks as the vice chair. Second a motion. It's been moved and seconded. We're ready to vote. There we go. He, uh, all right. It's been it's been moved and seconded. And that's unanimously approved and uh, congratulations, Supervisor. Congratulations.
Congratulations, Supervisor Long, and we are, uh, we'll take a moment here to change seats. Thank you. I would like to take this moment to say thank you to Supervisor Bennett for your dedication and service of this board as chair for last year, and also you've been chair several other years, but this one is even more special. And I just want to say thank you so much for your dedication, uh, all you that you do for Ventura County. Um, being chair is maybe, you know, easy for some, but you make it look really easy. So thank you so much, and I want to provide this for you as well. Thanks for your contemporary. And, and thank you for reminding me all the times so to close the public hearing, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and sure. thank you also uh, for the good job as chair, for always keeping us on time, and also really want to thank your staff, because I know it's a lot more work for your staff, so mm -hmm. good luck. Thank you. Uh, thank you too. Supervisor and Bennett. Great job. Thank you for an excellent uh, year, and did, you did a good job, and and I know you're going to go into uh, some more um, additional responsibilities in, in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can we can we cut out that clip that Supervisor Park said about me being on time and send that to Supervisor <laughs> Foy? All right, a retired Supervisor Foy. Right. You did a great job. Now, um, with switching the seats, yep. do you yep. want to come over here? And I didn't know if, Linda, are you good there? Or did you want to switch with uh, Supervisor Huber? I just thought I'd ask. I'm giving everyone options here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fine, if you want okay. to. I kind of like sitting next to you right there. <laughs> so you want me you want to stay there? It's up to you. No, I don't fine. care. Oh, it doesn't matter to me. You know, back in the day, I did want to be closer to the center. Okay, there you go. Okay. okay. Uh, this is the clip that says item 38. And then I need a... Thank you. Thank you. Can I move over here? Yeah, it's here. Now, now. Hi. Hi. Try to keep it in the same pen. <laughs> Boy, you guys already got that changed. Good for you. Well, we had a long enough break. We should have been able to make that change. Yeah. Yeah. John, I'll, I'll miss you over there. <laughs> okay, Miha. <laughs> okay, I'm going to miss all the Mihas. <laughs> Yeah, can you give it always makes me feel very welcome over there and fed. Make sure I get the snacks and all that. You do yeah. You don't. You don't want me hangry. There you go. <laughs> all right. Is everyone situated? Let me know when we're ready to begin. See, I know there's particulars. Is that because we're going to cry? Or? Yes, you're going to cry. <laughs> I'm going to make you cry, John. Okay, so it's my pleasure now to chair the board, and please, if I screw up someone's name, don't kill me, just remind me how it's being pronounced. Um, I'm really, it's going to be an honor to serve for everyone this year, so I'm looking forward to it, and with working with um, our vice chair, Supervisor Parks, it's going to be a great leading ladies time, and we're even in our matching blue, which we had no plan of that, so I just want to make sure people know that. All right, we're going to be moving on to uh, the minutes. If we can get does it, a motion on the minutes, is there any changes, corrections, anything? We have a motion. We need a second. All right, motion and second, if you could please vote. <coughs> All right, the minutes from December 17, 2019 has been approved. Next up is agenda review. 
Uh, Mr. Powers. Thank you, Chair Long. Uh, item 34, Public Works Watershed Protection District, adoption of a resolution authorizing and directing the execution of a joint exercise of powers agreement creating the Carpentry of Basin Groundwater Agency, request removal from the agenda. And item 45, County Council, adoption of a Board of Supervisors initiated interim urgency ordinance prohibiting the outdoor planting of hemp in specified portions of the unincorporated area of Ventura County. 33 public comment letters, a memo from Supervisor Parks regarding SOMAS MAC recommendations, a comment letter from APAC, a comment letter from Michael Rabkin, and a comment letter from the City of Camarillo have been submitted. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any mo other modifications on the agenda? Madam Chair, um, I uh, unfortunately am not going to be able to be here for item 45. Um, and uh, I have, it is a, it requires a four-fifths vote. Uh, I have two suggestions for the board. If the board is all in agreement, four of you are in agreement, uh, and you decide to vote on it, that's fine. Uh, the other possibility is for us to do what we did recently, which is have the, have the complete hearing and only continue the board vote and deliberation to the next meeting. And I would then be able to watch all of the uh, board hearing and all of the testimony that came in. Uh, and that way we wouldn't have to have a second long hearing on it. Uh, and county council, you would agree we, that is an option for the board also. to carry it on to the next to next meeting, so. And isn't the next meeting um, in January Thousand 21st, Oaks. the evening meeting in Thousand Oaks? Thousand Oaks, that's right. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I um, is it inappropriate for, for me to share my thinking about the hemp item at this point in time, or? Yeah. I, I think, yeah, anything other than just procedural. Great, should okay, save thank you. Time, certain time. Thank you. Thank you for letting us know about that. Right. We'll Great. make that thank call. You. On, on that at the time on the item. All right, is there any other agenda review changes? If not, if I can get a motion to approve. A motion. Okay, you can click your screen. Thank you. And a second. Motion and second. Please vote. Uh, agenda has been approved. Next item is the consent agendas. Uh, is there any questions on this one? I believe we have a speaker on 17. No, it's not on my screen. I just hear there's a speaker. Thank you. All right, we have three minutes uh, for Shelley Moore on item number 17. Good morning, uh, Michael Powers and Board of Supervisors. Can you turn that uh, I am a resident, my name is Shelley Moore. I'm a resident of Ventura County, actually in Steve Bennett's uh, territory. And I am a nurse at Ventura County Medical Center. I'm here as a community member, but also as a nurse at Ventura County. And I just want to uh, express my thanks to the board for uh, providing a police officer in our emergency room. Um, this is a huge value. And um, I know that often the board does not get a vote of thanks, but I just wanted to express my thank you for providing this service to us. And I encourage your continued support of this service because this practice ensures um, for us, it's not only those that work in the hospital, the safety of the staff, but it also assists with, this, with the um, health and welfare of our patients, their families, and then also we that are there, uh, the staff, and it's all the staff, the physicians, the nurses, and all the ancillary staff. And so for that, I say thank you, and I encourage your continued support. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Nice of you to come and say thank you. Yes, really appreciate it. And please, the nurses, thank them for all that they're doing for us. We really appreciate it. Okay, there's no more speakers on the consent item. If there's no changes, if I can get a motion. It's been motioned and second. 
Please vote. Motion is approved unanimously. Next item is the public comments. Do we have any public comments on non-agenda items? Oh, we got it now. All right. <coughs> we will have three minutes. The first one is Megan Edwards, and on deck is Alexa Parks. Good morning, Madam Chair, Mr. Powell, members of the board. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Megan Edwards, and I'm a resident of Ojai and a representative of Zip Health. I'm here to request approval of an urgent matter, Assembly Bill 626, Micro Home Enterprise Kitchen Operations, signed into law 15 months ago and updated October 7, 2019, as Assembly Bill 377, and now designated urgent and immediate. This law focuses on creating new jobs for women, immigrants, and people of color. It represents both workforce development and health improvement opportunities. It connects people who love to cook healthy, delicious home-cooked meals with neighbors who want to eat better. Among them, busy, two-income families, working millennials, seniors attempting, and seniors attempting to maintain their health while aging in place and avoiding isolation. The county's opportunity to use micro kitchen, the county's opportunity to use a micro kitchen blueprint already in operation in Riverside, which includes forms and statutory guidelines, will by extension require less resource to establish and launch in Ventura County. As supervisors, would you not agree that you have an enduring passion for fostering cohesive, healthy, strong, and resilient communities? This law offers a call to action to affirm this very goal. What simply remains is for the board to approve Bill 377, already signed into law by the governor and designated as an urgent and immediate matter. Thank you. Thank you very much for bringing that to our attention. Uh, next up is Alexa Parks. On deck is Renee Ayu. Thank you very much. I have to say at the outset, uh, acknowledging Linda Parks. My name is Alexia Parks. I'm no relation. <laughs> However, I'm welcome to be in front of this, I'm pleased to be in front of this esteemed uh, commission and board here. Um, I also am a resident of Ventura County. Um, and I also am speaking again just to uh, reemphasize different points with um, the uh, um, Assembly Bill number 377 that has already been signed into law as stated that uh, relates to the micro um, enterprise home kitchens operations. It uh, was led by uh, Mr. Garcia of Riverside County and they developed the blueprint and all the documents are available online. They have their logo on it. However, Ventura County can take those uh, cookie cutter style basically and put those documents into effect immediately. And that's why I'm here also along with Megan Edwards because I want to speak to um, the fact that we have an internet platform and we have created it. We would like to uh, go ahead and meet with Betty and uh, uh, go through the licensing process because, uh, and also uh, I've talked with Brian uh, uh, Brenner here and uh, he's excited and said this is you know, the state law. Go ahead and get your license, talk to Betty and make that happen. Um, so who do we serve? Uh, we will, um, design, as Megan mentioned, we are designed to serve uh, women, immigrants, people of color. Uh, we will connect people who love to cook. In fact, there are even some here who have told me they love to cook mm -hmm. and others who love to eat, but uh, who want to make a consistent, and everyone loves to eat, right? So uh, they want to be licensed and um, go through the application process and trained in order to be able to take uh, and make delicious, healthy meals from home uh, for those people who are seeking uh, those meals, including anti-inflammatory meals for home. So in that sense, we're addressing economic and workforce development and also, and also healthcare, because these may be people who, are, who love to work, uh, who are connected to churches, um, uh, where uh, the, those who purchase the meals may, may be ordering from other church members, they be, may be members of the social club or seniors aging in place. Um, those who serve um, 
uh, who desire to age in place those seniors um, may be at risk of forgetting to turn off the gas, uh, um, may cut themselves while pre preparing a meal. They may be leaving moldy food in the refrigerator. So there's a health care need there as well, along as, as I said, anti-inflammatory needs. So we um, have done uh, interviews and we have testimonials from people who are retired, who want to cook, and others. So just to inform you and to present a broad, bigger picture. Thank you for your comments. And also, I see that our CEO's office is talking with Mrs. Edwards already to make yes. sure that we get the good information. Mr. Powers? Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for, for bringing this uh, to our attention. Just to let you know, uh, this was an element of our board's economic vitality plan. We thought so this came such a great mm -hmm. uh, idea, great program. So we will connect. Mike Pettit's connecting. You're uh, busy your, and you want to eat and you check it on, right? online. I want this. Workforce development. Thank you. Right here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Renee, and on uh, deck is Sumi Mishma. Good morning. My name is Renee Ayu of the Harbor and Beach Community Alliance. We put a lot of thought into what our opening 2020 message to the board, the CEO, and county residents should be. We want the same thing the board wants, a redeveloped fisherman's wharf that serves the public. We decided it's time to raise issues regarding harbor management. There has unfortunately been a lack of transparency in harbor processes since 2004, especially concerning Fisherman's Wharf area. Over time, as you are aware, this has created wide community mistrust in harbor management. It is not just a handful of us saying this. There are hundreds of individuals who have contributed money to HBCA because they want better harbor management. The harbor, has, the harbor Department has never issued a request for proposal to obtain competitive development proposals for Fisherman's Wharf. We believe good governance requires issuance of a standard request for proposal for projects of this size and importance. The public has been told, and you have been told many times by the Harbor Department, that the only way to revitalize the harbor is with apartments. However, there is an unsolicited proposal for Fisherman's Wharf that includes no apartments. Carl Strawberry Village proposal was sent to the board and the harbor director in October last year. The harbor director spoke to them as early as August 2019. But even after this, he continued to insist at public, official public meetings that without residential, he guarantees that Fisherman's Wharf will sit dilapidated for another five years. He said there is, quote, no magic developer out there to develop Fisherman's Wharf without a residential component. This has proven to be false. Promoting an apartment complex as the only solution for Fisherman's Wharf is wrong. We're not saying that the Strawberry Village is the magic developer, but it certainly shows there are other options. This situation is why standard processes like issuance of requests for proposals are needed. This is the reason other harbors have a harbor commission that oversees harbor management and reports directly to the county board or city council. 2020 is the year to restore the public's trust and create transparency in harbor management. We're here to say we want to work with you to make this happen. We want Fisherman's Wharf redeveloped. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I know that our harbor director is here as well, so thank you. Uh, Sumi, and then on deck is Jackie Pinson. Uh, yes, my name is Sumi Mishima with the Harbor and Beach Community Alliance. Uh, by now, as we all know, the Fisherman's Wharf redevelopment has unfortunately created mistrust of the Harbor Department. It started with the way the current project was selected. Alternative proposals were never presented and the selection process was clouded in mystery. It took multiple public information requests by HBCA before the Harbor Director finally admitted last year that the Harbor Department had never issued a request for proposal for the Fisherman's Wharf redevelopment. One of the largest developments at the most important site, the very entrance to the Harbor. The Harbor Department de deviated from the standard procedure by not properly conducting a competitive bid process for the Fisherman's Wharf redevelopment. The efforts made to find potential developers were limited. It artificially limited potential proposals and did not provide the board with options. 
It also prevented the public from understanding the methods used to evaluate and select the finalists. There is a good reason for having both a request for qualifications and a request for proposal when it involves a large development that is critical to the harbor. There is a very big difference in their purposes and the resulting information they provide. A request for qualification only requires information about background, credentials, and past projects, whereas a request for proposal requires details of what is proposed. It defines what the harbor wishes to accomplish, like attract visitors, and how it would accomplish this. This type of project typically requires a site plan, concept renderings, and elevations, among many other elements. This is why an official request for proposal process is so important. A request for qualifications is simply not a substitute. The Harbor Department has used a request for qualifications to recommend a developer for exclusivity for Fisherman's Wharf redevelopment without a full understanding of what the project might be or investigating any other proposals. The Harbor Department even attempted to hide from the public an alternative visitor serving retail proposal. This unsolicited proposal was offered to them back in August 2019. This behavior has committed the county for the last six years to a project it did not fully understand and possibly tie the county to this developer for many more years to come. There is simply no excuse to continue mothballing valuable harbor land. The public wants the same thing the board wants, expeditious Fisherman's Wharf redevelopment. We ask the board and CEO to initiate a public request for proposal process for Fisherman's Wharf and other harbor parcels that will provide an open competitive development process. Thank you. Thank you. On deck is, uh, well, next is Jackie Pinson. And on deck is Judy Bennett. Duggan. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you. My name is Jackie Pinson with HBCA. It's troubling for the public to hear the Harbor Director, a public official and county employee, continue to make excuses on behalf of a private developer when they fail to deliver on their requirements. In the case of Channel Islands Harbor Properties, it is particularly inappropriate. Channel Island Harbor Properties is a very large, very well financed and very experienced developer. But from the pleas and excuses made by the Harbor Director for extending and amending their ERNs and lease options without paying standard fees for them, most people would think CIHP is some inexperienced developer incapable of delivering on the basic standing standard requirements for moving forward that CIHP has failed to deliver. They've known about them since June 2014. And in January 2018, the county even gave them power of attorney to negotiate on the county's behalf with the city, something that is extremely unusual. But the Harbor Director continues to be an advocate for CIHP, retaining exclusivity for three of the most valuable harbor areas. This is despite their unwillingness to make any meaningful modifications to their high density project since they presented it in 2016. CIHP has also not been required to show the public what their Fisherman's Wharf project will really look like. A true scale model of the project had to be built by our community group, HBCA, and when it was shown, the public was stunned. In a request for proposal process, a major project of this size that covers six football fields, an urban mass model should be required. CIHP's exclusivities have locked out other developers for the past six years. Now, as the public has recently learned, there's an unsolicited proposal from another developer for Fisherman's Wharf who seems willing to submit a pro competitive proposal if given the opportunity in an open and transparent request for proposal process. What's the harm of opening up Fisherman's Wharf Parcel X3 and the portion of Parcels FF1 to competitive proposals? This could motivate CIHP to redesign their project plan for the better. It is the fiduciary responsibility of the board and CEO to decide if continuing exclusivity with CIHP that could mothball valuable harbor land for years to come is in the best interest of the county, the city, and the public. Thank you. Ah, 
Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, hello, my name is Judy Dugan. Um, I live in the county, and I wish you all a happy new year. Uh, and like everyone, I'm sure in this new year, uh, we'd like to get harbor revitalization going. So in 2020, our New Year's resolutions at the harbor should be Brighton's hotel project moves forward without further delays. Uh, piecemeal harbor development planning <coughs> ceases and its public works plan is updated. Open and transparent requests for proposal are issued for Fisherman's Wharf and the three other parcels, X3, F, and F1, and transparency in trust in harbor management and processes can be restored. To restore that will take more than <clears throat> visioning meetings and workshops where the county can hear the public's visioning input. Um, and as the harbor director noted in November, maybe developers, maybe developers will work it in. It would be more effective, as Supervisor Parks pointed out in November as well, if developers competitively presented their proposals and the public identified the features that were important to them. This is why an official request for proposal is so important and a request for qualification cannot be a substitute. Also, Channel Islands Harbor, as you have heard here, uh, may be the last such harbor in California without a Carver Commission. Harbor commissions with the authority <coughs> harbor management and operations are so vital at other nearby small boat harbors like Ventura, Huntington, and Dana Point. Commissions are composed of volunteer, non-paid citizens with set term limits. They're cost efficient. They have proven effective in harbor re revitalization elsewhere. They provide more balanced viewpoints and are more sensitive to local needs. They help prevent mismanagement of public assets and possible corruption. They deal with increasing ocean-related issues such as sea level rise, water quality, <clears throat> seawalls, and dredging that impact local communities. Harbor commissions have become essential, and 2020 might be the right time to start considering one for Channel Islands Harbor. It's important that the board and CEO restore transparency and public trust in harbor management and processes. We are happy to work with you to accomplish this, and we thank you so much for the time to speak. Thank you for your comments. Phil Higgins, and next up is Wendy Steinmetz. Good morning, and I'd like to wish you a happy new decade. What will happen to Ventura County in the next decade, much of it, the, the decision making is right here. An awesome responsibility. I'd like to speak to you about uh, different issues affecting the harbor. We are very concerned that uh, proposals already approved are going to possibly die and developers walk away because of continued red tape. Down at the harbor, we have motels and replacements for old and dilapidated facilities. And we have an approved and a qualified developer. But they have been in extended negotiations. Presently, they must negotiate with Channel Islands Harbor Properties, uh, the division of parcels F and F1. Also before them is the vacation of the end of Peninsula Road for these impending developments. There is an unanticipated revetment improvement that still must be done before those developments may go forward. New codes have been applied, and it will require a redesign of approved projects, or, or uh, plans, excuse me. Another concern uh, is, as of last December, the harbor director, uh, Mr. Sandoval, has indicated there is still no lease agreement and when I say last December, I mean last month. Yet, the California Coast Commission approved the NOID, or Notice of Impending Development, in April of 1918. These extended delays and red tape possibly will cause this developer to assess their situation and to leave or abandon the project. We ask this board and you, Mr. Powers, 
to please oversee these projects to make sure that they are brought to fruition and that the beginning of the demolishment of the old facilities begin in April of this year as promised. We thank you for the time and we wish you well in the next decade in your decision making. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wendy Stein. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Powers. Just to thank the speakers for uh, coming and sharing your ideas and concerns and perspectives this morning. We really appreciate it. Uh, we do have our, our Harbor Director, uh, Mark Sandoval, here, and maybe he could share a few comments. Thank you. So good morning, uh, Chair Long, uh, board members, and uh, CEO Powers. Um, I, I agree with a lot of what you heard here this morning. Um, I, I actually wrote a message, as I do every month, and, and indicated my frustration that nothing's under construction. Uh, but there, are, there were things that, that I do have to speak with. The first is transparency, because I spent all last year doing nothing but being transparent. We had a, a Harbor Academy, all of this open to the public, by the way, um, where we, we uh, had public meetings where we explained what the Harbor Department was all about, talked about finances, our development process, um, our Harbor Patrol, I mean, everything, everything that, that the Harbor Department was. Um, and it was very well received. Um, we did make changes as a result of that Harbor Academy. We changed our development process. We um, incorporated a visioning component to future developments. And along those lines held uh, five different visioning meetings last year, at the, at the second half of last year, um, three of which were by, uh, by invitation only, but two of which were open to the public, where we talked about what the public, we asked what the public wanted with, in regards to development in the harbor. Now we did, we, we spoke a little bit about Fisherman's Wharf, but because Fisherman's Wharf has a, a proposed project, we weren't visioning Fisherman's Wharf, but, but we were visioning the rest of the harbor along Victoria Boulevard or Victoria Avenue on Harbor Boulevard. Um, and I must say, uh, you know, and we did hire a consultant, a, a you know, a, a, an expert in the planning field. And I must say at the, at the end of at least those meetings, we were frustrated because the last meeting we held, and many of the people that were here were there, were, were at that meeting, it, it was just another complaint session. Well, you took the money 20 years ago. The county took all the money for parks. We need that money back. I mean, that's all we heard. The only vision that came out of that public meeting was one individual saying, let's put a, uh, an amphitheater there. And that was the only idea we got in, in that two-hour meeting. Um, I, I do plan on keeping the visioning going this year. I, I plan on actually bringing... Uh, hopefully other other professionals and and, and and keeping it open to the public welcoming welcoming the public um, residents the business community the HPCA I mean it's something that we need to do so but to say that there's a lack of transparency I just think is disingenuous especially with all the efforts we put forth last year um, the, with regard to Fisherman's Wharf we did do two RFQs as as everybody knows I've been very public about it they were RFQs the RFP what an RFP is is that it's taking the respondents to an RFQ and then putting them through an RFP process. The fact of the matter was we didn't get many responses for the RFQ efforts, and we spoke with every, we met with every one of the respondents. An RFP would have simply been asking them for more information through a formal process. We asked them for more information. We, the Channel Highlands Harbor Properties, that's the current developer that has the option for Fisherman's Wharf, they are the third developer that we dealt with for Fisherman's Wharf. The third, the third and last, actually, the third, the, the third of three. The first one we had under contract for five years, they went away because of the recession and they had some internal problems. The second one, Upside, they were there, they, we only were dealing with them for about a year and they saw what it would take to, to uh, develop this parcel and they walked away. Channel Islands Harbor Properties is the third developer that we've been dealing with. We have been dealing with them for since 2015, 2016, and obviously I don't need to, to you know, to go back over all the issues we've had with them, but we're trying to get a development. Um, the city council, council for Oxnard did deny our amendment application, so um, we, we are taking a step back and trying to determine what we could do. And I'm, believe me, the door is not closed to a redesign of the project, and, and that, that is definitely one, uh, one path forward. Um, the, Renee 
mentioned the Strawberry Village. Um, I, they did approach me in August. They told me they wanted it to be confidential, and I kept it confidential. It did become uh, public in October. I've yet to talk to them. I have not talked to a rep because they're in Germany. But I have set a meeting with myself, the, the uh, community development director for the city of Oxnard, and a representative to tour the harbor and tour the city and sit down and talk about the potential for this strawberry village, maybe in the harbor, maybe somewhere else in the city. Uh, but that is something that, we're, that we are looking at, and, and we haven't ignored that as a possibility. Um, with regard to the hotel, again, I, I, I couldn't agree more. We want to get that going. There isn't a lease. We are still finalizing the terms of the lease with the, with the, in, with the, uh, the council, their attorney and our county council and, and us and them. Um, we, all want to, we all want to get this thing done quick. They did have to redesign because a new building code came into effect. That has slowed the process. Um, but believe me, I'm as anxious to get that done uh, as anybody. So we are moving. I mean, the, the, the desires of the community, the desires of the business community, the desires of this HBCA are, our, are my desires also, and I'm sure they're your desires as well. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank, yeah. thank you for your comments. Uh, Supervisor Zara goes yeah, on. Madam Chair, um, thank, I thank all the speakers, and I think it's important that we that we hear from the speakers over at the harbor. But Mark, before you, you sit down, can the revetment project over at the uh, hotel and and, uh, and the parking issues and the and the, the new permits, can you share some more information on Yeah, and, 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 and first, and that is one other thing I wanted to mention, and thank you, uh, Supervisor Ver Zaragoza. The, this, this group, the HBCA con continues to contend mm -hmm. that Channel Islands Harbor Properties, the, the uh, developer for Fisherman's Wharf, has something to do with the development at the end of the peninsula. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely not okay. true. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not true. Mm -hmm. Channel Islands Harbor Properties does have an ERN out there, an exclusive right to negotiate, but they're not holding the project mm -hmm. at all. They know they, they have a remnant parcel. They, they can give us a proposal for it, but they're not holding that up. What's holding it up is the fact we don't have a lease. We're trying to work that through. Mm -hmm. The revetment, it, it, I, I believed that the revetment at some point in time would slow us down, but we were able to get the permitting done for the revetment, get it planned and permitted. We haven't gone to bid yet because we don't want the bid to come in and then us not act on it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the, the revetment is predicated on the start of the hotel. The way it'll work mm -hmm. is the, the hotel, once we get started, the hotel will demolish, they'll demolish the hotel. That's a four month process once they get started. And then they have to stall. They have to stop their project while we go in and do the revetment. And the mm -hmm. revetment's going to take up to six months. And then after the revetment's all done, then they and the marina will come in and finish their development. And the concern so, on the revetment was to do it from shore or, or from the water? From shore. From mm -hmm. shore. It's, we, it's, it's about 50% uh, higher cost to do it from the water. And it's a lot more um, environmentally damaging to do it from the water. Every, you want to do it from the land. And the other thing, too, um, to board members, I met with the uh, residents there a couple of years back regarding new projects, and we set up a flow chart because what I wanted to do, uh, want to see, is to have a pre-review with the Board of Supervisors before we approve any projects. That, that way the community has input on what they want and what they want to do there at the harbor, which I think is extremely important. But the pre-review process, especially with X3, I think is extremely important for all of us. And that's, that's what I alluded to is a visioning process, which we've already started. Okay. Um, in November, we had a public visioning that we included X3, mm -hmm. and, and it turned into a complaint session. I mean, mm -hmm. we really got very, very little out of it. Um, we're going we're gonna, to you know, take a step back. I'm sure we'll, we'll have more public meetings, but maybe you know, uh, do some, some information gathering or some information seeking Via, uh, via the internet, you know, via social media, where we can cast a wider net because we really didn't get much out of that meeting in November. And it was, uh, it was a little frustrating, but, uh, but we're gonna continue the process. And the transparency I think is really important. I know you're, you and your PIO have done quite a bit of work reporting uh, on, your, uh, on your magazine that you have, for lack of a better word, there at the harbor. It kind of brings people up to speed and, and to what's happening. And I'm sure that if any one of the residents would like to have anything put in that on your monthly report, that would be also, I think, a good idea for, for the public. I, I have an unlimited open door, open phone policy. I'm at, I'm at the farmer's market yeah, we have to probably half the time. 
you know, half of the Sundays. I, yeah, I'm, I, I mean, I'm trying everything I can to be open. I'd, I'd love to discuss this more, but I know that we are in public comment. Yes. Thank you. And, and this is a lot of comments. Um, I would appreciate that you bring this to the board when, when we're needed. Yeah. Um, and also to continue the transparency for the community and to make sure that we're all included. Thank you. So, thank you. And thank you to all the speakers, too. All right, that ends the public comment side. Moving on to board comments, Supervisor Zaragoza. Yeah, thank you so much. And again, uh, welcome everybody to our board members and Happy New Year to all. And I hope everybody had a great uh, break or an opportunity for the holidays. I'd like to start by saying that um, on Wednesday, December the 8th, 18th, excuse me, it was a pleasure having uh, lunch with the executive board. You know, we have such a great board here in the county of Ventura. And we had a, the annual gathering over at the rescue mission in Oxnard. And it's what great, great meal that they gave us. You know, rescue mission does a lot of good work for the city of Oxnard. Also, one of the things uh, I want to share is that I attended the United Farm Workers uh, donation of toys. Mike Barber from Santa to the Sea, we put together about 50 toys that we took over to, to the farm worker families. And, and the kids were just really, really happy with those toys. So it's really nice to be there. And, and to share the holidays with them. Also entering into the new year, I met with Captain Aaron Golding. He's the Highway Patrol Commander uh, and Captain here at the in Ventura. And just, he came over to my office to meet, meet with me. And also we have the Highway Patrol goes to our max to get reports. And my understanding is we're gonna have a new a PIO for the Highway Patrol, which is really great. Additionally on Wednesday, it was a pleasure for me to meet with Marvin Booz Marvin Booz is an individual that, that has done a lot of great work removing graffiti, debris, and so forth, not only for the city of Oxnard, but also for the county of Ventura. And I was invited uh, by uh, Marvin Booz to have an interview with Channel 7 there in Oxnard on Patricia and Gonzalez, which really worked out pretty good. Marvin has done an excellent job for the community. He was a neighborhood chair for, for one of the neighborhoods in Oxnard. And, it was just great to meet with him and be with him for, for that um, uh, recognition. And also, um, I attended the grand opening for the Ventura County Family Justice Center. And Michael Powers is there and uh, Supervisor Parks and some other individuals. And I just want to thank the RDA and also Michael Jump, you know, for that uh, opening of that um, Ventura County Family Justice Center. And that's to assist people, families and people that have been abused um, physically, mentally, and sexually, so which really is a good place for them to go and get some help here in uh, in the county. And, and, and lastly, I'd like to uh, adjourn in memory of of uh, Rosie Sotelo. She was a beautiful lady that died in Oxnard. Everybody liked her. She was the matriarch of the Soto fa uh, Sotelo family. And I'd like to take the time to send my or share my deepest sympathy and condolences to the Sotelo family. And I'd like to adjourn in memory of the rest of the folks in this Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, mm -hmm. Supervisor Bennett. Thank you. Uh, while I'm uh, doing the adjourn in memory, <clears throat> could the uh, uh, booth up top put up the uh, sock drive uh, PowerPoint slide that's uh, up there? Well, actually, we got it right now. I won't, I won't wait. Um, we have a sock drive that we're coordinating through my office here in this uh, building, this administration building. Uh, it's been really successful in the past, but homeless people, the number one thing that they ask for are, are clean, dry socks. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so if people can come up with socks, uh, particularly with the launch of the shelter being uh, the, the 27th, and we're going to uh, collect them here. So there's going to be a drop-off spot uh, in the lobby of the HOA building, and we'll try to coordinate that again uh, uh, with my office. So I hope you can help us with that. And um, with uh, that as my uh, one announcement, I'd like to ask the board to adjourn in memory of people on this list, and I mentioned Har Harold Cartledge um, and uh, the, the wonderful um, service that they had at the Unitarian Church for him. But I, I'll tell you what it reminded me, and I just want to pass this on as a personal note. I went home and told the three the three young people in our house that are in college, just getting out of college, trying to figure out where they're going to go and everything else, and they're all wondering whether they're going to be successful and happy and everything else. 
And it reminded me to go home and tell them, you're not going to get happy until you start thinking about something bigger than yourself. And Harold Cartledge was maybe the most humble man. And if you looked at him, you would not pick him out of the crowd as somebody who was special. But he made everybody feel so good because of how much he cared about trying to help everybody in the world around him. And so he was the happiest guy I knew. And uh, so just remarkable, a remarkable reminder uh, that it's, uh, it's uh, as, as, they, as somebody said about him, you know, you can't get any more in life than you give. And uh, just a, a, a moving, uh, a, a moving life and a moving celebration. Eight, Eighty years old, and maybe five hundred people there at his service. Should we all be so lucky? Thank you very much. That's wonderful, Supervisor Huber. Do you yes. have any public comments? Yes, I would. Uh, or your board comments? I do. Thank you. I would like to wish everyone a happy and healthy New Year. Hope your holidays uh, were, were festive. I'd like to thank the fire department for reaching out to my office to participate in the Spark of Love toy drive that we had. It was so rewarding to participate. We had a great number of toys donated to our Simi Valley office. I look forward to participating again next year. Last year, I'd like to adjourn and remember the people on the list that I've given to the clerk of the board. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Supervisor Price. Thank you. Uh, I would uh, also like to uh, compliment the wonderful work of the rescue mission and that we had our, our luncheon out there. We, too, in my office, are collecting coats for the rescue mission now, and people can drop them off at the office in Thousand Oaks. So uh, also appreciate the wonderful opening and the vision and the implementation of the Family Justice Center, and really congratulations. Uh, to our district attorney, Totten, and Michael Jump, and also um, our Sheriff Ayub. Just amazing, you know, a, a center specifically for people who have suffered abuse, and uh, just wonderful to see that come together. So kudos to them. I also want to thank Ed Williams. He came to our SOMAS Municipal Advisory Council and really gave a great, a uh, lot of uh, presentation as well as answering a lot of questions about hemp, which is a big concern out there too. So thank you, um, Mr. Williams, for that. At the Clean Power Alliance, uh, our board approved a substantial amount of money for EV charging stations specifically in Ventura County, over half a million dollars, and they were looking at continuing to do that to meet the state's uh, challenge to get some, I think, 25,000 chargers out. Um, throughout the next few years. I'm sorry, 250,000, <laughs> that's a big difference. 250,000 charging stations um, by 2025. That's a goal of the state. And the Clean Power Alliance is uh, stepping up for Ventura County with over a half million dollars uh, going on for the next few years. So good to see that. Uh, also, I wanted to, uh, I don't know if, Mike, you're going to mention that the a wonderful work of the Camarillo Hope Project and our Sheriff's Department. Um, if that's not on your list, I'll, I'll go there. Is it on your list? I'm going to let you do that then. <laughs> okay. Um, this is a, a beautiful story. Um, the Sheriff's Department through the Police Department in Camarillo, was it on your list? No, nope, please okay. go. <laughs> it's gone. Right, I'll go ahead. Uh, but they have just done such a magnificent job reaching out to people who are on the streets, who are homeless. Uh, officer uh, encountered a homeless encampment in Camarillo, mm -hmm. and they contacted the family of the homeless individual, worked out a schedule, uh, assisted him with making sure that he has work as well as mental health services, and was able to help reunite them with his family. And I just, you see that above and beyond the service that our sheriff's department has offered, as well as through the collaboration of our behavioral health department and other county uh, services. So it's just, what a wonderful story. And I think that hit the news throughout uh, our region and just great to see that. I was also able to attend an Eagle Scout in honor of Joseph Alvarez and really enjoyed that. And also one of those heartwarming stories on the holidays, um, Westminster Free Clinic had a huge event for their children. Um, that they uh, that come and get their services, um, health services, and the, their parents' services. Um, so they had this great party, and they found out like a few days before that Toys for Tots ran out of toys, 
and Francine Spriegel, who's a wonderful individual who also happens to work for the City of Thousand Oaks. But on her spare time, she got the message out through social media, and the next thing you know, they just filled the room with toys, and it was just so nice to see. So kudos to Francine. It was great to see the children at Westminster Free Kennedy get those toys. Um, and then there's just been uh, two pieces of nice press. Um, one is on um, our... Clean Power Alliance, as I mentioned, this is on the front page and this great story in the uh, Caneo Valley uh, Greater Chamber of Commerce, so I wanted to pass that out for you. And also, um, it, I think we have a slide <coughs> on it, the um, Farm Bureau's magazine, um, which is Farm and Ranch, put out a wonderful um, report on the Growing Works project. And and uh, if you have that slide, if you can put that up. But uh, I, I also have a story for you with wonderful photos. And Growing Works is doing a great job of getting job training to people who are our clients, who are in our behavioral health department uh, client services. So I just wanted to present that. And if, if you can't see the uh, slide, which is understandable because it's not up, here's a picture. <laughs> And um, with that, I would just ask that uh, we close in honor of the people on my list and thank you for the opportunity. Oh, there, there's the photos and great photos that were in the um, Farm and Ranch magazine of the Farm Bureau. And, and just a wonderful story, too, you know, and things that they could still use, uh, donations for farm tools or nursery tools, and then also... These individuals are ready to go into the job market, so looking for jobs. If you have some, you can contact Turning Point Foundation. Thank you. Thanks. You know, Supervisor Parks, that Growing Works is going to go down as, as, as one of the all-time uh, incredible things down in Ventura <coughs> County, and you should feel really good about that. <coughs> it is exciting, and not to mention they have the best plants ever. I mean, I just hear wonderful reports from landscapers how wonderful these plants are, drought tolerant, a lot of native plants you can't get anywhere else. So you can contact knowingworks.org. Thank you. Thank you very much. What a wonderful thing. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the board and also Mr. Foley and Ms. Dr. Frank Kauser. Uh, the first child board in Ventura County, of course, was Santa Paula Hospital. Yeah. I have to make sure everyone hears this, ring it through everywhere. It's such a huge deal for us with the safety net of our community. The doctors there, the nurses there. I just want to make sure that we say thank you. I know VCMC is awesome as well, um, and we have such great things. But uh, as it's being, you know, in my district, I have to make sure that everyone knows this. Um, but Mateo James and Mira Montez was born at 12:09 on New Year's uh, Day, weighing six pounds 18 inches. His mother, Gabriela Aguera Mira Montez's father was the late Peter Aguera Jr. Um, he was our Ventura County Sheriff's deputy that was killed in the line of duty when Gabriella was three. And uh, just something very special, Mateo's middle name, James, is uh, named for Captain James Fryhoff, who is Peter Aguirre's junior's partner the night he was killed. And so Captain Fryhoff has recently been named the new police chief of Thousand Oaks, which we're very honored to have him there. But I wanted to take that special moment. We are always in a busy schedule, but that's a really important celebration for all of us. And so I want to make sure everyone knows that the Santa Paula Hospital is thriving and strong, and we've had lots of babies. So thank you very much for the board's um, support on that. Also attended the CEO's lunch with the mission and getting the tour there of how, how wonderful services there are for um, our, our community members. Um, I'd also like to say thank you to our sheriff's, associate, our sheriff's department and our fire department. This holiday season is always a busy one with fitting the needs of our community as they need help. Um, recently, just even yesterday, we had two threats um, on social media in, in our schools about um, threats for shootings and so forth. And I want to make sure people are urging to contact our law enforcement. If you hear anything, um, we are on top of it. I just want to say thank you to everyone who is looking out for our community. Um, these type of situations are very scary. And we are trying to create environments of learning and safety 
and to make sure that people um, know who to reach out to, especially we have a lot of mental illness and so forth, that we need to make sure that people are getting the, the resources they need to, to assist themselves. Um, and with that, I just want to say thank you to uh, Todd, uh, Mr. Totten, and the uh, foundation for the Family Justice Center opening. That is huge. They, um, in five months, they did over 2,000 cases. Um, many of my friends, actually, have been helped in, in that center, um, I have to say, and, and I'm proud of that because I think it's important that we have that resource there to help those that are in need. And I just want to thank all the employees also, um, you know, with Borderline, with so many different things that we have had that our employees have gone way beyond to help our community has been really strong. And I want to say thank you to the foundation also who is raising money to keep this um, family center moving. I'm on the AOJ, which is a, um, a justice uh, committee for the state, and we're talking about the family centers and how important those are. Um, so I just want to say thank you. Uh, also, in regards to state budgets, if everyone is paying attention to the governor's budget, we had some calls on Friday. Um, very excited to hear where where the budget's going. Um, I know that Mr. Powers will hit all the details, but, or maybe, maybe you won't. Yeah, you will, I figured. Um, but what I do is being on the executive committee for the CSAC and also the board of directors and on the chair for the um, urban counties. Um, what we try to do is make sure our departments know exactly what's going on so we can use this money as best as possible for our departments. So one of the things that we're looking at is mental health task force that the governor is putting together. Um, so we're working with our team to see if we need to be on that, if we need, what do we need to do for the betterment of our community? Um, we have funding in regards to housing because we have changes in housing. We have um, in our, crit our criminal justice with parolees, there's money coming down for that. Even cybersecurity is a big issue for that. So um, we, as board members, have all received the information. Um, we also have uh, e OES and um, fire preparedness and how important, and they've learned, they being um, the state, has learned from <laughs> Ventura County, definitely pre-positioning is really valuable. Yeah. And having three years of fires in our areas, I just want to say thank you to our department heads. Um, the state knows that we are here to help them. And I know even with our agency on aging with Victoria Jump, she's up there all the time trying to make sure um, we do it. I have Barry Zimmerman, who's going to federal for me for NACO to talk about human services. Um, I, I just want to say thank you to our department heads and our staff for really being engaged at the state level and the federal level. More to, will be coming, and I know Mike, Mr. Powers will hit more on it, but it's, it's really valuable. Um, what we're doing as a county and the money that's coming in. So thank you very much. And then also I have those, um, I have to adjourn on memory of those on my list. And I would like to call out um, Rosalie Stewart. Uh, Mrs. Stewart was an amazing elementary school teacher while her husband Bill was at dental school. Um, Bill also served at the U.S. Navy and settled in Port Wyneme. Uh, Mrs. Stewart, she volunteered several capable uh, supports in the arts and education, scouting, spiritual organizations, receiving several awards and honors. Um, and she recently, it was an honor to provide her with the recognition of the Port Wyneme Historical Society for the People Making a Difference Award. I know there's so many in our community, but she was just a, sp a special one. And uh, she is survived by her husband, Bill, seven children, 18 grandchildren, and 14 great-great-grandchildren. So the people in our community don't just uh, stay here. They make a mark here. And I just want to say thank you very much. Moving on to Mr. Powers, our CEO comments. Thank you, Chair Long. Board members, uh, just a couple items. Uh, growing works on that, uh, Supervisor Parks. They produce uh, great plants, but they also produce great uh, workforce. A lot of those folks don't just, individuals with serious mental illness, they don't just get jobs there. They get hired on from there after they've been trained at other local businesses. So it's incredibly successful. Uh, 
the Family Justice Center, I, <laughs> it was an amazing gathering in terms of the turnout, but also the speakers, the victims, also known as survivors, were so powerful uh, and brave in their statements. I think it just says it all when they speak about the importance of, of putting the victims as the focus. Uh, great attendance there, our uh, Auditor Controller, Jeff Berg, Barry Zimmerman, uh, Bill Foley was there. I think that's important because the county family really wrapped around this wonderful program. Uh, you've got uh, HSA, social workers there, uh, behavioral health, uh, alcohol and drug workers, public health nurses were there, ambulatory care, Department of Child Support Services. The list is long, and it's the county family wrapping around and helping people in need, so we really appreciate it. Uh, speaking of people in need, the homeless count will be January 29th. We're really encouraging people to, we've had a lot of signups, but we need more. Uh, and so we're looking forward to, it's just, uh, it's really important, but it also helps uh, bring home uh, the challenges these individuals face in our community. Uh, and so I think it's just a great thing to participate in. Uh, Food Share had their uh, Cantry wrap up event and it's the eighth one time they've done this and our county, this is the biggest one yet, it keeps getting bigger every year, which is great. Uh, our county uh, came in second this year, which made 30 trees. Uh, and I really want to recognize Melissa Livingston from HSA. Every year she champions this for us. The Area Agency on Aging provided 10,000 cans uh, for people in need, uh, and Department of Child Support Services received uh, special recognition. Also on your board's behalf, I attended the Sheriff's Promotion Ceremony and uh, many great people, including Commander Jim Freihoff, uh, who we've already heard about, who will be the Chief of Police of Thousand Oaks. Uh, the Ronald McDonald Walk, uh, which is coming up uh, April 5th, uh, the uh, online link has been activated, so it's a, that last year was the inaugural event. We had a great turnout and hoping for an even better one uh, this year. Uh, as Supervisor Long mentioned, uh, the budget, the state, uh, the governor released his state budget on Friday. I'll just touch on a couple of areas. Uh, he did uh, put uh, folks on notice in terms of Mental Health uh, Services Act funds. He's going to be looking at reforms that may be needed there, and we'll be working with the Behavioral Health Task Force to, to make sure that we're, uh, we're involved in developing those recommendations. Homelessness. We just received some funding uh, from the states, and some of that went to the Continuum of Care Board here locally, and that was allocated. Excellent process. Appreciate Terry Ruth, Ruth from our office uh, really helping to staff that. Uh, and that's the cities, counties, and the community groups uh, coming together to decide <laughs> the greatest need for those funds. <coughs> uh, but the other thing the governor said, which I think is important that we keep an eye on, is he said his impression is that cities and counties don't work well together in this area. And that may be true in other areas, but it's not true here. And our continuum of care works very well together. It's very strong. There was a push by some to have more money sent directly to the counties and cities. We said, we don't need that. Let's put it all to the continuum of care because we coordinate well here mm -hmm. with our cities and our community groups. So uh, we uh, will offer ourselves up to, to show what it can look like if it works well. And that's a credit to the cities and the community groups out there. Uh, as well. Uh, healthcare is going to be huge. We talked about Cal AIM. Of course, now that we got used to that name, they changed it. Uh, so instead of that, it's going to be, let me see, Cal, Medi-Cal Healthier California for All. Yes. So it just rolls right off, right? But it's easy to say. Easy to say. But this is big. This is a tectonic shift in how healthcare is going to be funded and provided and really trying to provide care to the whole person, the medical, uh, the mental health aspects. And for the first time, the state is going to put significant general fund dollars in this. Most of the money that we get from Medi-Cal has been federal that we draw down through our local expenditures here. But now the state's going to put funding in it. But this is a major shift, and I know Mr. Foley uh, has convened a task force locally here of all of our county agencies mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that we're prepared for this and giving input on it uh, as well, including, in particular, the IMD exclusion, uh, that cap, and uh, advocating to, to remove that because we think it's, uh, it's, it's really arbitrary. Right. Local criminal justice uh, reform, a lot's going on, particularly in the probation area. Uh, there's been a lot of changes uh, in, with Prop 47, in particular reducing some felonies to misdemeanors. That has a beneficial effect, but it also has another challenge. A lot of those folks who would have received uh, alcohol and drug services while they're incarcerated are not receiving that now. So uh, we're looking forward to some of this funding and working with our local police departments to help uh, address those challenges. Uh, set up a Department of Early Childhood Development. Uh, and a climate catalyst fund, which will provide low interest uh, loans for low carbon transportation, sustainable ag and waste diversion. And then of course, finally, I think most of you saw setting up a, a drug pricing schedule and a generic contracting program for, for medications. So uh, lots going on there and we will continue to keep you updated. And last and most certainly not least, we're excited to have our new uh, public information officer joining us. Ashley Bautista is here. Welcome. Uh, well, welcome, Ashley. Good try. Ashley's done some wonderful work uh, for the Ventura Police Department as well as the city of Ventura, and we're excited to have her join us and joining uh, Natalie and, and our great uh, PIO department, so more to come there. So thank you very much, and Happy New Year. Thank you very much, Mr. Powers. Lots going on.
Um, a next item is the review. <laughs> next item is the review and discussion and make assignments for our, our board. We have a, a lot of boards and commissions that we are on. Um, good thing that we're all here. You know, the joke is, is if you're not here, you get put on more boards. Um, so <laughs> luckily we're all here right now. Um, I wanted to see if there was any discussions needed. Um, everyone's has the uh, lineup of the appointments. Are there any discussions, changes? I, have, uh, the, I just wanted to ask, uh, both the uh, Ventura County Emergency Planning Council and the Financial Planning Committee, yes. it's the chair and the vice chair. Yes. And so now those become you and Supervisor Parks, correct? Correct. Because on, on the form here, I see it still has me listed. Oh, Financial yes. Planning Committee. And no, the it will be changed to those great. now that we have the election. And the only other one that I have is it has um, myself listed as the alternate on the Ventura Local Agency Formation Committee, LAFCO, mm -hmm. uh, on this form. And um, I would recommend Supervisor Zaragoza stay as the alternate in terms of that. No, I'm, I'm, I'm the regular. I'm, uh, both, of, both of us are regulars, and, and you're the alternate. So there's two supervisors on it, and then there's an alternate. The, the, this is only listed with one supervisor and one alternate. Because uh, my understanding, okay. Lori, because they're, uh, they need to be reappointed, and I'm already there uh, as a regular. So this is just a reappointment. Reappointment. Um, okay. All right, great. Yeah. Okay. So it's the two of you, and then I'm the alternate. Yes. Got it. Yeah. Okay, good. Because they only list one here right. as a regular on the form. And, and, and Supervisor Zaragoza is not listed, yeah. is my point. Very good question. Right. right. That's a good. Supervisor Zaragoza and. Yeah, Lori explained it to us, you know, so. Or, or Rosa, I think. Right, it's actually based on the terms that coincide with serving as supervisor. And so uh, the reason it was highlighted of that we need those two. Um, the reappointment. Right. Was okay. if you were sitting on the chair. Um, if you were reappointed, we just wanted to highlight uh, LAFCO had concern about um, having the information out on how the term would be once someone is appointed on to the committee. So these are the appointments that have to be made because of the term. Yes. I'm over there. Right. Yes, exactly. But it would be good to add that visually so that we know yeah. that there are two supervisors that are regularly yes. on the board and then one alternative. Absolutely. And I believe it does reflect if I'm not mistaken, on Exhibit 2, um, it should have it. It's just really hard with all the various boards and commissions to keep. Mm -hmm. We try to simplify it <laughs> as easy as we can uh, just to keep track for anybody that's looking at it. But mm -hmm. we'll make sure in the future ones to put also the addition. And, and Madam Chair, I'm okay with my reappointment. You're okay. Uh, Supervisor Huber. I'm fine. Thank you. As a part. The only comment I would make is um, one a couple of these say at the Board of Supervisors' discretion, but actually probably 60% of them are that. So I don't know if we need to call that out specifically. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So with that, I move the recommended yes. list. I need a motion. Second. A first and second. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, it's been motioned and second. Please vote. Motion has approved. So those on the agenda, it has been approved. Thank you very much. And thank you to the board members for serving on all these boards. Um, I know it, it takes a lot of time and effort, so I really appreciate your commitment to our community. Okay, moving on. We are now going to move on to 32 real quick. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Lung. Congratulations on your appointment. Good morning, board members, CEO Powers. For the record, my name is Mike Pettit with the County Executive Office. This item before you is approval of the amended uh, bylaws and regulations governing the Ventura County Employees Retirement As Employee Retirement Association. The proposed bylaws were approved by the, the Board of Retirement on September 23rd. Uh, the last time these bylaws were changed was approximately around 20 years ago, so it's a due time for an update. Um, the board letter identifies the notable changes uh, contained within the draft bylaws. County staff, including county council, uh, CEO uh, personnel, 
and um, risk management all met uh, and partnered with Becerra on these changes. We've reviewed them uh, with them at, in a, a series of meetings. Um, and so we bring these changes before you today for your board's adoption. The, the bylaws and regulations do not become effective uh, according to law until your board approves them. And um, it is noted that we anticipate some changes coming forward uh, in the future on the disability hearing procedures uh, because Becerra has discussed that before their board. Um, and we anticipate that there will be some changes there that may change the, the uh, input that uh, the county's risk management department has in the disability hearing procedures. Okay. With that, I'll entertain any questions that your board has. Board members, are there any questions on this? If not, can I get a motion? Okay, it's been motion and second. Please vote. Thank you for bringing this to our attention. I really appreciate it. And the motion has been approved unanimously. Now moving on to 33. Mr. Foley. Good morning, uh, Chair Long, Supervisors, Mr. Powers. Uh, Bill Foley, Director of the uh, Healthcare Agency. Uh, I'm requesting your approval of a resolution to approve uh, a new position uh, for the healthcare agency, uh, Chief Information uh, Officer. Uh, the Chief Information Officer will serve as the Information Security and Technology Services Officer responsible for management of the agency's uh, information systems including security and privacy programs and, and communication systems. Uh, the CIO is also responsible for oversight of our electronic health uh, record system, uh, which is our Cerner uh, IT system, uh, on which we have become uh, significantly uh, dependent, both in terms of uh, our patient care services uh, our business, uh, our billing and collections. Uh, like many hospitals and healthcare systems, the uh, IT, our IT system, Cerner, uh, is a, uh, is a, cr a critical uh, resource. Uh, the CIO will be responsible for security risk and protections, policies and procedures, systems backup and recovery uh, for business continuity uh, in compliance of all electronic systems, records, uh, and data. Uh, industry surveys have found that the salary range for both private and public sector healthcare CIOs is commensurate uh, with our deputy director uh, level uh, classification for the healthcare agency. Uh, this was further validated by survey results from the Hospital Association of Southern California uh, therefore, we recommend establishing this position at the deputy director level of the healthcare uh, agency, uh, serving as a member of the senior leadership team uh, of the uh, healthcare agency and reporting directly to the uh, HCA uh, director. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for bringing this up. Does any board members have any questions? It is, it definitely is. So we have a motion and a second. Please vote. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the motion has been. What's going on here? Um, if you could do it for him, please. It's, his touch screen's not working. It's not working. Yes. It's a yes vote. Here it is. Thank you very much. That was motioned unanimously. Sorry, we're having a little technical difficulties here. Okay, thank you very much. Moving on to 35. We have our approval of the Ventura County 2020 time certain for state and federal legislative agendas and platforms. Mrs. Hughes. Congratulations. Thank Members you. of the board, Mr. Powers for the record, Sue Hughes with the County Executive Office. And wow. It's 2020, and I have before you the pro your proposed um, state and federal legislative agenda and platform. And as always, I really appreciate the help and the input 
that I receive from all of the county departments that participate in this um, document. The department heads, their staff, all of your staff, I could not put this together without everyone's expertise and I appreciate the time spent with the departments to walk me through what some of these very specific items mean so that we can do our best to carry out your board's um, proposals throughout the year for both the state and the federal, um, both on the state and the federal side. So um, attachment A is the state document, Attach attachment B is the federal document, and then attachment C shows you what was removed for all intents and purposes. Those with the strike through are things that became law or for some reason or another are no longer pertinent. And then everything else with a red underline are things we added this year. So everywhere from Ag Commissioner to the Sheriff's Department and all departments in between. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, I have Parks. A, a request of one change that we ran through the Agricultural Commissioner's Office on regarding the uh, cockfighting uh, rooster ordinance that we have here. It's 80-4 is a bullet point. And um, the request would be to um, not only to, to add uh, an educational to the list of legitimate um, exemptions that we would be requesting. Okay, so just a point of clarification. We're leaving the language as it's currently shown. Correct. And on attachment A, but we're adding yes. and educational. So right now it says with the exemptions for legitimate agricultural uses. Mm -hmm. and this would be uh, for legitimate ag agricultural and educational uses. Okay. So, and it already reads such as 4-H, Grange, yeah. your farmers. Okay. So adding the two words and educational. Perfect. And that's on page 4A? Uh, A4, A4, correct, of the state legislative agenda. It's the last bullet on the page. Great. Thank you. Great. Uh, supervisors, did anyone else have any modifications or changes? I would like to say thank you to HBE, our state lobbyists that have helped us also with some of this wording, and also Don Gil Gilchrist, uh, the federal side as well. We do use them um, quite, quite recently to make sure that we're up to speed with all of our legislation, so we're getting everything we can. So thank you very much. Can Sir, I get a motion? I, I'd like to uh, also thank Sue and ask that we approve it with the uh, one small uh, change that I requested. Okay, motion uh, to approve with the amendment. Sue, thank you very much. Thank I know you. it's so much work for you to get through all this. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you very much. Is that a vote? Motion has been approved unanimously. Thank you. Next up, uh, Supervisor Bennett, would you like to present this one? Thank you very much. Uh, first, I'd like to just call up uh, five people who I believe are attending. Uh, April DePrentis from Youth with a Mission, Michelle Steinberger from uh, Ventura County Probation, Andrea Haney, Ventura County District Attorney's Office, uh, Nicole Gonzalez Zeitz, uh, Interface Children and Family Services, and Catherine Torres, Ventura County Sheriff's uh, Office. And these five individuals are here um, because this is a presentation of the Board of Supervisors uh, proclaiming the month of January 2020 as Human Trafficking Awareness Month in Ventura County. Uh, and this is, uh, it's important that we get the information out because I think too many people think human trafficking is something that happens someplace else. Uh, but it happens right here in, it's happening in every every community in, in the United States, and it's certainly happening here and far too often in Ventura County. And so uh, really appreciate uh, everybody being here uh, to help us um, make this point that we need to increase awareness of human trafficking. And uh, this is a resolution whereas human trafficking is a crime that involves exploiting a person for labor, services, or commercial sex. And Whereas Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000 and the subsequent reauthorizations define human trafficking as sex trafficking in which a commercial sex act is induced by force, fraud, or coercion, and in which the person induced to perform such an act has not attained 18 years of age or B, the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining 
of a person for labor or services through the use of force, fraud, or coercion, and the purpose of subjection to involuntary servitude, peonage, debt bondage, or slavery. And unfortunately, uh, we see around the world there are people being uh, brought here to the United States and, and um, under all kinds of uh, misrepresentations, fraud, um, uh, uh, and involuntary uh, uh, detentions even that they have. And so really appreciate you being here and like to have you, uh, the five of you, uh, further inform us as we go forward. And I'll bring down this resolution when you're finished. Thank you for being here. This is April. Yes. Okay. Um, I am with Youth with the Mission, and I am the founder of our anti-human trafficking local initiatives. I'm going to read this so that I stay within my time limit. Um, on behalf of the Ventura County Coalition Against <coughs> Human Trafficking, known as BCCAT, we'd like to thank you for signing the resolution proclaiming January 2020 as human tra National Human Trafficking Awareness Month and for allowing us to come and share briefly with you. We represent just a few of our members this morning. There are several in the audience as well. Um, and each of us will share a bit of our anti-human trafficking efforts in collaboration with you. The Ventura County Coalition Against Human Trafficking was formed five years ago to address the issues of both sex trafficking and labor trafficking in our county. We are comprised of organizations, agencies, and individuals diligently working together to prevent, prosecute, properly identify victims of human trafficking and provide victim services. One of the ways we are collaborating is through our hospitality training. Since May of 2017, we have been providing human trafficking awareness training to the hotels and motels in Ventura County. Our training includes the definition of and differences between labor trafficking and sex trafficking, recognizing warning signs within a hotel setting, and how to respond should staff suspect human trafficking taking place at their hotel. To date, we have trained 365 staff and management. We know this is only a small fraction of those that need this training. Our goal is to reach out to hotels and motels throughout the entire county. Senate Bill 970, signed January of 2018, now requires that by January 1st, 2020, an employer of a hotel or motel provide human trafficking awareness training to each employee who is likely to come in contact with, um, with victims of human trafficking. In order to help staff better identify victims, as well as help employers comply with the law, we will continue to offer this training in our county for free. Good morning, um, Chair of the Board, Mr. Powers, and um, the other board members. My name is Gina Johnson, and I'm with Chief Deputy with Ventura County Probation Agency. And I'm here with Michelle Steinberger, who's a manager uh, currently over our juvenile facilities. And we just wanted to share a little bit about what probation's been doing. Uh, probation continues to strive to be victim-centered and trauma-informed as we work with both our offenders and victims. Uh, for the youth that uh, are referred to probation, uh, we conduct what is called a commercial sexual exploitation identification tool assessment on all new cases entering our juvenile justice system. This allows us to assess uh, whether or not they have been trafficked or are, at, or are at risk of being trafficked. We also conduct what is called child and family team meetings on youth who score a clear concern. This is a way to get all parties involved uh, with the youth um, to provide um, better resources for them. We also connect youth um, to Forever Found. Um, especially those that are brought into our facility. In regards to our facility, uh, we work very closely with proba uh, probation works very closely with behavioral health to provide word on the street, which is a training for at-risk youth um, who are being trafficked or at risk of being trafficked. We hold uh, what are called we call conferences um, at the facility that allows youth to be exposed to um, a better way of dealing with those who may exploit them. Uh, we also facilitate uh, visits with mentors from Forever, from Forever Found with youth that have been identified as being um, commercially sexually exploited or at risk. We also provide equine-assisted um, psychotherapy, Reigns of Hope, which we've had the Reigns of Hope here to present. Uh, we also, um, again, conduct family and child um, team meetings for those youth that are at risk. Um, additionally, um, deputy probation officers assigned to supervise clients 
uh, both um, adult um, and juveniles, um, and those officers that conduct investigations for disposition reports, who provide pretrial services and victim reparation and support, will also be participating in training about human trafficking identi I, um, excuse me, um, indicators, uh, and that training will be provided by Interface and the Sheriff's Department. And this will assist probation officers in better assisting victims um, of human trafficking, whether there are offenders or victims of other crimes. So thank you. Oh, and one last thank thing. Thank you very much. We do, we do have an office now at the Family Justice Center to help with this too. Thank you. And we are, we are really, we're fighting time here, so if we, okay. okay, thank you. Good morning, my name is Andrea Haney. I'm the Senior Deputy District Attorney assigned to prosecute <coughs> crimes of human trafficking and attenuated crimes such as pimping and pandering. On behalf of Greg Totten, it's an honor to be here uh, this morning with our community and law enforcement partners to address you. In 2018, when I was assigned uh, to this position, I quickly learned that it, human trafficking is real. It is here in Ventura County, and it is insidious, causing untold harm to the victims. This past year, as reflective of the efforts of all of those here today, I can tell you that we have increased collaboration with all of our law enforcement and community partners. Uh, we have increased our community education and outreach to various groups in the community who can make a difference and identify signs of human trafficking when and if it is present. In our office, we have increased funding for forensic tools to combat this crime in terms of creating evidence for presentation in jury trials. And this past year, we have secured convictions both in human trafficking and in pimping and pandering. In fact, just this morning, we had a sentencing in a pimping and pandering case. Looking forward, with the continued support of the community and this group and law enforcement, we intend to increase our proactive enforcement in the community, which is very important, our education and outreach, and to continue to identify, target, and hold offenders accountable. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Long, Mr. Powers, members of the board. My name is Nicole gonzalez Seitz. I'm the Director of the Human Trafficking and Domestic Violence Prevention and Intervention Programs at Interface Children and Family Services. And we thank you for the opportunity to, um, to come before you and help raise awareness about the issue here in Ventura County. Um, Ten years ago, I attended a training um, on the intersection of domestic violence and human trafficking. And at that time, we realized that we were seeing victims of DV who were also being trafficked by their partners. And so we began to become informed and, and to work to increase capacity in how we can serve this emerging issue. At that time, there was very little awareness about human trafficking, um, locally and statewide, and there was no clear path on how this issue would be addressed. It wasn't until the formation of ECCAT in 2015 that we started to make progress in our county. In a very short period of time, the dedicated VCCAT partners have worked together to better understand the issue of human trafficking here in Ventura County, what it looks like, and how we can create and, how, and supported efforts for the establishment of local services to aid victims. With the support of our VCCAP partners, in 2016, Interface established a 24-7 hotline and crisis response team to respond to the adult victims of labor and sex trafficking, both US-born and foreign nationals. In 2017, a data report published by the VCCAT helped Interface secure a state grant to establish the county's first emergency shelter for victims of human adult victims of human trafficking. Since that time, we've also developed a training called Health Cares About Human Trafficking, where we work to educate local medical providers on how to recognize the warning signs of human trafficking with their patients and how to safely link them with support. Since our program's inception, we've served nearly 80 victims. As the lead service, victim service provider for the county's newly developing human trafficking task force, Interface looks forward to collaborating and continuing to work with our partners to grow these efforts and ensure that victims both of both sex and labor trafficking have a broad array of culturally responsive, supportive services that help them to safely step out of the shadows of their trafficking situation and be embraced by a solid safety net of support that will help them to heal from their trauma and restart their life free from abuse and exploitation. Madam Chair, yeah. I, I just want to I just want to thank all of you for the work that you do. You know, and I think it's important that uh, this is a worldwide issue, uh, a U.S. issue, but especially here in California. 
from uh, San Diego, LA to San Francisco, there's a lot of human traffic, and especially here and also in Ventura County. I know Soroptim is from Oxnard and Ventura County has really worked with uh, us and also the DA's office and all of you for that matter. Thank you again for the good work that you do. Thank you. Right. If everyone can come down, let us or we can have a picture. If you have anybody else in your group that you want to have in the picture, uh, could you come over here and balance yourself? We're not going down, are we? There we go. Yeah. Everybody else that's here with the uh, effort? Yeah. How you gonna get them all in? <laughs> Smile. <laughs> all right, wait, wait. There's some more still. Photos are still being taken. You guys have paparazzi. <laughs> Thank you very much for all your efforts to keep our, our people safe out there. Thank you very much. As those might be leaving, we have another celebration. Um, if I could ask uh, Mr. Paul Young to come to the podium. I'll just let that applause resonate a little bit. <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Young, 29 years, wow. Um, 29 and change, I think 0.625. 20. But no one's counting, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, on behalf of the Board of Supervisors, I want to thank you for your 29 plus years of dedications, dedicated service to Ventura County. Um, Paul, you've been the Chief Deputy Director of GSA, where is responsible for leading facilities and material uh, departments, the largest of the GSA departments, which includes a staff of over 170 people and a budget of over $50 million. That's a lot. And I, I know, Paul, that you've always emphasized the importance of customer service and dedicating yourself to the support and the needs of the GSA. Um, you've also worked hard to reduce our energy and water consumption by installing solar systems and electrical vehicle chargers right here in the government center, as well as many of our satellite locations, which I know all of us have used. And besides being a proud graduate of Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, Yay, Mustangs. Yay, Mustangs. <laughs> um, Paul, you've continued your studies and received an MBA from Claremont Graduate School, uh, where my dad actually taught. Uh, and he is registered as a professional engineer as well as a certified facility manager, a certified energy manager, LEED accredited professional, and is the second Lean Six Sigma Green Belt in Ventura County. Lots of accolades here. So, thank you. Paul, our, our board would like to thank you for your hard work and dedication um, to this county, to our employees, and that we wish you and your wonderful wife, Jennifer, all the best and your retirement, and thank you. And I know that uh, Dave Sassett, did you have something that you would like to say as well? I do have a resolution to present to you that will come down in a little bit. Yeah. Good morning, Chair Long Board. Uh, Mr. Powers, for the record, Dave Sassick from the General Services Agency. And I've been um, fortunate to have uh, Paul as my right hand my entire time with GSA for the last few years. Um, it's great when you can step into a job and have someone who's been around, who knows all the customer contacts, who really has a good way with just keeping things moving to help you come up to speed. And I was fortunate to have that with Paul. Paul has really left his fingerprints on, on the county. He's, he didn't just come here and do 29 years of service and check in and check out. You, you mentioned some of the things that he's done. Um, you know, we're going to have an item later to talk about uh, the elimination use of glyphosate um, uh, in uh, GSA facilities and some of the other facilities, the parks. 
Um, years ago, he made that uh, move. So we haven't been using glyphosates on the county um, grounds proper for a number of years. That's because of his leadership. Um, he's in instituted, as you mentioned, some solar projects. We're in the midst of negotiating a creative solar project to get three megawatts of solar power that are going to be generated out in Fillmore. Um, Paul was heart and soul of that. So a lot of those um, alphabet soup things that you talked about with LED and all these different things, he used all of that to make the county a better place for everyone. There's close to 9,000 people that work in the county. And I can say without a doubt that um, Paul in his day-to-day -day work, you don't notice it, you don't see it, but what he did every day made uh, every one of those 9,000 people's, their job a better place to, to be. 3.3 um, million square feet of facility space that Paul is responsible for managing, um, groundskeeping, security. Uh, he, you know, he's responsible for the security area. I can go on and on. I'm going to spare everyone because I know there's a lot of people. But Paul, in, in, you know, in his 29 years serving here, he has made a difference. And I think he can retire feeling very proud of what he's done. And I want to personally thank him for helping me <clears throat> as I transitioned into GSA to really learn my way around. Uh, he has a great way with our customers, um, kind of a no-nonsense approach to things, which is really good in our business. Um, so, I, again... I'm going to stop here because I can just keep going. The, the list of things that Paul has done thank is you. amazing. And so I know. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. And Mr. Powers. Thank you. Just real quick, things are going way above and beyond, too. So look at the walls in this building, the arts that we have here. I mean, it's hard to imagine what it was like without them, right? But that didn't happen easily. They need to be, those arts folks, they wanted the lighting just so, right? And, and Paul made sure that, that that happened. And now this is really shows what an artist community we have here, and they love being able to display their work here. But more than anything, too, you look at the, the lives that you've touched, Paul. I mean, there's a great turnout here today because of the impact you've had on our county employees, as Dave said. So that speaks volumes for you. Uh, but also uh, what you don't hear maybe as often, and I hear it a lot, bless you, and I'm sure that a lot of our, our board does, too, is the public, when they come in here, they are so impressed with the quality of these facilities. They're just knocked out. They can't believe these are county government facilities because they're in such good shape. And I know you'll credit your team uh, as, as you should, but it's also great leadership that helps make that happen. So thank you for all you've done. Bless you. Uh, to, we need a health clinic expanded down there. So, uh, but, but, uh, but really, you've had a huge impact, not just on our county employees, but on this community. And thank you for all you've done. Yes. Thank you. And thank you very much. Uh, all of us are here to support you, and I know many that weren't able to be here today, but we just really appreciate all that you've done in your 29 years of service and dedication, which takes from the family sometimes. So I thank you, Jennifer, also for supporting him and what he does. Thank you. And Madam Chair, uh, Paul, yes. thank you for your good work, and 29 years is a long, long time. And enjoy the retirement. We're going to miss you. And, so the, and the grandbaby. <laughs> and Paul, Paul, I've and Thank you for your dedication. And Paul, I, 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 Paul, I just want to say I'm over here. There you go. The, um, there, you know, a lot of times we have things that are important to us supervisors, and, and we really try to watch them through the process. And when I have one of those projects and I'm watching it through the process, when it gets to the point where my staff says, oh, Paul Young has this, I just relax. I, I really mean that. I just go, oh. This, I don't have to worry about this one. It's 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 Paul in, in Paul's hands. It's going to be handled well. It's going to be handled appropriately, uh, and uh, I just want to say thank you very much for letting me have 19 years of peace whenever the project finally got to your level. I really appreciate it. And Paul, if you can, if you'd like, you can say certainly. I have a short statement. Thank you, thank you, Chair Long, members of the board, Mr. Powers. <clears throat> I'm honored to be I'm honored to be here today and feel lucky to have shared so much of my career and life with everyone here. First, I would like to thank my family, um, Jennifer, my wife, Lindsay, my daughter, um, Jordan, my son-in-law, and my grandson, Henry, um, <laughs> and friends for being, for being here today. Your presence means so much to me as my work and commitment to the county is recognized. I would also like to thank your board and the CEO, Mr. Powers, for the support you have provided GSA throughout the years. This has been integral to the success of many GSA initiatives, and I greatly appreciate it. Finally, <clears throat> I would like to thank the dedicated and hardworking employees of the General Services Agency. Your dedication, friendship, and commitment to customer service 
have made my time with GSA memorable and more than enjoyable, and I will miss you the most. Jennifer and I look forward to traveling and seeking out new adventures, and we are excited for what's to come. Thank you. All right. Um, also, someone left a pair of, of glasses. If anyone is looking for a pair of glasses. Is your mic on me? Huh? <laughs> All right. We get babies in the boardroom and we lose it. <laughs> if anyone is looking for a pair of glasses, we have them turned in here. You might need them later on. Okay, let's go. All right. <laughs> Such great things. Retirements and babies. Right? Yes, super cute. Okay, moving on to our receive and file for the Ojai Valley Highway 33. Supervisor Bennett. Thank you very much. Here we go. Thank you very much. Um, this is uh, a very interesting project, and that's why we scheduled uh, 20 minutes for this, and we'll try to make sure we keep it uh, within the 20 minutes and, and quicker if we can. But for the board, I'm going to ask your indulgence in that um, I'm presenting a project that's going to live on after I'm termed out here from the board, and that's why I wanted to try to explain it enough to you that you're, you're aware of what's going on. Uh, this is a project that... Um, there was a, we, we, we got notice that within about 10 days a grant was due, um, and it was a grant to allow communities to do a study of highways 
that go through communities, state highways that go through communities. And um, nobody in, in, in county staff at the time was swamped with lots of other uh, grants and applications and stuff. And my office staff sat down and, and on their own, they came to me and said, we think we can write this grant. They did. Uh, and I, I really respect them for stepping up and doing that. And we got uh, two and a half, uh, a million dollars, not two and a half, no, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Right? Uh, we had we got a quarter of a million dollars um, for this uh, study about what are the possibilities, and the community came together. And you see some pictures of this Highway 33 that goes through the uh, Ojai Valley, um, and it is Main Street for the Ojai Valley. Um, uh, it's also a state highway. And it's exactly what the grant was designed to do, is to say, how can we make these things work better for the local communities uh, and still function uh, well as the state highway? So um, I'm going to go through this uh, quickly. And then um, we have a number of speakers here. Um, this, is the result of, this is the result of a community meeting where uh, after the, there was a presentation of the project, the question was, do you guys support this? And um, you saw lots of people with their thumbs up and stuff, and, um, and uh, it was, they just were really great community meetings as we got together and tried to plan this. Um, so we're going to do a quick introduction. What's the pur purpose of the project, um, the community-based process, the, the quarter-wide issues and strategies, and the community strategies, and then the next steps. Um, there we go. So that's the portion of, the, of Ventura County that we studied. Um, the, the project was to identify opportunities to improve multimodal transportation access. So by multimodal, that's sort of where you're seeing as a result of climate change, et cetera, the state trying to take us. Uh, and that is walkers, bikers, everybody, not just the vehicles. And if you look at these big trucks going along Highway 33, uh, it doesn't feel like the safest place to walk and, and, and be. And you see the community objectives that are all listed there, improving safety on the roadway, uh, establish multimodal uh, connectivity, um, and fostering community and economic development, um, and a visionary exercise to pr uh, prompt the next steps. Um, so this was the community. These are some of these, the, the community meetings. We didn't just have that one meeting inside. We met with the community actually. At, uh, we walked the streets um, and looked at various sites, uh, had a number of uh, small groups meet, and they, people came up with visions, et cetera. But I've been involved in a lot of these, but this one had just a special warmth and, and feel to it that was, was really remarkable. Um, and so the issues, there's lack of multimodal access along Highway 33, and there's high traffic uh, speeds on the, on the highway. And so issues and opportunities and strategies, pedestrian infrastructure, there's missing sidewalks, inconsistent shoulders, lack of marked crossings, lack of ADA compliance, and missing connections to the community. So those are all issues that were brought up. The bicycle infrastructure, the Ojai Trail, is a great facility, but connections to it are lacking and, and difficult. No bike lanes on Highway 33 for local bike access. Um, others, more complete multimodal access along Highway 33 uh, was uh, one of the strategies. Uh, moderate to, moderate the traffic speeds, improve transit stops, create gateways for each community along Highway 33, widen the shoulders, and create paths connecting the access to the transit stops with the access to the bike path. So a lot of times you have the bike path on the one side and, and, and the people sort of stuck on the other side. Um, the, this is Casita Springs, and I'm, uh, with each of these, there's, you'll see this. And then another step, this is, uh, this is the modest improvement at Highway 30, I mean, at Casita Springs. Um, and I'll just go back just to give you an idea. So you put in, a, you put in the bus stop, you put in the bike lanes, and it's a little bit easier for uh, people to use that. This is uh, uh, Casita Springs also, and this is a potential change. You'll have some parking, but it would be parallel parking right there. Uh, so just 
just again to go back and you could see potential improvements that you have there. And I'm really excited about the fact that Caltrans um, is very on board for these changes. A lot of times you do this and there will be a disagreement between Caltrans and the community about what to do. Caltrans has been with us for uh, this project. It's been great. And so this is uh, moving out of uh, Casita Springs, um, another improvement area there. And I might point out, I'm going to go back one here. Oh, I'm... Let me go back real quick. The See the sidewalk there? Instead of putting in a typical concrete sidewalk on the right side, sure. talking about crushed granite, a more natural looking mm -hmm. sidewalk, uh, crushed granite right there, and it just fits with the character of the community. Um, now you get into Oakview. Now Oakview is the most critical stretch there. That's where the highway goes from two lanes to four lanes. And then it goes back to two lanes. So you don't really get the benefits of a four-lane road because you have two lanes and two lanes in terms of overall uh, tra traffic movement through the area. Um, and you get a lot of uh, impacts in terms of the community. So streetscape improvements in the area that's marked right there, uh, gateway potentials, and then public and private frontage, frontage improvements. And this is where having Caltrans on board really helps. So I'll give you a visual of what could happen. So most of you, I'm guessing, have, has, have driven through Oakview um, more than once. Um, uh, this is what it, it looks like now. And this is potential change. You go from, and this is significant, so you go from four lanes, not much in way of improvements, and then take a look at the difference. You go to two lanes, and you go, the other two lanes are used for parking. Parking, bike lane, uh, a, uh, a separated, not, not, not separated, but a marked bike lane there, and you have parking there, and a dramatic improvement. So landscape median, parking lanes, look how different the two visions are. A lot of uh, change happens with just adding trees, right? Right, and 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 the median in the middle. Mm -hmm. You're right. The trees and the median in the middle, um, and and the trees in the middle like that uh, really help. So you have the buffered bike lane, the parking lane, large tree canopy, and and the landscape median. And this is another intersection in Oakview, and again you add the trees, you go. Go to two lanes, you got the bike lane, and now you have a safe way for people to bike through that commercial corridor there. Um, this is um, the <coughs> Oakview, this is called a road diet when you take the four lanes down to the two lanes, and um, this shows the reducing lanes from it's five lanes to three lanes because you have the the, the, the the turn lanes the left turn lane there in the middle and it'll increase traffic time but only 65 seconds in the morning and 27 seconds in the evening according to traffic engineers in terms of time um, and in terms of the emergency movement the people on the emergency movement side of it say look if you got a two laner and a two laner it doesn't have any significant impact in terms of that. This is a proposed street improvements up uh, Highway 33 in Miramani. And uh, pardon me, there's going to be a whole lot of these, but oversized right turn lane and uh, uh, poor access to the bus stop and the Ojai Valley Trail. See, people have to cross that there. And so uh, incomplete sidewalk there. And this is the uh, suggested uh, proposed street improvement to uh, that area. Uh, and that would be in a large landscape area, improved crosswalks and village gateway. So see the village gateway announcing, you know, that you're sort of in Miramani. Uh, improved bus stop. Um, those, and then uh, there's you get to see the gateway with the uh, uh, median in the middle. Uh, significant uh, improvement. So next steps, submit this to Caltrans. Coordination with partner agencies, that's Gold Coast Transit, uh, Ventura County Public Works, Caltrans, and identif identification of funding opportunities. But there's something special going on in terms of the community community's excitement about this and not everybody is it's not a hundred percent you never get a, a change like this that has this there there are people that, that have concerns but there are I, I would offer to you there's overwhelming I think community's excitement and support uh, for this uh, and that's why and I end up again with this uh, particular picture that we have um, and so I want to thank, uh, to make this happen, uh, County Transportation, David Fleisch and uh, Norman uh, Boccolino. Um, and they're here, right? Yeah, I want to thank you uh, both. Is Norman here? Uh, mm -hmm. There he is. Yeah, Norman, thank you very much. Just great help with them. And then we have the consultants from the local government agency, uh, Josh Meyer and uh, 
Josh is here, um, and then uh, also um, Regalio um, is the uh, subcontractor from Nelson Nygaard, and Regalio's uh, right there. Um, they all really played a big role, and then Caltrans, and unfortunately the Caltrans representative, who's been super enthusiastic, was tied up with something else and couldn't be here for this. Um, we have uh, uh, some public speakers here, um, and if you don't mind, Madam Chair, I'll go ahead and yes, call please. them up here, but uh, Marilyn Miller, um, uh, first speaker. Good morning, Chair Long, members of the board, Mr. Powers, county staff. Um, thank you. You know me as the planner down at the Channel Islands Harbor, but I'm here today as a resident of Oakview, and I would um, like to thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, I'd like to thank Steve uh, and his staff for pursuing this grant and um, managing this project. I'd also like to thank them for uh, asking me to be on the committee that worked early on with the community to get this project underway. It's been very exciting uh, to me as a resident of Oakview. I've been a resident of the Ojai Valley my entire life and in Oakview for most of the last 20 years. And um, I'm, I am really excited about the possibilities that this plan sets out. It's a beginning. It's not the uh, entire, um, entire uh, project, but it is a really good start. I'd like to thank the Local Government Commission for their involvement in this. Uh, it was very uh, much appreciated. And uh, I, too, would like to really thank Caltrans, give a special thanks to Caltrans. They have recognized that our roadway systems are not just for cars and that the local community should have a say in how the highways look um, when they traverse through the communities. I've worked in this uh, profession for a little over three decades, unbelievably, and this is a monumental shift in Caltrans approach from when I first started doing planning work uh, back in the late 1980s. So I want to particularly thank them. Uh, I would like, to, I want to keep my comments brief, uh, so I would like to just urge you to support this plan. It addresses essentially three issues that are important to the Highway 33 corridor. The first is recognizing that Casita Springs, Oak View and Miramani are separate distinct communities, that there are businesses there that residents want to use safely and easily, and um, that they have a they have a real interest in um, in making sure that the community has a character as a, a village, so to speak. The other important thing to recognize is that Oakview has an elementary school. And there are kids in the community that walk to that school, and we have to make sure that those um, pathways to the school are safe for the children. So the second issue is safety um, for all users, bicycles, walkers, uh, as well as cars. And that, you know, we have a right to have a say in what our communities look like. I think that's really important, and that's something that Caltrans has recognized. Thank you, Marilyn, but I'm sorry you're three Thank you. Stuff. All right. Um, our next speaker is Barbara Kennedy. Good morning. Chairman, members of the board, Mr. Powers, I also would like to take the time to thank uh, Supervisor Steve Bennett's office, his staff, Cindy, Steve-O, Brian, Cruz, everyone who rapidly put this thing together. Um, created the uh, advisory council and gave our opportunity to the community to be heard. Um, very important to us. I also want to thank the consulting firms that were so diligent in, in sitting with us, walking with us, listening to us, really helping us understand the traffic and how it flows and how it could be better served in our communities, um, mostly for the safety issues um, of our community, obviously. And a huge thank you to Caltrans for awarding us the grant um, and meeting with us and understanding our community's needs and making us feel heard again, and that we truly mattered. Um, and mostly I want to thank the members of the community of Oakview and Casita Springs and Miramani who took the time out of their busy schedules to become part of the process. I think that's so important that communities know they can be part of that process because I think so many people think that they can't. Um, we appreciate them all. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing where this goes next 
and uh, the implementation of the multimodal and our communities to be safer for our bicyclists, our pedestrians, and even our drivers. Thank you today. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tina Bermond. Hi, thanks for hearing um, my comments today. I'm here to talk about a couple of things that I wanna make sure that are looked at with the multimodal um, changes that are being evaluated in Oakview. Originally, when we heard these plans, we were told that the uh, delay in the morning time would be 25 seconds. It's now increased to 65 seconds. We're not assured that that 65 second time delay in the morning is not gonna be increased even further as the plan is implemented further on and that's a big concern because it's not so much the delay time but the traffic that builds backing behind it. We have a pretty severe traffic issue right now in Ojai and my concern is that we have not done a valley-wide traffic circulation study and Creek Road and Villanova Road are being impacted drastically by people bypassing the use of the highway and going on to Creek Road. We've been working with the county at it, but really the implementation that the county has done on Creek Road has not given us the protections that we have sought. We had two accidents just yesterday, one of which was not reported correctly into Switters, so that continues to be a concern. Additionally, we haven't talked about taxes. How is this project going to be paid for? Has some feasibility study of how people feel about the taxes. Is it a property tax? Is it a sales tax? I know that we're just looking right now at <clears throat> some concepts, but certainly how we're gonna pay for it should be looked at just as much up front as these beautiful designs. I agree wholeheartedly. We have a speeding and a traffic problem through Oakview, and it does seem odd that we go from two lanes to four lanes. However, I would like to point out Bishop, California, Independence Pine, California. These communities have a similar freeway situation running through them, and I guarantee you, you do not speed when you are going through Bishop. You hit that great little bakery, no, you, you continue on your way, but it is absolutely clear that you are not to be speeding through their community. That's right. We have an absence right now of enough patrols both on Creek Road and on Highway 33, and my concern is that this beautiful change and this beautiful concept does nothing more than push more and more traffic onto Creek Road. We had a property owner at Rancho Royale who has had property damage four times this year. Several of those have not been reported into Switters, so then when it comes time for county to be assessing the situation, there's not a complete set of data to be evaluating this on. So thank you for listening to those concerns and including them in the other positive comments that you've heard. Thank you for your testimony, Tina. Uh, Dwyer Brown. <clears throat> Good morning, supervisors. Uh, I, I'm a 26-year uh, uh, resident of the Ojai Valley, 10 years in Oakview. I'd like to thank Steve Bennett, uh, you other supervisors, Caltrans, Norman, Josh, Rogelio, all you guys for, for the great work you've done. Um, I've watched Oakview change for the better in the last few years. Uh, the, the, what was formerly Dahl's Market had the cozy feeling of a post-apocalyptic commissary. is now sort of something of an organic superstore. Um, property values have doubled. Sheriff patrols have decreased. Uh, two houses on my street were formerly owned by Hell's Angels. And, um, and now for the past six months, uh, 20 of my neighbors and all of us get together for monthly neighborhood uh, little parties in our neighborhood. So I'm very happy. I love Oakview. Uh, I can walk to the post office, my bank, a nice little market, a few restaurants, my dog groomer, a nail salon, coffee shop, donut Not store, and my gym, which is called the Oakview Gym. I just tell my wife three times a week, honey, I'm going down to the OVGYM. Okay. <clears throat> I consider myself something of a connoisseur of traffic. If I hadn't pursued the career that I did, I, I think I could have been a traffic planner. I love to see the beauty and the ballet of a well-planned intersection, and, um, but I'm also the guy who likes to curse the uh, idiot engineer who posted that bad sign or sitting in a traffic light for 45 seconds when no cars are going the other direction. So I can tell you that shortly after moving to Ojai, I knew exactly what was wrong with Oakview, the fact that it goes from these two lanes to four lanes and back to two lanes. 
everybody has hit on that. So the main thing I can tell you, though, is the other uh, result of that is that nobody stops in Oakview. Uh, nobody stops to get coffee. Nobody stops to shop. Nobody stops for anything. And partially that's because they're so busy speeding by each other. Hey, I came up here from L.A., so I was one of those people. You know, it's, it's an opportunity to get behind that idiot who's driving ahead of you, who's distracted, and you take it. But the result is that when more attractive businesses open in Oakview, Nobody stops for them. They end up closing in a few months. Any of us who've lived up there can tell you that. We've had some great potential things that have just haven't come to fruition. Uh, so many of my fellow Oakview, uh, Oakviewians, I think we're called, um, have contributed to this comprehensive study. It's been really great. I can't tell you how nice it's been to feel like you're listened to. We've been to these meetings, and it's really been nice. Um, I'm going to take the rest of my time to talk about rotaries. I've been kind of pushing, uh, you know, these roundabouts uh, for some of the intersections in Oakview, and uh, they're well documented, the many benefits of them. But in short, it keeps the traffic moving. I think in a way it would, might be a solution to the 65-second addition to, to the commute. Um, and, you know, it's worse right there at Larmere where I live because the morning uh, school, sunset school, gets out just when the uh, commuters are heading out of Ojai. But um, I think would also dramatically signal that you're entering the Ojai Valley if, if we started with rotaries. And I know, uh, I mean, even Dwight, though rotaries have been around Dwight, in this country. Oh. Your, your time's up, but I'm not going to. Okay. I, I, anyway. Good, but, uh, good, cause I, what can cause, I say? No, because I, no, I want to ask you a couple questions about rotary so you can continue oh, to good. go on about that. So, so uh, tell me what you mean when you say it is, a, it is it, it'll create a great entry. Say again, it'll be what? Tell me what you mean when you say that, that the rotaries will create a great entry into Oak. Well, I mean, if you drive up, you know, the 33 and you get to the top of the alarm hill there and you have a rotary, which, first of all, you can, you know, warn people with all the signage up that hill, but here you are at the top of this hill and suddenly you're in a rotary. It feels like you're in Europe. You know, uh, there are 5,000 rotaries in, across the U.S. Washington State has built hundreds of them in the past few years. But there's 30,000 of them in France. There's 10,000 of them in the UK. And if a Frenchman can figure this out, then surely we Californians. People get scared of rotaries because they don't understand how they work. And uh, to me, it's just a learning curve. I, I don't know how my computer works, but that doesn't mean I should stop using it. Yeah. Great. Okay. Good. Uh, Go ahead. So anyway, uh, they're all over the country, too, in Florida. So you know, if the Floridians and the Frenchmen can figure it out, we ought to be able to. Thank and uh, thank you for your time, and maybe I'll see you all. At the any other benefit of rotary that you have there? Any Are other you? any other benefit of the oh, round, yeah, yeah. roundabout? Well, first of all, it, it keeps traffic moves, moving. It's it's well documented that it stops serious uh, accidents because it avoids head-on collisions and T-bone collisions, which is where most people die. Um, there'll be fewer uh, car and pedestrian accidents because motorists only have to look in one direction. They don't have to look both ways. They stay with the flow of traffic. Um, yeah, and for me, the main thing is that it will reduce exhaust and, and fuel waste because you don't have cars sitting idling in traffic there for the, for the light to change. Everybody's moving slowly, and, and I really think it, would do a, it could do a great service in, in, in minimizing that 65-second uh, delay if, if, if it's uh, implemented. Right. It's really the public opinion. Uh, the, the surveys say that 68% you know, people were against uh, roundabouts before, but they changed to 23% after they've been implemented and people start to understand them. A 2007 survey, 77% of people were opposed to them, and afterwards it was only 13%. So I think they work. It's just an adjustment period. It's just gotcha. really a PR issue. Okay. Thank you for your Thank testimony. You. I'll see you at the OVGYM. Right. <laughs> uh, thanks for your testimony, um, everybody that, uh, that that came here today. I completely share your your feelings about the roundabouts. Uh, they make sense. There is an initial fear of them. They were going to put a roundabout in in Ojai up there, uh, right by the Vons, and it got shot down by that initial fear. And I can't think of a better intersection than that one, you know, uh, or Highway 33 and 150, you know, uh, break off. Um, so um, hopefully that might be reconsidered after Oakview shows Ojai how to um, go about uh, uh, go, go about uh, road use planning and stuff. But um, when these projects come back, I'll be on that side, right. um, and I'll be advocating uh, for the roundabout and for these these other things. Um, and Tina brought up a good question, and that is funding, and it gives us an opportunity to point out that Caltrans has 
identified this as one of the projects Caltrans is going to put in for, uh, and it is a, um, there's a, only going to be 10 of them issued in the state of California. 10 of these improvement grants through communities. Uh, and that's, so we, this is not coming saying, hey, we need a special tax in the community to pay for this. Right, right now we're trying to find out if we, how much we can get done with grants on this project because people pay a significant amount of money in our gas taxes, et cetera. We've had our gas tax improved um, or, or we've had it solidified for a while and now there is an opportunity for us um, and we we see that in some of the funding that we're getting uh, as a result of that tax going forward. We are able to devote, um, we've, we've committed $8 million to improving bike uh, lane enhancements around Ventura County over the next four years. Um, so this is an example of using that good uh, revenue flow that's coming in to try to make what it should be modest expenses by comparison to some of the other major things that you're doing out there. Putting in a median, um, you know, you're, you're talking about striping and, and, and some of those changes, but um, you're not talking about major, major, you know, construction projects. Right. Yeah. And so this is a receive and file in support of the concept? With yeah, yeah, that's a receive and file, um, make you aware of the concept and support of the concept uh, the if if I could I'll um, take you to the board letter and you'll see how we worded that to try to accurately reflect what we think is the appropriate action for the board and that is support and concept implementation of the highway 33 study recommendations that's not you're not supporting every detail or anything just the concept of, of doing this and authorize county agencies to apply for grants for further study or implementation of roadway improvements identified in this uh, highway 33 multimodal and community enhancement study to so just authorize the county agencies to apply for grants not trying to grab county uh, general funds um, uh, for this project at this point in time They're, obviously if something comes up and it requires a match or whatever uh, but but we got uh, $211,000 with a local match of $27,000. <clears> That's a pretty good investment on the, on the part of the county here. And for a, a, a community that is one of our unincorporated communities that we have that extra responsibility for, which is we're doing municipal services in an unincorporated community. And so uh, this is that uh, opportunity for us to try to help a, a, a long existing community that hasn't had very much investment, certainly in that part of the core. And, and it doesn't limit us to still look at the traffic and making sure that, Absolutely. that we're Absolutely, and I think I think the, I think Dwyer's exactly yeah. right. I think the 65 seconds will right. be improved over and over again. I've seen that when people have put in the rotaries, it actually does the traffic flows better because you don't have everybody stopping. I mean, think about on Highway 33 when you come down there, how little traffic actually comes out from those, those two stop signs. Very, very little traffic. You stop traffic every, you know, 65, 70 seconds, uh, and you have them all idle. It's a climate change uh, improvement uh, right there alone and a fuel efficiency improvement, and, and I will really be advocating hard to try to have a community embrace the fear of, oh, I don't know what to do when I get there, right? So, so I would ask for a motion. I'm ready to give it to you, too. Thank you very much. We're, right? we're a little behind, right. so yeah, I got to keep go. this moving. So, all right, you, there's the motion, and it's been seconded. Thank you, Ms. All right. I also um, would just echo uh, how incredible Caltrans has become. <laughs> you know, we've seen them working really well with the community, with our wildlife bridge over at Liberty Canyon, the 101, uh, seeing this proposal and having them get behind it. And it's, it is kind of a sea change with Caltrans, and it's really nice to see. And it very much flows with the state's emphasis on trying to get more um, active transportation as well as reducing uh, carbon emissions. So it looks like uh, you've got some great ideas here. There's uh, oftentimes with roundabouts, there's there are concerns because it's something new, uh, but they can also be uh, very uh, aesthetically pleasing, and that's not generally uh, what's looked at when you do those. It's just you know, like the one in the Kachuma Pass. Um, it, it isn't particularly aesthetic, but you can actually uh, vegetate those two and make them good looking, particularly when it's at the gateway you know, entrance into a community. 
And then also I know there'll be trade-offs if you take parking away from the front, you know, making sure that you have the ability to put parking if you're gonna take it away from a, a retail establishment and all those kind of things that need to be worked out. But having one plan in place and going for like the same type of um, materials and such, and it, it really can uh, add a lot to the community. And I think it, it really is wonderful that you've moved forward on this. It does look like an incredibly expensive project, even though you say it's not that much. Oh, it, it's it a piece does of cake. Like, uh, it is a <laughs> multi-million dollar project for sure. And so um, I, I hope that there are the funds available to, to move forward on. Well, and with that, you have to also, because we have grants, you still have to the maintenance after that. And so we have to be understanding of that as funding and taxpayer dollars and so forth when you're going through it. But I appreciate the Caltrans is committed to improving the situation there and also with the community members engaged and actually wanting to be a part of the creation. I think that's a good government. So I appreciate that. And with that, we have a vote. And as that as that vote is coming in and to pass, I do want to I do want to particularly thank Josh Meyer again. Um, this is a local government commission. What they do is they help local governments mm -hmm. try to do these kind of projects. They bring in an expertise in terms of, of trying to do that. Okay. And um, so in particular, I really appreciate that and, and, and our they staff. Have been really and good thank you very much to the community members. All right. for being well, here. that was, motion was approved unanimously. We've got to pick it up. Um, we have some six, 1030 time certains. Thank you very much for all of you doing the heavy lifting on that. Um, we're moving on to the public hearing regarding the adoption of the 2020 to 2022 MOA um, for uh, Venture Employees Association. And we're going to be waiving the second hearing, public hearing with the impact of the funding status of the retirement system. I said that because I think it has to go into record, right? Okay, so I will now open public comment. Please go ahead. Good morning, Chair Long, Board of Supervisors, CEO Powers. My name is Sandra Ambries, and I'm with Labor Relations. The item before you is a request to commence a public hearing on the adoption of the Memorandum of Agreement between the County and the Ventura Employee Association, also known as VEA. Additionally, we ask that your board waive the second hearing to expedite the implementation of the MOA. The successor MOA terms and conditions are consistent with the <coughs> County's compensation philosophy to keep total compensation within 5% above the job market for the job classifications represented by VEA. The proposed MOA has three-year term and the main features are a general salary increases over three years, 2.5% for two years, and 2% for the last year. Two market-based salary adjustments for classifications who are below the market medium, a $50 per pay period increase to the flex credit allowance effective this month, and an additional $50 to begin in December 2020 and the December 2021 to coincide with annual premium increases for the next plan years. And addition of the day after Thanksgiving as a paid holiday. I would like to thank the board, Mr. Powers, for the support and guidance in reaching this agreement, as well as the entire labor relations team and VEA for a positive and constructive round of negotiations. I'm happy to respond to any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Board of Supervisors. Any comments? Move approval. Mm -hmm. I would like to, we have a public hearing. Uh, there is no public comments. So I will close this public hearing and we are waiving the second public hearing. Um, so it has now been motioned and uh, seconded, if we can all vote. Thank you for the good work. Thank you very yeah. much. And that vote is unanimous. Thank you so much. Moving on to our public hearing regarding the adoption of the 2020-2023 Memorandum of Agreement for the International Union of Operating engineers local 501 and to waive their second hear public hearing with the impact of the funding status in the retirement system good morning chair long members of the board ceo powers for the record my name is robert avalo with the labor relations division of the county executive office today i come before you to recommend your board commence a public hearing on the adoption of a successor agreement to the current memorandum of agreement between the county of ventura and iuoe local 501 the proposed agreement was ratified by IUOE membership on January 8th. We ask that your board waive the second hearing to expedite the implementation of the MOA. The proposed MOA has a three-year term, and the main features are general salary increases for three years, 2.5% for the first two, and 2% 2 for the last year, two annual market-based adjustments for all classifications 
who are below the market median, and general salary increase, um, I'm sorry, and general salary increase in flexible benefit allowance. Increase in the flexible benefit allowance as well as tiering of the allowance to better match tiered health care premium cost. The exact dollar amount is in your board letter. The proposed also includes the addition of the day after Thanksgiving to be included as a paid holiday. With that said, I would like to thank your board, CEO Powers, for the continued support and guidance. Also, thank you to IUOE staff who continue to partner with the county, proving beneficial for both sides with fair and equitable agreements. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I'm going to open the public hearing. And are there any questions from the board members? There's no public comments. Checking. All right, we're closing the public comment period. Thank you, uh, public hearing. Thank you very much for all your efforts. There's been a motion and a second. Let's vote. Just, just a quick you. comment. If I, yes, Mr. Powers. Motion. Chair Long, just real quick. Thank you to Sandra and Robert. These are sort of uh, mellow items right now, but, but that's because of the good work uh, that they've done at the table with our, with our union partners. So thank you. Yes, yes, thank you. And for the great partnership. Moving on to the receive and file for a report back regarding the potential use of uh, non glycivate based products on vegetation management. Ron, welcome back. Good morning, Chair Long. Congratulations. Thank you. And yeah, members of the board, Mr. Powers, for the record, Ron Van Dyke, General Services Agency. I'm here this morning for a report back on the non use of glyphosate based products on parks, airports, and county fire district facilities, with the exceptions of airport runways and regulatory requirements for a rondo removal. Uh, PWA will be returning uh, to your board to brief separately on their use of glyphosate. There are representatives from the airports and the fire department here if there's any questions in those areas. And if I can get my PowerPoint up, that would help. Okay. If they're up there. It's coming. There, there it is. All right. You got the clicker? <laughs> got it. Got it. Okay. All right. Go for it. Get the, get the buttons working correctly. We'll be good. Um, before I get started, uh, all three agencies are looking to greatly reduce glyphosate use based upon the board's discussions uh, back in October. Uh, the cost uh, to change products is basically minimal uh, for most of the three agencies. Uh, airports is the one exception uh, to that, um, as long as we're using systemic uh, herbicides. Hey, I got it. <coughs> uh, fire district and airports uh, will not be using glyphosate in public areas. And again, as, as I said, the cost is minimal. Uh, for the differences in products for uh, systemic herbicides. Uh, fire district, like parks, needs to use glyphosate for arundel management in compliance with grants and other regulatory requirements. It's just the product that seems to work the best on that weed. Uh, airports wants to continue to use glyphosate on the runway and taxiways, uh, as discussed in your board uh, back in October for safety of flight. And it's the product that seems to work best for the types of weeds that they have in those areas. Uh, they both will not use it in uh, areas where the public uh, has access to. Uh, so they would either be doing uh, manual weed clearing or using some type of other uh, herbicide to keep those areas clear. Parks, a little bit different, but parks will con just continue use of glyphosate. We've been using ro uh, Rodeo and not uh, Roundup, but we will con uh, discontinue using glyphosate with the exception, as I stated, with airports and fire for Rondo. Uh, this slide shows what our financials are for this. Uh, if we continue using a non-glyphosate herbicide, it will be about a $43,000 cost to the department for the product and labor. <clears throat> the Ohio Valley Trail currently labor costs are $180,000 to control the weeds uh, on the trail. Um, we're getting that labor from probation, work furlough crews when we can get them. And it can be challenging sometimes to get those bodies. Uh, but that's what the cost. We have one supervisor out there supervising the crew. Uh, and they're the ones that come and do the weed abatement. 
So that's for the entire park system, correct? No, ma'am. Well, the entire park system for spraying is 43,000. The trail alone is 180,000 for just labor hours. Uh, luckily, we haven't had to pay for those labor hours because we're getting labor from probation. So the 839,000 would be for the full park system plus the Ojai Valley Trail, correct? It would be 223,000 for, for the yeah. The 839 would be if we stop spraying completely throughout the system. Including the Ojai Valley Trail. Adding the Ojai Trail, which we already don't do. We don't spray on the trail. Right. So we add, if we get rid of the ability to spray, which is the 43,000, and not spray any herbicides at all, it would jump up to 659,000 in labor hours. So if you didn't do the Ojai Valley Trail, then um, it would it wouldn't be two hundred twenty three thousand. It would be minus one hundred eighty thousand, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't see that number, so I'll do the math. Thank you. Uh, for uh, since twenty fifteen, we haven't been spraying the trail. Uh, so we have some years of data on the upkeep and, uh, and the challenges that we have there. It has been an extreme challenge to manually weed the trail. Uh, the aesthetics, unfortunately, uh, have slipped and we've gotten public comment. I know the supervisor's office has received comments about trail maintenance and our office has also received comments. Um, access to labor is also challenging. You no know, uh, probation has done an outstanding job at, at supporting us uh, bodies aren't guaranteed uh, every weekend, and, and we've asked them in preparations, if your board decided to go uh, herbicide free throughout the system, what could they provide us to cover that you know, over $600,000 in labor hours? They could only oh. tell us that we could maybe give you two bodies a day. Uh, yeah. Guaranteed, we would lead probably 10 a day uh, and work two crews to, to keep up with it. In <coughs> those numbers. Um, so that we don't have a guaranteed labor pool from probation to meet the numbers of labor hours we would need to do the weed abatement. And our weed abatement is driven by fire for the most part, our fire prevention program uh, that's you know, well renowned. Uh, we get a stack of pink slips uh, that would make somebody cry if they got that much mail in one day uh, for what we are mandated to go clear. Uh, for fire prevention, and that's the big chore. Can you remind me? I was not here in 2014. We, uh, th the board, decided that they wanted to do the one trail without the classified. No, we did that. What happened? We did that in concert with the supervisor's office in the community to stop uh, spraying on the trail. Okay, so it was a community-based request. Yes. Thank you. And we stopped, and it was kind of a trial. And this year, we got hit right between the eyes with the super bloom and then you know four years before that of not controlling the weeds uh, systemically not being able to control the weeds so they came back and then we got the super bloom and it was like a forest out there so what does the community feel now uh we're still getting complaint because we again we we've got the fire prevention weeds cut but we still have weeds out there that just the trail doesn't look as nice as it should Okay, that's what I was trying to figure out because you're customer service and public safety and all that. So um, the needs associated with them wanting it to do it, and now they're like, wait, it's not as nice as it used to be. I'm just trying to get an understanding of it. The, the other issue that comes up with, unfortunately, with us doing handwork out there and we're trying to find a way around improving this and not cost more labor hours is using string trimmers on the trail <clears> in <throat> proximity to high, Highway 150 got a lot of torque claims for damaged vehicles because uh, we're slinging rocks and hitting vehicles as they're driving down the road. And is there any way to use the glyphosates? I know our, some board members know about it better than I, um, but if you spray and you hold, you don't let public on the property for a, a We do do that. We, we, we close the trails with signs saying that we're, we're spraying. We posted signs when we were spraying. We've been spraying the trail 
since the late 70s, probably, uh -huh. uh, before the trail was even built, when it was still a railroad uh, through there, we were spraying. And after the trail got built in the early 80s, we continued spraying until five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, we, we closed the trail, but people ignore our signs. That's the short answer. Uh, even if they, we had the same thing happen when we built the bridge. Uh, Watershed just did a project in there for drainage and people were walking right through the project site. So signs, we do do them, we post them, we put out as much public information as we can, but people want to get from point A to point B and they do, unfortunately. Okay. So Could I ask a that's question? reality. Yes, Supervisor. Um, Reading the report, it states that, um, and I think it's wonderful, and we just heard about Paul Young and his efforts to see that we remove glyphosates from our parks, but there's a sentence that says, considerable time has gone into researching and investigating ways to minimize herbicide use while achieving the mandated weed-free defensible space around structures. As a result, very little herbicide currently is used at GSA parks facilities. Um, that gives me an indication that you can um, eliminate that amount. But when I look at here and you're talking about 839,000, it's just a disconnect. I'm not understanding how your report says you're using very little herbicide. And then I look up here and you forget the Ojai Valley Trail and you're using, uh, it would cost uh, a considerable amount of money for the very little herbicides that are left. It just doesn't, I don't understand that. Okay. We used, in comparison, we used less herbicide from the previous report. We used less herbicide per acre than any of the other departments did. Uh, it doesn't mean that we're using less uh, within our system. It means we're using less than everybody else was per acre, ounces per glyphosate uh, based product. And, and, and to, it also goes on to say that the estimated cost of switching from uh, rodeo to a non-glyphosate herbicide is six thousand dollars. So, um, pan weeding obviously is. I'm at the bottom of page two of the report where it talks about GSA parks. So it's um, you could switch for six thousand dollars. So you're not using glyphosate. That's the forty-three thousand. Uh, well, that that gets us to our forty-three thousand number. Okay. That's if you switched uh, to another that's herbicide. Something that you say you can handle within your budget. Is that correct? That we can handle. Okay, so you could eliminate using that talk glyphosate. Go to a different herbicide. Correct. Um, okay, so that that's that's good to know, except for the Ojai Valley Trail. Well, and Currently, I have, yes. I have one other question about it. We checked out that other herbicide. Is that other herbicide? That other herbicide is it safer yes. than glyphosate? Glyphosate. Most people would say it's more toxic. Correct? A lot of the, a lot of the other systemics uh, are higher up on the list than glyphosate. Right, Supervisor uh, Bennett. I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to ask that question right. as well. Yeah, I mean, just switch, switch on from one that's not considered, mm -hmm. at least by. I mean, we we have some judgments against, but it doesn't have. It's not they're not as high on the toxicity level as right. we're going to go to one higher on the toxic yeah you wouldn't want to do that no. this i know that um who international has, uh, has declared it a carcinogen glyphosates as has the state of california on the prop 65 list so are the herbicides that you're suggesting changing to also on the prop 65 list no ma'am oh okay so i i would assume from that not, that it would be not, at, not as toxic of. oh okay Knows I don't. As far as I know, they're not. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, ideally it would be good, uh, and I don't mean to interrupt you, <laughs> you know, you have more to give us, but ideally it would be good to not use um, uh, herbicides, poisonous herbicides, because we want to become toxic free to the best of our ability, and realizing it costs money because hand weeding costs a lot. But, I, you know, I, I remember a, a discussion we had here with Supervisor Foy back in the day who came up with this idea of using, like, an intern to, to uh, run papers for the district attorney's office or something. You know, it's like, oh, we could do that, and it's so less expensive. So I'm just wondering if something like, I, I think about Growing Works has a crew of weed whackers, you know, or you, as you say, you have the, uh, um, the probation folks, too, that can come out there. So I'm just wondering if this could be, a, you know, a work program in those areas 
areas instead of using a more expensive uh, ways of weed whacking the staff. And then when we're talking about we're not, you know, that we have all these torts because we're weed whacking, I'm just thinking because we're solution oriented here, you know, put up some ply boards <laughs> when you're weed whacking so the rocks don't go out into the road, you know, or just, you know, is there a way to get around that instead of saying we can't do that because whenever we do it, we hit cars. Well, we're going to come up with a different method. We're actually going to use hedge trimmers and try that. Okay. Uh, they won't throw the rocks like weed whackers do. That's good to hear. Uh, so we're going to try it. We don't know how effective they're going to be because they do jam pretty easily uh, unless you have very dense stocks. Uh, grass will have a tendency to jam the blades. So we're going to try it, see if it'll work. We don't know. Uh, we're looking at uh, more uh, that we can get, a smaller mower because we're on the trail. They really don't have a large area to, to maneuver. Uh, and basically, we're going to be mowing grass out there. But again, it's, it's very labor intensive because we have to constantly do it uh, because it, like your grass at home, if you're not killing the root, it's right. going to come back. So, so that weed whacking specific to the Ojai Valley Trail. It, it is actually to, it is actually to, we use, we weed whack in the other areas, we mow, we disc, we have a lot of different mechanisms that, along with spraying, that we do in the <laughs> other areas of the county uh, to manage for fire protection and for uh, aesthetics for the parks, uh, to make them look nice. So we use a combination of everything. But if we have to get rid of the spraying component of it, our labor hours are going to shoot up dramatically. Okay. Keep going. We've still got time. Well, I, We've got crunch time. <laughs> with that, that is the end, uh, basically. Um, what we're looking for, though, from the board is, you know, to uh, approve with continued use of systemic uh, herbicides that don't contain glyphosate for all the parks and facilities uh, and for airports and and fire protection district as stated before um, and for you to provide direction to for amendments to our leases leaseholds for pro, uh, prohibition of use of glyphosate because our golf courses use glyphosate based products our uh, lessees for our airstrip the Simi Valley Flyers use it to control weeds up around their airstrip Yes. And so does uh, our archer group out in Simi Valley. Uh, they use it to control the weeds uh, in their archery range. Uh, they go by the over-the-counter you know, jug of Roundup or uh, at nearest Lowe's or Home Depot, and they go out and spray to control. Those are all, we would have to mend all those leases, and we're, that's why I'm bringing that to the board. Well, Can I offer? Go ahead. A, Supervisor Bennett. A, a suggestion. Yeah, yeah, Supervisor Parks talked about, you know, you read this, there's significant cost involved here and stuff. Um, what I, what I, what I, there's so many details about this, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to weed whack, you know, can you put up the plywood? Some places you could maybe put up some, but other places it'd be very hard to figure out how you do that and not hit cars and all that other stuff. Well, what I think is the, the appropriate thing for us to do is have this be sort of an ongoing project in, in terms of it. But we, we, we've identified the direction. We want to move away from this. But I want to do it with common sense. I don't want to just say, oh, because the board said this, bang, now we have to, you know, we're, we're stuck and we have to do this. I, I want to move. So the board direction is that we want to try to decrease all of these toxic things, but we certainly want to, want to we're moving away from the glyphosate altogether. Are, should we move it away from treating a rundo in the river where we've already spent millions of dollars and we've whacked it back and we've got it almost under control and a, a little more application is going to keep us from having to refund the millions of dollars that we were given in grants to do that? No, we shouldn't. We, we, we haven't found a proven alternative. I'd like to let the professionals, they've impressed us over you know, many times in the past, not, not just the assist department, but all the professionals. We said, for example, to our animal service, our animal reg people, we said, try to move towards no kill. Right. And they got to no kill. Right. We didn't say you had to be all the way to no kill. We just said, try to move that direction. Impress us, you know, is kind of like, you know, <laughs> so, but, but, and, 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 I, and I say that in the best of, of, of intentions. You know, that's, our staff does that. They, yeah. they do great work. Uh, let's, I, I would like to say, let them use common sense yeah. and report back in, in a year, right? 
uh, and what improvements have you made? But so the public knows we're moving this direction, but, we're, we, we, but we've got to do it with common sense, you know, as we go forward. And so the priorities that I would try to offer would be, yes, we want to move that direction. And the trade-offs that we would ask you to look at is the greater the chance there is for human contact, you know, constituent contact with it, the more we want you to expend extra resources. The less chance there is for human contact with it, right. the, you know, th that's the trade-off we would like you to do. That's one. Two, we want our employees protected too. I mean, one of the things that Supervisor Long wasn't here, but one of the things is we had citizens having a picture of Highway 33 with a guy going down there riding one of those little four-wheel things, spraying with this blue, you know, smoke going everywhere, no mask on, and uh, and it's it's undefensible, you know, it's in, indefensible for us, you know, to, to have that, you know. Our employees, we want to make sure our employees are, are, are protected anytime they are doing this. So, if you've got a if you've got a different herbicide that isn't that is hasn't been identified as a carcinogen, great. That's an improvement. Is it where we want to stop? No. We want you know it's not where we want to stop. We want to go all the way, uh, and and try to get there. And 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 uh, it make but 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 I want to try to to let staff use their professional judgment with these trade offs, so that we get the most bang for our buck. We're going to invest extra dollars in this effort. I want to invest the extra dollars in where we're going to get the most gain for the public as we try to go forward. That's my sense. I, I don't know what the other board members think of that, but I'd like to just well, get people's reaction. And I'd like to, uh, we do have one speaker, and we'll get to you in just a minute, but I do want to um, discuss the thing about reducing public safety, employee safety, um, but then also the long term effect. And so to me, the Ojai Valley Trail. Is, is this where we want to leave it from 2014? We This is our test pilot of not doing anything except for the weed whacking. Is there a better way of doing and managing that trail? I wanted to ask for your opinion on that, if we're keeping it as is or doing what um, our staff feels would be the, the best way. Because you're hearing from our community that it's not as good as it should be. So I just wanted to bring that up as a discussion and not just keeping it where you're at is how can we do it better there? So I, I would like to ask that um, because I do think that the long-term effects are great. And as soon as we um, change things, we'll hear well, from our community. So what, what are your thoughts on that? My thoughts on that is if, if we try to direct them for other changes, then uh, uh, th that gets to a level of specificity that I would like to have the professionals Good. make those decisions. The professionals have already announced to the public we're not spraying on, on the bike trail, right? The professionals have to take into consideration that they've already said that. You start to spray, now you're changing policy. I want the professionals to come back and say, if you want to change policy, think that through, how are you going to notify the public, what's the policy change, et cetera, you know, if you were going to do that. It, it strikes me it wouldn't be the first thing I would do. You've got all kinds of other fish to fry here, right, as, as, as you go forward and stuff. But raising the issue what can we do better is there a way is there a time is there a, a certain situation it doesn't mean that it's off the table but i'd like to have the professionals do that yes. rather than us do that that's i agree on that but i want to make sure they hear from us that that's something to but but that is a public policy that's been announced to well, and it's happen. specific to eliminating the use of glyphosate correct i just wanted to so we should have some reasonable... And, and I, I agree. Uh, Supervisor Huber also mentioned a year is a long time. Six months kind of right. puts more fire under the, you know... I, 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 I disagree <coughs> in, in that... To see the changes. For example, um, when I requested that we have this study and these departments look at how to eliminate, um, we come back with the fire department saying now they're intending to discontinue the use of it. We're hearing from the um, airports that in public areas they're going to do so. Just by bringing it forward, we got that we've got some really good results, and I really appreciate the fact that parks can now switch in those public facilities too. And I would definitely support that. So I, I do think you want to give more direction than, you know, use your common sense and come back to us well, in a we year. Want to I, I, I do it on an ongoing basis. I don't well, know, I, a year from now, come back and tell us what you've done. I, 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 I just think 
Yeah. These kinds of reports to the board are labor intensive. They, they, they're busy trying to run the parks department and then, you know, pull, pulling this together. I just don't think they started, you started on this proposal, this coming to the board, I'm sure three, four months ago, right? Right after it, the last board hearing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they, they will be starting in two months yeah. to try to come back in six months. It, it's just not, it's not reasonable. Time. You know, look, it's not like the good things aren't going to happen. Good things did happen. Like you said, the fire department made these changes. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's fine if somebody wants to report, hey, the fire department made a change. But but I think if you if you direct them to come back to us in six months, in, in, in two months, they'll be back working on, on this project or, or even sooner. And that's just not enough time for anything to process. But that's, that's my so, and, own and thought. Then, hey, yes. Um, and the I would recommend exactly. a year. And the reason why to support a year versus six months is we need to get through another growing season. Right. We have to get through a growing season to see what we can do to manage the weeds and meet fires expectations. If we try to, if we start working on the report, as the supervisor said, now we really don't, we're not in a growing season right now, we're in the wet season. So we're not, we are doing some weed management out there right now, but nothing that we can do matrix on. Mm -hmm. So we need to, need to have another growing season, see if we get another super boom. Then the stuff that we need to do outside of the trail to try to reduce our use and find other types of ways of uh, meeting fire's expectations with uh, limited re or different resource uh, management to do that, which right. we're all about that because we're conscious of our budget, right. which is very tight as it is. We don't want to spend more than we have, but we need a growing season to get through to really manage and come back to you with real anecdotal information. Correct. And I think that right now, let's move on to our public comment. We have one. So uh, Judy Duggan. You don't need a script. You just got three minutes. Or if you want to go less, you can as well. <laughs> but thank you. Um, I, I do so appreciate that the county is trying to get rid of glyphosate in as many places as possible. And I know you're going to have to keep pushing forward on this. A couple of things, though. As more people stop using this Monsanto product, uh, Monsanto will have to look for other things to do, and the price of alternatives is likely to drop. I mean, look forward on this. Also look forward in the sense that um, other venues have had a number of lawsuits from employees with, who have come down with certain cancers after working with glyphosate. And what's the cost of any one of those suits? It could be in the millions. And, and factor that in to saying, oh my God, we can't afford to get these things hand pulled. Um, add the cost of glyphosate's effect on bees, already endangered and so necessary to Oxnard agriculture. It does uh, kill particular bacteria in the gut of bees and makes them very susceptible to other diseases. So that's, you know, we have to take all of this into account, not just today and not just tomorrow, but the future of the county and the future of our farming, our agriculture. So thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate your thank public you. comment. And I know also how important it is for our parks, particularly. I know we talked about golf courses and realized that's an expensive proposition for the lessees, but for where the children are playing and um, to have um, glyphosate sprayed, um, it, particularly since it's uh, considered a carcinogen, probable carcinogen by the state of California, if you uh, can switch over to something less lethal and preferably you know, going to uh, weed whacking where you can, I know that's the primary um, way of getting rid of weeds for weed mitigation abatement by the fire department is you get out there with your weed whackers. Uh, and um, if we can find ways that we can avoid the use of it. I, I, I think, I really do think a year is a, a really long time. It took them a while to get this report before us because they had to do a lot of uh, research. That's been done in terms of knowing how much they're using and where it's being used. And I just uh, also just really want to give kudos to those departments that say, hey, for those public areas, we don't need to do it. That's the right, right, right way to move. I, I agree. Uh, having a policy uh, to work our way out of using glyphosates, 
uh, is the way to go. We didn't have glyphosate, you know, 30, 40 years ago, and we all lived right. and managed to have parks and schools and golf courses and playgrounds. So I think we can do it, and uh, I, I would support going to six months uh, just because I would like to get faster action on the uh, effort to get rid of glyphosate in our county. I'll, I'll offer a suggestion, and that is six months have a report from any department that has made improvements. Right. That sounds okay? great. I'll tell you, just any department's made improvements, let's get a report in six months if you've made improvements. So it's mm -hmm. not like you have to come up with some great report, but if the fire department has suddenly said, hey, we're not doing it here, or uh, the, the harbor department says we made this change, great. But I don't want to, but to put them through one without another growing season, mm -hmm. I think, is just nonsensical. I, I think that's yeah. a great idea. Uh, I, I, I would yes. agree. Support. I'm in agreement with that. Uh, so let's just uh, let's put it on our calendar six months from, from now to have a report. No. Yeah. For, for anyone who has for made anybody that has an improvement any in six months, an improvement, an, an improvement, come and let us know about the improvement. Within the report from the Parks Department on the particular challenges they have is going to be in a year. Yeah. Mr. Van Dyke, you were going to say something. I, I was just going to say that. Um, we We've already made the decision based off of the previous uh, board hearing that we will not use glyphosate other than for Arundo. So you won't get an improvement statement from us on the elimination of glyphosate. You're getting it right now. Okay, no excellent. more glyphosate in the Parks Department other than Arundo control. That's uh, perfect. That's great. Um, and then uh, systemic herbicides, we will do our best to reduce the number uh, quantity that we use for that in the outlining park areas. Um, and then what we do about, ask is that the board give us direction on our lease, leasehold glyphosate use. And um, also back to the slide that showed the dollar figure. So you're still keeping us on the 43,000. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Um, and then you have your cost of the 180,000. As labor, is labor, free labor costs, but that's what it accounts for. I want to make sure the clear is as what we're approving today does not put us to the $839,000. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. Yes. Okay. And also just real thankful too for GSA grounds that have stopped using it too. So that, that's, that's all really good news. So we're using a different chemical to do the job of the glyphosate that it was. We're gonna find what's the best. We'll work with Public Works as bi uh, biologists to figure out what is the best product. Uh, one of the tough ones that everybody hates, especially bike riders, is puncture vine. Mm -hmm. And that's not something you, it's very difficult to mm -hmm. get with a weed whacker uh, because it's just a blanket type of weed and it's tough okay. to get up. Uh, so, and that's that, if you don't kill it, then those, it, it, once it seeds. So the motion, <laughs> the motion on the table um, now is to receive and file the report. We've provided you the guidelines that you need. I, are we clear? I want to make sure we're clear in what we're doing to re come back in a year. And if any, any of the departments in six months has any great changes, to come back and let us know and to authorize the GSA park and um, fire uh, to use the glyphosate on the Arundo um, as required. So it's... Is there anything else I've missed? Well, it? Are we going to have a review in six months? Is uh, what I'm understanding. No, we talked about what we're doing is if any department has any significant changes of good, they will come back in six months. The park, um, our parks department will come back in a year. Is there any use of the leasehold? Is the only other term. Right. What we do with our leaseholds. Yes, with their results. Using the material. Is there anything else? We need a motion. motion. And the, uh, they, they will come back sooner than a year if they have yes. something to report yes. to us. If they have something to report back to us, then they will come back in a year or in uh, six months. What do, uh, we still have, uh, what's the board want us to do with our leasehold contract? I'd like to have a quarterly okay. progress report. On the leasehold, what do you want to do? Board. Ask a question. What? Yes. Are we, I mean, one option is to try to change all of our leases right now which means opening up those leases to negotiations, right? And the other would be to make this change as the leases come up, mm -hmm. right? And um, what what do our professionals, what do our professionals have for a recommendation regarding that? Right. In terms of, I don't know what the impacts are of opening all the leases up. 
Um, what are the risks or, or are there other issues that come up in that situation? Uh, ask the yeah. council and uh, ask. And, and we may want to look at the leases too. I know, for example, with um, anticoagulant rodenticides, that is in some of the leases already, and it might also refer to the larger toxic uh, uh, pesticide use. And I would suggest that as the leases come up, we, we are able to then modify it because because we're bound by contract, we, I, my understanding and, and our uh, legal counsel can advise us. I think we have to wait till the contract is up for us to be able to go into negotiation for the new contracts, correct? That would be correct generally. You'd have to read okay. the lease to see if it is an go. opening. But that's well, the general rule. We, we would like to, you know, typically we have some short-term leases. The air uh, field is on a short-term lease. Uh, the archers just went on a long-term lease because they needed it for a grant for their uh, Olympic range. But our golf courses, they may they use a lot of other chemicals besides glyphosate on golf courses to yeah. maintain them. So they're very prudent and very professional uh, in their maintaining of their courses. We will con uh, communicate with our le lessees and ask them to, if they could, to please not use glyphosate. Okay. But when their leases come up, we will put the language in their leases like we did for any coagulants and styrofoam uh, use and get that added in. And then right. even with the volunteers, you know, doing the little airstrip for their planes, I really wouldn't want to encourage the volunteers to be using glyphosate, you know, if they can use uh, weed whacking. That makes so much more sense. Yeah. So we're not, uh, you know, we, we want to protect our employees. We also want to protect the volunteers that are at our sites, too, as well as the public. Yeah, we don't want to have a liability. So uh, do we have a motion? i got to keep us moving here. I know this is a really good... Can I check with you? Oh, um, no. It's stuck. Can you, um, Supervisor Parks' screen is stuck. And, and uh, I, I just want to say, we did a survey in near Babuina, Malibu, and we asked the residents there if they would like to use something other than glyphosates, have the county not use glyphosates along the road there. And, of course, we got well over 90% saying, yeah, don't use glyphosates no. along the road. But the Public Works Department has a policy where they will sign an agreement with the landowner that if the landowner clears the weeds along their frontage, um, then um, they won't spray it. Okay. And so those kind of creative ideas. And we got two thirds of the residents saying that's they want that policy. <laughs> they they want to do that agreement because they feel so strongly that they don't want to have the glyphosates. All right. So I, it has been motioned by uh, Supervisor Parks. Do I get a second? We repeat the motion. Well, that's what I, uh, yeah, if we could have Lori repeat the motion, there's a lot of good ideas in there. I want to make sure we're mm -hmm. capturing all of them. Thank so, Lori, you. go ahead. Direct staff to utilize their professional judgment and common use, or I'm sorry, use common sense to move away from use of glyphosate with the following priority trade off. The greater the human contact, the more resources invested to reduce usage. Use the same approach to protecting employees and volunteers. Report back to the board on progress in one year. Report in six months from any department that has any changes. Second the motion. Oh. And the lessees. And then also the included is the leases, the leases as they come up. Change the leases as they come up. Mm -hmm. I think come up for renewal. Thank you for the confirmation on that. And the second was supervisor here. Yeah. And then that they can use it on a rundo. That was also part of the motion. There, there are grants out there, too, and I know Public Works is looking at the potential yeah, of using that. something other than glyphosates for Arundo. We're, we're staying in touch with Public Works uh, and what they think of the biggest, biggest department right. using this. So if they can find a product that works, uh, we'll definitely jump on it. All right. It's been motioned in second, and can everyone vote, please? I, I think we should report in six months from any department that has any improvements. Improvements. It should be improvements, not changes, right? I like all eyes on. Great. So you made that change? I did. Great. Thank you. All right. Motion is approved. Thank you very much for everyone for all Thank your you. hard work on this and creativity. And look at all the speakers. I know. Withdraw. <laughs> all right. Moving on. I apologize for the delay. We're about an hour behind. Uh, we have a receive and file for Ventura County Civic Alliance. Easy. 
for 2019. Welcome, gentlemen. Good morning, uh, Chair Long, Supervisor, CEO Powers. For the record, I'm Dave Fleisch. Uh, usually you see me standing in front of you from the Public Works uh, Agency, but I'm not standing here for that this morning. Today I have the honor and privilege of standing here as a co-chair of the Ventura County Civic Alliance, uh, which was founded in 2001. The Civic Alliance is a nonprofit <coughs> leaders with a commitment to the three E's, economy, and social <coughs> equity. Okay. Uh, one of our primary items that we are known for is our State of the Region report, which first was produced in 2002. The most addition, recent addition to that report is the 2019 report, and you should all have a copy of that in front of you. Uh, I'm joined today by David Marin, right behind me here, and he'll be hey, standing David. up in just a second. He's the current vice chair of the Civic Alliance and a founding member of the Civic Alliance, and he actually is, I would call him Mr. State of the Region because he's really the guy that uh, makes sure that this gets, gets produced every couple of years. And I'm going to let him get up because he's more the expert than me and talk to you about what the report has to say. And I would first like to say thank you very much for your flexibility. I know you were at the board meeting the last time and you rescheduled and now we're an hour behind. So I apologize, but I, what you have here to say is really great. And I just want to say thank you for coming back to yeah, thank you. us. Thank you. It'll be my pleasure to take up all 30 minutes. You've allotted. <laughs> No, I Thank don't you. plan to do that, but congratulations, Supervisor Kelly, on being the board chair, board members. I'd like to run through this. I first want to acknowledge, though, the uh, great fortune of the Civic Alliance to have someone like Dave Fleisch as our chair. He's been doing that uh, for the last year or two, and we were so pleased we asked him to do it again in 2020. So this report, as you all know, takes quite a lot of work. It's very expensive to produce, and we could not do that without the support of our organizations. They're sponsors, but they're really partners in a sense. The Community Foundation, the Community College District. These are some of our larger sponsors, Era Energy, AT&T, the California Lutheran University, I'm sorry, and uh, Channel Islands University. And then also the County of Ventura, grateful for your continuing support, House Automation, Montecito Bank, and Lee Monera. One of the first things to point out, and uh, this is a bit of a theme in the report, is the aging of Ventura County. And in Ventura County, the average age is now 37.5 in 2017. And that has trended up since the year 2000 when it was 34. So what we included in this report was some information showing the actual <clears throat> percentage of people in each city that are over 65. That's the bottom line. So Camarillo uh, has quite a large amount. But Ojai has the highest percentage over 65. 22%. And then we also included under 18. So you can see cities like uh, Fillmore have 28.6% of their population is under 18. Same with Santa, uh, Oxnard and Santa Paula. So some of those cities are our younger cities, and we have other cities that are getting much older. And that's obviously going to have implications as we go forward, especially with the aging of Ventura County. Does that also have to deal with price of housing? It somewhat, somewhat is, is the uh, number of sales. Camarillo has Leisure Village, mm -hmm. so you have a large uh, group of people who live there. Ojai, I think, has very little turnover as far as sales, so people tend to age in place as far as moving. But it is, uh, it has consequences, and especially in the home health care. I remember a few years ago, it was the city of Moore Park that had the youngest population, and just a lot of new homes and people moving in and having children. <laughs> Right, absolutely. So and certainly with the, Oxnard is now the youngest um, age. Oxnard has uh, some of the youngest. It's uh, mm -hmm. I'm going the wrong way, but uh, I think with Oxnard, the percentage under uh, over 65 is only 9.5 percent. So that's mm -hmm. certainly one of the lowest. And then it has 28 uh, percent of the population is under 18. So Oxnard that's is a growing city. And significant, yeah. And that has great implications for the school districts because that'll be more people into the schools. That's why that school district is growing. But in some other areas, like Ojai, school district is facing uh, situations where they may have to close a school. Agriculture continues to be an important bedrock of Ventura County as far as our economy uh, reaches over 4% of the economy. There was a dip in the 2017 as far as the total, but it's still over 2 billion, very solid. Some of that dip was in avocados and some in some other crops, but overall pretty stable. We'll just have to watch these numbers over the next couple of years. One of the important stories I like to tell about Ventura County is just how much of our food is shipped around the world. We consume a lot here, but because of some of the infestation of the pests, Canada now has to do more paperwork so we know more about shipments to Canada. Previously under NAFTA, we didn't have to do that. But 
You can see that Media. crops are going around Japan, Korea, Saudi Arabia, a variety of uh, crops. So you're all politicians. I thought I'd bring up the slides here about voter turnout. You can see on these screens that we have uh, in green is the mail-in ballots. So the percentage of people who are voting by mail has gone up every year of our report, now almost 64% in 2018. So certainly those of you uh, who, let's say, were walking precincts when you were uh, young and you always had to get everybody to the polls on election day, now only a third of the people pretty much go to the polls. The rest of them are voting absentee. So now, so now we walk only a third of the city, is that, or, or the county? Yeah. <laughs> So this is the party affiliation by the entire county. So blue is Democrats, red is Republican, and green is no party preference. Uh, the real story of Ventura County since 2000 is the growth of no party preference from 19% all the way up to 30% 30 30 now. Um, the Democrats have stayed about even, 38, 39, 40, so the no party preference growth has come at the expense of the Republican registrations in Ventura County. Interesting. Okay. So then people ask me, well, what about by city? So in Ventura County, Oxnard has the highest percentage of Democrats. Simi Valley has the highest percentage of Republicans. But you can see that across every city, the no party preference is about, the no party preference is relatively consistent. So we see that all across the board, but changes in the cities. Okay, let's talk about the economy. So you all, everybody hears about the unemployment rate. We have that in our report, but I thought it might be more helpful to show you the actual employment growth, what we've seen in Ventura County. So back in 2008, we had the huge decline from the Great Recession. The number of jobs went from as high as 200, almost 300,000, down to as little as 275,000. It's taken us quite a long time, almost 10 years. We've mostly made all of that back, maybe a little bit more. But projections are for a flattening of the growth rate in the number of jobs. So we're not creating new jobs. We're creating some, and that's very positive. The unemployment rate is great, but we are not creating the number of jobs as the other counties around us, Los Angeles, other counties. They're seeing much higher job growth. So it's hard to read, but what I want to show you is the employment by sector. So what this shows us is that the jobs we are creating happen to be in low-paying industries. We are not creating the jobs in the high-paying industries. So uh, over here, the blue, that blue line is 10 years ago pre-recession. This is manufacturing, and it had a huge decrease, and we have not made that back. Construction had a huge decrease. We have not made that back. Those jobs pay very well. Where we've seen growth is over here in areas like leisure and hospitality. Uh, that's a great entry-level job. Your son or daughter graduates the community college or the university. They go and they get a job at a hotel. They're in the workforce. They're learning all about life, but it doesn't pay very well. You certainly can't go buy a home in Ventura County on those kind of wages. There is some good news as far as in the health sector and the education sector. We're growing jobs there. But the Before IT you... industry is pretty flat here in Ventura County. Uh, they're great-paying jobs, of course. And I know that the naval base, the colleges, they're working on cybersecurity, trying to bring in that. But most of the employers doing information have a real tough time bringing people here. Yeah, so uh, you, you. You, you pointed out that uh, neighboring counties around us are, are producing more jobs. Um, is that, no, stay, stay where you are. Okay. The other slide. And, and you talk about how we're, we're producing more of these low service providing jobs. What's the ratio of service providing jobs being produced in Los Angeles County and those other counties do you know? I, I don't know that, but I can tell you on a national basis, we are transforming from a goods producing country to exactly. a service producing country. So, so it may be that many of the counties around us are having the same trend, which is moving from a goods producing country to uh, count, you know, Absolutely. counties to that. Yes. So the question is, are they just producing more service uh, providing jobs, right, that are out there? The, the, right. the, the, um, uh, I'll let you finish, but and, and I do think that, but we, so we don't have the data on what's happening with manufacturing. In right, but 
they are attracting more employers. So even if the jobs are not as high paying, they are seeing sure. either more organic service. growth from small businesses, people starting new companies, or they just have the policies or the infrastructure. Right. Ventura County cannot attract a company that needs to be by LAX. Mm -hmm. We just can't do that. So there are differences as far as infrastructure and the economy and also housing, as you know. Um, you know more affordable housing attracts more employers. So Dave. Well, uh, well then let me, let me just do this while I have this. I won't interrupt sure. you again. Um, You use CLU forecasting statistics a lot in this report. Uh, for this particular chart, uh, yes. There's wow. some of that, but some of this, and we have all the sources listed in the yeah, back. Yeah, exactly. So, but, but the forecasting but that's, is, but that's, right. but, that's, but that's been a forecasting group that has constantly tried to stay focused on sort of pa painting a negative picture, in my mind, of, oh, yeah. about Ventura County for, for a variety of reasons. And... Um, but, but I understand why you'd use some of their statistics. But in terms of trying to have this be a balanced approach, trying to have other statistics also valuable. One thing that I would point out after spending a lifetime with, with, with economic statistics and stuff, you can always find economic statistics to paint the picture that you want to paint. If you, if, if you have... Um, if you have job growth, you say, well, that job growth's not as much as everybody else. Uh, then when, when, the, when, the, when the recession hit, and we had, we, everybody pointed out, Ventura County's lost jobs, right? But nobody said Ventura County lost fewer jobs than they did in Riverside and San Bernardino. That wasn't sure. the headlines, right? We never got the headlines about when things go bad, Ventura County doesn't go down as much. When things go good, Ventura County like, likewise doesn't go up as much. Like you said, we don't have LAX right next to us. Correct. We don't go up, we don't go down. There's not, a, there's, there's not a factoring in of Ventura County is far more sustainable and far more manageable because of that, because it is sustainable. That doesn't get highlighted at all. And I, I, I venture that if we go back, we look at the the Civic Alliance economic report about how bad the Ventura County economy was in 2010 and you know, during the recession, it will, there won't be any comparisons to how much is the assessed valuation, the assessed valuation dropped by 30% in places like San Bernardino and Riverside County. It barely budged in Ventura County. You don't get that pointed out. So um, I just think we ought to talk about Ventura County. My suggestion is we talk about Ventura County more in the sustainability question and the long-term trends. It's, I, I, I want to know, and I think we need to, to be creative about how we bring in better high paying jobs and how we get our workforce educated so they can handle it. But I'm not so sure that I, uh, that I want us to be either on a trend where we're trying to attract millions of people like San Francisco and Los Angeles do. I mean, it is a trend in the whole country that there are mega cities that are growing like crazy and almost everybody else is stagnating. Or, or I shouldn't say stagnant, everybody else is, is, is staying much more flat. Right? That's a trend. That, that, that's not a trend that's a, a, a fault of Ventura County. It's a trend of young people moving to these, these cities and high tech being in those cities and, and, and all of that. So uh, that's my suggestion as, as I read this report. So here we have the low unemployment rate. We have some issues, but because we can't say things are bad employment wise, we instead say, well, they're not as good as the other places, but we never say, now we're better than those other places when those other places are down. Thank you very much. Thank you. You know, if you look at, I'm jumping into 32, and you, you can see the stability uh, or the, this horizontal line of growth for a very long time. Um, and as we have COLA, cost of living, and we have housing pricing and so forth, we have to look at this. We have to look at what jobs are out there for our youth um, all our middle class uh, because we need to be able to, we want our kids and our friends to stay and live here. Um, we're not trying to get millions and millions of people to live here, but we want to at least be able to sustain. And I think this is the value um, that we're looking at these, this data and trying to understand what affordable housing we do need and, and what jobs do we need to be able to live here um, and not just retire here because we need all the services. It has to be a full circle. It can't just be um, 
one-sided. So, so let's Chair, continue. Yes, Dave, real quick, between the county and, and the base, there's about 20,000 jobs. Yes. Approximately, and that's about a $4 billion payroll between both of them. Right. Is this taken into consideration here, too? And, and before you can answer that, my understanding, I belong to the Regional Defense Plan, and my understanding is that the base needs quite a few engineers. Are we, you know, looking at the service industry compared to engineers and so forth? Yeah. The base does work with the universities in many areas, works with the county as far as trying to attract, trying to create career tracks for the students going through so they have the jobs. The base is uh, actively working with employment or employers right. to look at places for synergy. The problem is getting those young people to be able to afford to live here in some cases. Yep. We're attracting them here as well. But uh, if we lost the base, it could be devastating to Ventura mm -hmm. County. Yep. So that, the housing is an issue for... Yeah. It, it always will be everywhere, yeah. I mean, for young people to be able to afford things. But Dave, between the two, between us, you know, the 9,000, the, the 20,000 base, I mean, jobs, that's, I think that's really significant. That, and a lot of contractors. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Okay. So thank, thank you all for the observations. I would point out that the reason the Civic Alliance was formed was really around the quality of life. We all agree Ventura County is an amazing, extraordinary place to live. Mm -hmm. And that's why the Alliance wants to be involved in continuing and sustaining that quality of life across all of the areas. You know? mm -hmm. So whether it's the environment, the economy, social equity, that's what we're doing. And, and to the point, uh, Supervisor Bennett, about statistics, I remember an old saying, don't ever believe a statistic you did not make up yourself. So <laughs> yes, we could you know, fudge things one way or another, but we try to get the data from a variety of sources, mostly Census Bureau and others. I, 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 yeah, I appreciate your statement about the Civic Alliance was formed because we want to try to focus on the quality of life here. I, 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 that, I don't think that, in my mind, I don't, I don't have the perception that Civic Alliance has, that, that, that all of the people involved in the leadership of the Civic Alliance are as focused on that as they are as focused on what I think is sort of the CLU effort of it's always got to be about more, more and more uh, at, 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 and, 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 and undermining efforts to try to make sure we're sustainable while we, while we do better. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll move into education. I know this is not the purview of the board, but we talked about the aging of Ventura County. Purple up here is K through eighth grade, and the green down below is ninth through 12th. So you can see that the numbers uh, have been declining, and it's going to continue to decline as we uh, see less students. And again, could be many factors you could look at. Families deciding to wait longer to have children, having less children, uh, the affordability. And um, once that K-8 wave sort of crests, then it sort of ripples into the 9 through 12 area. One other statistic from the education side is what we call the misery index. For, this is created by Dr. Jamshid Damui, uh, looking at various indicators at various school districts around the county. The lower scores uh, represent a higher quality of life, if you will, uh, and the much higher numbers out here on the right uh, are more difficult circumstances. Some of the indicators are uh, is the family receiving uh, some type of welfare or food stamps? Uh, do they speak English in the household? Uh, do the children um, have, or does someone provide, do they eat school lunches uh, for free? So those types of things. There's a lot more to read in it. I just pointed out for you. And I'll go ahead and uh, move into right. land use and housing. So in Ventura County, uh, this is showing housing permits. You are all the experts in this and know that a permit doesn't necessarily mean an actually constructed house. But these were permits pulled over the years, back in 2003 and 4. Uh, we were going uh, pretty well, I mean, 3,500, 4,500. The recession hit, and everything came to a stop. We've been crawling back, and then in 2017, the numbers were higher. But if you are looking for uh, new permits, you can see we have quite a backlog we haven't made up for. Mm -hmm. uh, some people use the statistics saying, well, if we have 800,000 people in the county and we grow by 1% or 2%, that's 8,000, 16,000 people. You know, divide that, maybe three or four in a home, you can get an idea of how many houses we need. That's just one way of looking at it. But we're growing again. We're issuing more permits, but not like the way we were. The apartment rents is something that's impacting, I think, a lot of our young people. The 
uh, back in 2005, we were at 1,400, and we stayed very level. The blue line there is the average rent for a two-bedroom apartment. And we were pretty good until 2014. Uh, then the rents went up, and at the same time, the vacancy rate went down. So 2.37% of our apartments are available. Very hard to go get an apartment these days. And of course, landlords are in the driver's seat. Uh, and so by city, we showed the average rents down below. Smee Valley, 2,000. Ventura's a little better, 1,800. Oxnard, 1,700. New supply has been coming online, but they are expensive. I mean, I've seen the quotes even 22 to 2,500 for a two bedroom right now. Sure. And it's a 2% vacancy rate. I mean, it's amazing. It's the amenities. If you want avocado toast in the morning, it's more. No, so, so, Dave, Dave, uh, Dave, so the question is uh, mixed use. Uh, I've heard a lot of mixed use is, is one of the, the, the issues, some of the things that we can do to improve housing. Is that so the mixed use are incorporated in this, as it is. whether the apartments are on top of a coffee shop or if they're standalone, they're all included. But uh, certainly the mixed use developments from what I've read uh, by providing local place without having to get in your car to fight transportation issues, that can be better. Uh, I think from what I've heard of other developers looking to grow, they're all trying to put the amenities in one place have things in the area, so I think mixed use is uh, been Mixed use and density is uh, some of the solutions that I've heard. Yeah, yeah, certainly the density is a question, and I don't know that any city warmly wants it. more density. But, so, you know, I've heard it you know, quite yeah. often. <laughs> it's a, I think in many places it'll have to be a fact of life, and a lot of it, too, is just looking at the infill. Instead of growing mm -hmm. on the edges of your city, if you can come in and look at growing infill. within the city. Thousand Oaks has the uh, Thousand Oaks Boulevard plan. Smee Valley is looking at some things. Uh, different cities are trying to do that. And now with the governor's push with the affordable housing and the RENA numbers that come from SCAG and, and so forth, that'll be a very interesting um, future for us. Do you have another on housing? Uh, let's see. Housing okay, affordability. I'll wait. We'll okay. Finish housing. This just compares our county to other counties. And what this is saying is for using the standard metrics of what it costs to buy a home and what the average income is in that area. I believe this is Census Bureau has said, okay, in Ventura County in 2018, 28% of the population could afford to buy a home. Uh, certainly more people are buying homes than 28%. They're just struggling to do it. Maybe they have to get a, someone to rent from them. They're giving up on some other things in their life. San Bernardino, Riverside, no surprise, much cheaper. L.A., Orange, more expensive. And uh, I appreciate the, actually, some of the information in here I appreciate because particularly when uh, CLU did such a, you know, really damning report out at SCAG, for example, to the entire General Assembly, all the economists had basically the same information. And it's very similar because we are a region. And as you can see, for example, you know, 28% affordability in Ventura County, 22% Los Angeles, 20 Orange County, 27 California. It's all pretty much the same. But it was good to have this report um, to actually show the positives. And that's what I see, uh, page 59 and 60 of your report. It, it talks that uh, Ventura County housing statistics the number of, of um, new homes permitted to be built, we're at a 14-year high, right? Between yes. uh, 2005, uh, it's our fifth year in, the ro in a row of year-to-year -year growth. So we're having more housing starts than we have had in a really long time. Um, and then on the next page, it talks about home ownership rate. And in the county, uh, we have a home ownership rate, according to um, your report, of 63.2 percent, 63 higher than the statewide average of 54 percent. So that's pretty exciting, too, that, and that is even higher than most of the region of the home ownership rate in Ventura County, for whatever reason. Um, and it, it points out in the third paragraph, um, Ventura County's home ownership rate is the high is higher than other Southern California counties, with the exception of Riverside County. Um, so it just to me there are some real positive things, and and obviously coming from the Board of Supervisors, we don't like to be having our county slammed, but we, you know, but you do want to 
to have that balance approach and I was thankful for the numbers that you have in here that can be cited because we have some things um, to definitely uh, sing our praises with uh, from this report and I appreciate that. Absolutely. And what I always find interesting is how you might draw connections between data. So we have a higher ownership rate and we have a lower crime rate. Mm -hmm. And statistics show that people who own their homes are more invested in their neighborhoods. They know their neighbors. They care about what's going on in their community. Right. So yeah. causation, correlation, that's the question. And, but and there is a, you know, an emphasis you know, throughout uh, our area. We all need to build more houses. I mean, if you want to accommodate the growing population. But your report also says that um, in 2016 and 2017, new building permits of 4,000 some more more than kept pace with the population growth of 5,000 residents or roughly 1,700 homes. So that's also really nice to see that we are keeping pace. Um, but, I, you know, I don't, not to rest on our laurels, but certainly to, to point out that it isn't uh, as dire as some make it to be. Right. Well, and if I could point out, it does say that, that we're keeping pace. But, and this is what I mean by, I think, the overall tone, which is my concern, but it, but it then says, we still have plenty of catching up to do to make up for the deficits incurred between 2006 and 2015. It's like they can never leave with a positive. Yeah. It, it always has to be but, however, but. And, and, We're keeping uh, pace is a good thing. Well, I think yeah, I see that pace. as. But uh, put, put that into context. A every county's trying to, you know, trying to make up for the deficits that happened during yeah, and, the recession. And, the, and you can look at the, you know, just the uh, percentage of homeless. I mean, we just have so much to say yeah. for our county. Right. But I, I just tell you that we were just uh, slammed like you wouldn't believe at, right. the, in the, at this right. Right. huge. Right. I would just say really. that's opportunity. Mm -hmm. We have opportunities in yeah. this county. Absolutely. And, and to clarify, yeah. the only yeah. data in the report that comes from SURF, the actual economic forecasting thing, is that forecast data in the economy section. All of this other data is produced by a separate wing of CLU and the Census Bureau, the State Department of Finance, and other statistics like that. Thank you. So, Good to hear. Okay. So we'll go ahead and move into the natural and environmental. And this is probably a nice segue because this gives us a chance to look at all the great things that are going on in Ventura County. Mm -hmm. It is remarkable what has happened. I mean, in my lifetime, we've gone from smog, can't see mountains in LA, to <coughs> the sky. And one of the stories I like to share is the one about solar capacity. And certainly, your board has been on the forefront of promoting solar use in Ventura County. And this shows the amount of growth in solar capacity. We now have probably about a third of a full generating station just in solar capacity in Ventura County. And as, since it's, as you know, in the government in California was offering incentives and rebates, and a lot of that phased out, but it didn't stop the growth. So it was really a government program that worked well, it primed the pump, it got us going on solar. We've grown and grown, the program's ended, and we're still growing as far as solar capacity. So uh, the corollary to this is that the average use of electricity in Ventura County has gone down per capita. Um, well, I should say not even per capita, but just overall. The electricity use in 2017, I believe, is what we were using about 10 or 11 years before that. So we have not seen a great rise. We don't need more power stations with this. Uh, water quality has been great years and years ago. Kitty Beach and those things were really polluted, but the county has uh, done a great job. Back in 2017, was the huge drop. Stayed pretty low. We are seeing a little creeping up here. It may be that there's uh, a lot of low-hanging fruit that was uh, taken care of with some of the beaches. Uh, I think some of this in 17, 18 might have been related to runoff from the Thomas fire. All the debris could have flowed out. So. Uh, we'll have to watch this, but it is, uh, and I know that your pollution control district is doing a great job of monitoring all these. Yeah. Actually, that's probably not pollution control. That would have been the water quality. Public health, I included this. We have many charts like this in the report. The State of California Education Department goes out to students in the 11th grade every, few year, every year and does a survey as far as how they view their lives. They report. So it's self-reported. But it's still indicative of trends. And this shows over a couple of years. This first one is the amount of kids reporting sadness in 12 months. And we see uh, just about 30% in many of the school districts are with our kids reporting that. And some have climbed. Ventura Unified has gone up a bit. Mm -hmm. Space leveled up. Ojai had a big climb. 
Oak Park even with all of its wealth climbing. So we're seeing a lot of sadness. And then sadly, the chart below is showing the suicide. Now, this is the number of students who have thought about it. And we include the actual question in the chart so you know what the students had to think about. So you can see what some of these numbers are uh, about. But certainly, thank goodness, we haven't had a wave of actual suicides. But the fact that 15% of our students have seriously thought about it is concerning. There's other charts in here about teen smoking, vaping. We are seeing a great rise in vaping, yep. uh, particularly in the wealthier school districts is where we see the rise in vaping. Uh, so there's a lot of great data if you have the time to look through it. Opioid deaths. So I know that the board is focused on this. This is 2017 data, 85 deaths. We thought it would be helpful to compare it, uh, Ventura County against other counties. Uh, we were trending downward. We had a spike in 2017. I think we're still up around that number. The thing to understand about opioids is that this is both legal and illegal drugs. Right. Um, and I believe um, a year or two ago, the, nationally, we've lost 70,000 people have died from an overdose of opioids. Mm -hmm. It's somewhat hard to believe, but more people die in this country from opioid deaths than vehicle crashes. Yeah. So the fact that we've made cars safer <clears throat> but we've made our Medical. appealing to take these kind of drugs uh, and just a huge number of deaths, fentanyl, the others. So that's an important item. Public safety, I mentioned uh, that Ventura County is really the second safest large county in California. Great news there. Um, and you can see some of those large counties. So only San Diego was safer than us. As far as <laughs> as Purple is violent crime, green is fucking <coughs> crime. By city, Moore Park uh, leads this time as far as the lowest overall crime rate. Uh, it, uh, Ojai had the lowest violent crime rate, and uh, the lowest property crime rate was in uh, Moore Park. Uh, Ventura had the highest crime rate, the actual city. Mm -hmm. okay. Social services. So uh, the homeless count you're all aware of. I won't really uh, dwell on this too much. We did include veterans this time. Uh, green, I believe these numbers actually came from one of your agencies. Right. By city, we can see the different cities and they're measuring how that's going. I know you're all seeing that. 211 calls, they get about 30,000 calls a year, so it's somewhat indicative of what life is like in Ventura County for those that are facing challenges. And the number one challenge, 31% of those calls are around housing. Mm -hmm. Child abuse, we did another <clears throat> statistic here to compare against the various counties. And transportation, we are seeing a decrease in the amount of people commuting for less than five minutes or five to nine minutes. That decrease is because it's now taking them much longer. All of these uh, statistics or numbers to the right, those are all increasing as we see a growth in the times. A lot of that is people having to drive longer distances to get well-paying jobs. Right. So they'll work in LA County or work in Santa Barbara or Goleta and uh, commute. One thing I wanted to point out, you didn't show a slide on it, but just for us as we had domestic violence month here today, well, not to domestic violence, but that's one of the hot items that we have for 911 calls. It looks like it's down, but it doesn't mean that domestic violence is down, but maybe they're being um, assisted with 211 and interface and, and so forth. So just to kind of look at those connections. Exactly. Like you were saying earlier, is really important. It's so hard. The child abuse is a good example where you see yeah. the numbers go up, but then some people say, well, that's because more people are finally reporting. Right. So is it good news that we're reporting more, or is it good news that the actual rates went up? It's hard to know. It's very hard. Thank you. Wildfire impacts. We included information for the public so that they would see the devastation from the Thomas fire on the left there was $1.47 billion of uh, property damage from the Thomas fire. The one on the right is the Woolsey fire and the Hill fire. Now, this is only showing the Ventura County portion. So Ventura County lost $387 million from Woolsey. But overall, I believe Woolsey was like 3 or $4 billion, yeah. massively destructive. So it's interesting for the public to see how much was property loss, auto damage, that type of thing. I'm at the halfway point of my presentation. No, <laughs> this is the end of the presentation. Thank you. Uh, so we're grateful uh, for the board's support, the county support, and uh, the chief the county executive office's support for all of this. We are, we've been distributing these books all over the county, uh, schools, city councils, others. If there's any additional questions, I'm happy to take them.
Well, David, I just would like to ask uh, Dave, thank you so much. Please pass on to your board and all their efforts to provide this information for our community is really important. Um, looking at the data, yes, we could critique data one way or another and make graphs look different ways. But the importance is that we're all focused in the good of the community and how do we get there. Um, and when we look at the data, that's, that's where we can dig deeper and really get a better understanding. So I appreciate it. I know I, I've been reading these books for a long time now, and I'm always learning. Um, yes, I might agree or disagree on one point or another, but it's a, it's a huge value for us to have this type of resource. So I wanted to say thank you very much. Please pass on to your executive committee the wonderful job they did on this. This is very thorough and appreciated. Thank you so much. It is, it is really a great resource to have. Like I said, I was, I was really happy to be able to pull out some data. Um, did Tony Biasati work on this again this year? Yes, Tony was our writer. Yeah, he does. an independent to do the writing. Thank you. And Dave, and Dave, thank you so much. The chair and vice chair, right? Yes. Thank you. Excellent job. And, and to Mr. Merritt in particular, um, you have my comments about some of the issues here, you have been a remarkably steady commitment uh, to uh, being a regional champion uh, for all of us in, yeah. uh, in Ventura County. And I just want to say thank you. It's, your, your, your commitment and your professionalism are obvious all the time when you work. So thank you very much for this. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. So with that, um, if anyone else does, I need a motion to receive and file. So I would just like to point out um, one of the things we're trying to do with the Alliance is not although this is a key component of ours, is to keep the drumbeat of things going on. And two years ago, we did, uh, in, in between of the reports, a future of the region conference, and we're looking to do that again okay. in the May-June time frame. What we try to do is take uh, two or three of the domains and connect them, sort of connect the dots together of those. And where the board right now is trying to work through exactly what are the key elements of that, and we certainly, you know, love the input that we get when we go out and present to the different uh, entities because that helps us inform what, what the public and, and the thought leaders are trying to get us to, to look at. So thank well, you. wonderful. Thank you very much. It's been motioned and second. Can I have a vote? I always uh, wonder about job growth because it, it, it's really hard to define, you know, a, if it's just a number of companies that come in and, and have new jobs because people retire and we have this whole boom, you know, the baby boomers that are getting old and they're retiring and getting out of the workforce. There aren't as many younger ones to fill those positions necessarily and just kind of seeing that as well as uh, some places uh, mothers can stay at home and don't have to work if they've reached that level of uh, economic um, support. So it, to me, it, it's, it's that's a question I always wonder is, you know, what are the real uh, numbers behind those figures of you know job growth and then I know I've talked with our CEO too about the aspect of um, health care you know that it, it gets kind of linked in there with um, is it hospitality I believe or, it, yeah. or it just so it's it's like it's that. combined typically with education yes. and it does tend to dilute it a bit mm -hmm. so it's at some point it'd be good to try to break it out because it's one of those areas that's really evolving with high paying jobs. It's one of the ways you address the, the high price of housing here is to have good paying jobs that are evolving. And so healthcare is the second largest employer in our economy. So it's, definitely it's kind of interesting to start breaking down some of those big, those big categories to have a better understanding of it. That's well, and then also I know we've been, we unanimously um, approved this, but also if you're looking at the state level, we're being asked to do many different things on the county side. And that is affordable, that is housing, that is homelessness, that is mental health, and, and it breaks it down even farther. So kind of keeping us in line is, is good to help us to dive in deeper. So thank you very much. Greatly appreciate it, gentlemen. Thank you. Moving on to the public hearing under the Tax Equity and Financial Responsibility Act and the Internal Revenue Code of 1986. Hello. Good afternoon, Christy Madden with the County Executive Office. Like others, congratulations, Supervisor Long, on your Thank chairpersonship. You. Um, I know that I'm the last item keeping you from lunch, so I'm going to be brief. Uh, today, we're asking that the board conduct a public hearing to comply with the requirements of TEFRA 
and that your board adopt a resolution to authorize the California Municipal Finance Authority to issue about $73.6 million in bonds to benefit Clinicus. The bonds will be used to refinance a variety of debt and to construct and reconstruct a couple of facilities in the city of Oxnard. We do have representatives here from both CMFA, Mr. John Stoker and Roy Nelson from Clinicus, if you have any questions. Thank you very much. So I will open this for a public hearing. Do we have any public comments? No public comments. Um, all right, so I will close this public comment public hearing. Uh, board members, do you have any questions for Clinicas or any of those that are here today? In seeing none, we have a motion and we have a second. Thank you very much for the hard work that goes along with this. If everyone could vote, please, if everyone could vote. One more problem. I hit it. I hit it. I know. It's this technology today. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's right. been voted and motion has approved. Thank you very much. Um, we will now uh, move into closed session and we will have our APCD at 1 30. Thank you very much, everyone. Appreciate it. Our closed session. Well, in one second, get the computer working. There's nothing to report out of closed session. And we will be moving on to our three o'clock. Running a little bit late. Apologize. Always good information, though. So, Mr. Pratt. <laughs> Welcome. We're here to uh, receive your presentation on the Public Works Agency, State of the Agency. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning. <laughs> oh, I apologize. I am going to not pass this to you. <laughs> Supervisor Zaragoza, uh, let, yeah, me, let me have you introduce this. I, um, you know, I, uh, this is a received and filed uh, presentation on the State of Agency from the County of Ventura Public Works. And uh, board members and chair members, I, uh, I'm really happy <clears> to, uh, to share this today. And as you know, for many, many years, I worked in the city of Oxford in, in public works. And I, I, public works is one of my favorite agencies. Of course, I love all the other county agencies, but we, I think it's important that, uh, that we hear what public works has done for, for the county because for many, many times I go to meetings and so forth, and people always ask me, well, what does the county do? You know, what do they, what do, they do you know, compared to the city, compared to the state, and compared to the feds? But uh, one of the things that I'd like to share that we always believe that, and I really believe this too, that firefighters are the first responders and also the sheriff. But really in reality, to be a first responders, I think public works plays a big role in, uh, in, in any, any disaster that happens, whether it's a fire, whether it's a, whether it's a flood, with some dangers or whatever. They're there with their skip loaders, with their, with their bulldozers clearing the roads and making sure that our fire trucks and our and our sheriffs can get by. So I, one of the things that, uh, that uh, Mr. Pratt has done, he has an, an annual meeting that he calls the State of the Agency session. And each year they make presentations uh, that are developed based on the agency's annual communication theme, which is planned and prepared by the Public Works Administration, and then is presented to the co-workers. Because he has so many uh, divisions that they might have a, a a public director that works out in the streets or, or whatever doesn't know what the engineering department is doing and so forth. And by having this annual meeting, you know, he uh, then brings everybody together and also gives awards. So, so this past year on 2019, the theme was lean forward, lean excellence, leading excellence, public works, and leading the way. So I just said a couple more words and I'll let you share this. I don't want to take your thunder away from me. But one of the things that, uh, that, uh, that he summarized, uh, Mr. Pratt did, was uh, the uh, Six Sigma, which is a program we have on how to make agencies more uh, productive and so forth. The technology and innovation that they have and, and also numerous large uh, projects. And each of the uh, five public works departments show, uh, showcase their work and, and also work with uh, 
with the team to make sure that all the team players are working together. So uh, I've had the honor of going out there for the several years to see what they do. And, and I think that you'll be impressed of what Public Works does and how they work to help the entire county, whether it's a disaster, whether it's a road, whether you collect trash, whether you believe me, if you flush a toilet, make sure it goes down, make sure you turn over the faucet and, and the water comes out. And if you don't have that, the first thing that people are gonna do is call up, hey, where's my water? How come the toilet isn't flush? What happened to the road? And if it's raining and it's flooding, what are you gonna do about it? And so forth. So I've had the pleasure of being there too. And, and, and of course our CEO has been there also. We've had other council members or other policymakers or council members from other cities that have been there and are really impressed. So Mr. Pratt, it's up to you. Thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Long, board members, Mr. Powers. For the record, my name is Jeff Pratt. I'm with Public Works. Um, today we're here because Supervisor Zaragoza asked us to come and present our state of the agency. You might ask what the state of the agency is. Well, it's part of our strategic plan and uh, it's, it's a big part of the communication plan buried in our strategic plan, which we- Mr. Pratt, do you have a cold? I do, I'm sorry, can you hear me all right? I wonder, yeah. yeah. Uh, how's this maybe better? you might want to have somebody to help you out to one of the- Oh, sorry about that. No. Um, so um, it's a big part of our strategic plan, uh, the public works strategic plan, which ties to the county strategic plan. And it's a very important annual event that pulls all the public works employees together. Um, and um, uh, we work on our communication skills. You know, at, at the root of all this is communication. Um, this year it was attended by Supervisor Zaragoza, who is a regular attendee. Mike Powers, our CEO, shows up every year for these. We have to split it into three different sessions because we can't fit everybody in one room and get this done. And we mix it up quite a bit. Brian Miller from Supervisor Long's office was there. And uh, a lot of the CEO staff from HR and risk management are there um, cheering us on. We also had a city council person from Oxnard, uh, Burt Perella, this year, who attended and seemed to uh, be impressed by the work that we were doing. Um, what we try to do with our strategy, I mean, a strat plan from an employee perspective is a fairly um, nebulous uh, document. And somehow we have to tie that to everyday activities. And we do that through a variety of communication techniques, um, this one included. One of those techniques is to um, ask our staff to prepare the presentation. This isn't something driven by management. It's a very organic thing. And by organic, I mean it starts at the staff level. They took the theme this year, uh, lean forward, leading excellence. That was their guardrails. And then they put the rest of this together in fact, I didn't get to see it until the day before the president, we were out due because I'm the MC for it and I have to make a few remarks. So they finally let me see it. Um, that's how much trust I have in these folks. You know, they, they get it right and they, they talk to each other and they know. Now this didn't happen overnight. We've been doing this for a number of years and it's been a real evolution, but I think you'll be impressed by um, where we're at today. And it's not a destination, of course, it's a journey. I'd like to recognize the folks that have participated. Can you guys stand up? There, there are too many to name, but these are the folks that prepared this presentation and, and put it on, put the show on. I just want to give you guys a big round of applause. Thank you. Uh, Sir. Uh, you, uh, you sound like you're really hurting there. Do you have somebody who probably can, uh, can help you out with your presentation because I know you're losing. I'm good. I can you're good. Are you okay? Yeah. Okay. I was in the Navy. Because I see a lot of <laughs> a lot of your good people. There's a lot of people that can that can also make their presentation, but I, I just don't want you to. I, I appreciate that. I was even thinking that we could postpone this again just yeah. to. Yeah. Or, or you can. Acoustic is good, and we have uh, we have well, yeah. Dave <laughs> Flesh, and we have. I'm afraid if you use Gerard, it'll go longer than it's planned. <laughs> <laughs> it'll be okay. good though. But, <laughs> I, I just you know I just want you to be okay then. No, okay. I'm fine. Okay, All good. Right. Thank you. I, these guys are going to catch me if I pass out. <laughs> All right. But really, it's staff presenting to staff. There's a real element of trust in that and camaraderie. And we're really proud that it's happened that way. Um, oh, by the way, we divided it up, or they divided it up, I shouldn't say, into three separate areas this, this year. Um, excuse me. Um, process improvement. That's our Lean Six program. 
the technology program, and then the signature projects. There are a few other odds and ends, but there won't be time to cover all of that today. Under, the process improvement, a big effort this year is trying to make sure that we're embedding the process improvement culturally. And one way we do that is by um, our accept meter. And that's just the name we gave it, but it's a measurement of acceptance of the Lane 6 principles in a public works department. Each one of those colors represents a, a unique set of um, discrete efforts we made to jump the bar up each year. And I'll be talking about what our next year consists of, where we try to take it from our current 60% to an 80% level. Um, but this, this wasn't a slide I presented. This is something that came from staff. They knew this. Just a quick reminder, we've had about $9 million of savings. I know we're past that now. The majority of those are um, hard savings. That is real dollars that reallocated to other things. And um, well, I have a tissue, sir. <laughs> This is going to be miserable for everybody. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about we're, that. We're going to cut you on your time. <laughs> it's a, but in any case, um, we continue to... Uh oh what did I do, Tony? Escape, yep. <laughs> we continue to make progress in Lean 6, and we've got another big jump we need to make this year. And to do that, um, we are going uh, through a set of discrete... Uh, Techniques. Oh, it keeps doing it, baby. Oh, my God. Jeff, we just understand and have compassion for what you're going through right now. Jeff. So at oh. any time you want to call it, we, we're good. Yeah. I'm not but we're not going to. We, we, I'm just letting you know. Well, I can put you guys back on schedule if you let me come back we, another yeah, time. Yeah, no, I just, I mean, I just... Madam I Chair, have such great sympathy for you. Ma Madam Chair, what, what, you know, we can, we can reschedule because I am... All right. I, I know you're you're ill, I, and, and I just say so you know. Is that okay? Like you're struggling, and I feel really bad. <laughs> I apologize. Well, uh, that's okay. No, no, you're ill, and it's that's okay. You're amazing, but I, we next can slide. Schedule. Well, or do you want him to continue? No, no. I I just want people to know that what a great presentation this yeah. is. Well, we want to give it its due too. I mean, yeah. Jeff your entire staff i've sat through it and it gets better every year and i didn't think it could it's excellent and we want to respect it and respect your staff and you because yeah. we want all departments to, to integrate lean six like you're doing thank you sir right. and, and it's really to give your presentation the full value that it can be i just yeah. feel really bad that you're struggling so hard because of the cold and i know you guys have called me out on it many times for being <laughs> sick <laughs> hey jeff yeah, the, cold, it's the runny nose it's getting me i can't, I can't yeah. get slides in the nose or I know. <laughs> so, jeff, yeah. you, I took day cold, you know, hey jeff as you were speaking the people your people behind you were kind of holding their hands like this <laughs> no but thank you guys to everyone in the room <laughs> Thank you. You're amazing, Jeff. <laughs> Thank you. See you next time. <laughs> Thank please, you. Please go home and get. You better, better. go home. <laughs> You're a fighter, I know. <laughs> so, so, Madam Chair, do we have to just reschedule it? Yes, we will just reschedule that for another meeting. Another meeting, okay. Where he's healthy. I just appreciate all of staff being here and Absolutely. supporting him. Um, I just don't, I think we all are in our agreeance that agree to. we I can have that. Thank better. you for, yeah. Yeah, no. Poor guy. <laughs> all right, well, uh, we're going to take just a couple minutes. Um, we have our 3.30 coming up. And it looks like we have a, quite a few speakers, over 33 speakers. So um, as we wait for our 3.30, uh, it, we'll be giving the speakers a minute and a half, so 90 second, 90, yeah, minute and a half to speak. So just so you're prepared, um, and we'll start that in just a moment.
All right, we'll be starting just momentarily. Waiting for one more supervisor. <coughs> <coughs> I know, just call me Jeff. There we go. All right, ready? Lead thank us you, uh, Chair. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, I'd like to uh, give a brief overview of what we've put together at the direction of the board, and then there'll be other process and time to speak, uh, of course. But I just want to sort of set the table <clears throat> for what we did. So, uh, and I have a few slides or, uh, later, just a couple, and I think. Uh, the Ag Commissioner may have a, a PowerPoint later. But um, on December 10th, 2019, uh, the board passed two motions regarding hemp. So the first motion, and th that's not up here. What, what you're seeing, those of you trying to read it, is the draft ordinance that we put together for consideration today. Um, but the, uh, and I'm reading from the minutes of the December 10th, uh, 2019 meeting. So first motion, bring to the Board of Supervisors at its first meeting in January 2020, that's today, a proposed urgency ordinance, and that's what's on the screen is a proposed urgency ordinance, prohibiting outdoor planting of industrial hemp with a buffer of one half mile from sensitive receptors in cities specifically residential zoning. So the direction was to bring back a proposed urgency ordinance that would have a half mile buffer within which outdoor planning would be prohibited. Buffer from sensitive receptors in cities, specifically residential zoning. So when we read specifically, it didn't say including in residential zoning, it said specifically residential zoning. So we took that to mean residential zoning in the cities. Um, so this proposed ordinance then would not be a half mile buffer from the city limits. It would be a half a mile buffer from any property zone residential within the city. And school classrooms. And around schools. So we took that to mean schools. Uh, we, we, uh, Actually, and there's an issue in here in how schools are described. But in this draft, it says uh, the half mile ban will uh, run from schools as depicted in, a, in an attached map. So we had contemplated there would be a map that showed school sites. And then it'd be easy, you'd see the school sites and you'd put your uh, circumference in there and draw a half mile circle. But we don't have that map. So uh, later we're gonna suggest the change in the wording and I, I, I could tell you the little, the change is just describe schools instead of referring to a map. So we, we would suggest adding a, a clause to this that would define schools as public schools, K through 12, within the city or within the county. So that's how we would define schools. Now then it would say also, these, these are from the minutes, and existing communities in the unincorporated area. So to deal with that, we, we, on the ordinance that's up there, we define, in, in that subdivision C, we defined existing residential communities, which was the direction from the minutes. We define it to mean any area designated on a general plan map. So the county has a general plan land use document, and it has a map, and it has designated territory as including urban, existing community or existing community hyphen urban reserve. So anything that is on a general plan map within those designations 
Also, they would be included and a half mile buffer would be around those locations. So those, that, those, that was the motion and that was the direction to the county to bring this back, first meeting in January. Now there was a second motion at the December 10th meeting and I emphasize in the board letter, if any of you have read it, this item on today does not relate to the second motion. This item relates to the first motion which is to come back with a half a mile urgency ordinance, half mile buffer around city residential zones, schools, and existing communities in unincorporated area. The second motion was directing staff to return to the board in January 2020. Notice it didn't say first meeting in January 2020. Now there's only one other meeting, but um, so return to the board in January 2020 with recommendations for a proposed ordinance, and it doesn't say urgency ordinance. So staff is working on maybe coming back, if we can make it in time, an ordinance that's indefinite or long-term, not an urgency ordinance. But the second motion, which this doesn't relate to, says come back to the board uh, with a proposed ordinance establishing schedules or windows for planting industrial hemp in the unincorporated area and exempting from regulation industrial hemp cultivation in greenhouses with adequate odor filtration system and nurseries where industrial hemp is grown solely for the purposes of producing propagative material. That would be seedlings and pots, for example. That's the second motion. That's not addressed in our proposed ordinance. So I just want to set the table as to what you're seeing here. Now, uh, Here's what we put together. Now if we can, it's about a four page ordinance and most of it deals with uh, legal process, findings of fact, <clears throat> direction to the future. Um, and, and it is drafted as a sort of a combination ordinance. It's both a land use ordinance and what I would call a police power ordinance. Um, a land use ordinance uh, normally requires two hearings, one at the Planning Commission, if you're going to amend the zoning ordinance, for example. There would be two hearings, one at the Planning Commission and then later at the Board of Supervisors, and there's a pretty prolonged uh, formal process and published notice uh, in the newspaper, etc. So it takes a while to process an actual zoning change. <clears throat> and arguably, this is a land use zoning ordinance, I, I won't say 100% that it is, but I think any ordinance that's going to discriminate uh, the ability to engage in a certain activity based on the location on a piece of land, there's a good argument that's a land use ordinance. I give the example that if we were to just ban hemp everywhere in the county, pretty good argument that's not a land use ordinance because that's just regulating uh, activity. It's not really tied to uh, a zone of land, but in any case, uh, in order not to have to have a long process with those two hearings, uh, the law does allow for an urgency ordinance in a land use matter, uh, and that's cited in this ordinance, that authority. And, it, and that, uh, if, so we're following that process, and that, that allows the initial adoption of a 45-day moratorium on new entitlements, but also on, on uses. And, um, so entitlements isn't so much the issue here, but the use of the land to plant hemp. This is drafted to uh, be a 45-day moratorium on the uh, outdoor planting of hemp in these areas that will be described. Now, it's also uh, adopted as a police power ordinance uh, without regard to land use rules, but it's stated that it, that's going to be limited in duration also to 45 days. So it's synced up 45 days. It's both a land use ordinance and a police power ordinance in the way it's structured. It makes the findings under both sets of laws, both the land, uh, land use and, or, or uh, police power, there must be some findings that there is a threat of a harm to public health, safety, or welfare. And there has to be evidence to support that. We, we point out in the board letter, uh, we think there's lots of evidence you can consider the prior hearings that we've had and we made sites to the um, uh, internet addresses where you can go watch you know, on the video of the prior sites. There's been lots of testimony about 
the public, you know, the harm, the impact on public health, safety, and welfare. I make the point too, the conjunctive in there is or. You only have to find, your board only has to find one of those things, that there's a threat of harm to welfare or safety or health. You don't have to find all of them. It's up to you to weigh the facts and see if there's a factual justification. But you know, I submit it's, it's, it's pretty clear that there is a factual justification to make that finding. But the ordinance is, uh, lays that out. Now, the, the real uh, meat of the ordinance is, is section one, which describes what what we wrote up as the temporary moratorium or prohibition and um, Lori, so maybe if we can go to the, just highlight, it's, it's the same document, but I thought it'd be easier to read if we just had section one. Can I, I don't know if it would be larger, larger text or, anyway, this is section one. So, the, the key is the uh, subpart A, which says for the duration of the ordinance, which I described as 45 days. Um, the outdoor planting of industrial hemp shall be prohibited in any part of the unincorporated area of the County of Ventura that is within one half mile of, so small i, is any land within a city zone for residential use. And then part two, any existing residential com community in the unincorporated area of Ventura County, or three, any school depicted on the map attached here to and made a part thereof. And no person or entity shall engage in or cause the outdoor planting of any industrial hip in those parts of the unincorporated area of the county. So that's just as I described to you uh, what our intent was. Uh, that's what we wrote. Then we needed to define some of these terms. So we said, uh, what is outdoor planting? So we, in, and we consulted with others in the county to uh, find out what would be a rational definition of these things. We said for the purposes of this ordinance, outdoor planning means any planning other than planning within a fully enclosed structure. So that, that's, I would refer to as indoor planting. Now it says a little more, which may, you know, the, the, the details may matter in some cases, such as a greenhouse with all windows, vents, or other openings covered or closed. But the idea is outdoor planning is uh, prohibited, indoor planning generally allowed. And recall, this is only for 45 days. Uh, Subpart so C then was trying to define what is an existing residential community. And for that, we used the reference uh, to the general plan maps. So it says it means any area designated as urban, existing community, or existing community urban reserve on the general plan land use maps. And I, I'll show you the, just the map in a second, and that's the only other document that I have is the general plan map. But what we do propose to the board, just as we're getting into hearing it, because we don't have a good map of, that depicts all the schools in the county that's referred to up there in uh, subdivision A, part three, um, in order to make this work today, I would suggest that we strike out the language uh, depicted on the map attached here to and made part of and just say any school. And then we'll add a subdivision D and we'll define school. And our suggestion is school be defined, be defined as a public school, K through 12, in the unincorporated area or in a city. No pre-K? That's up to you. Okay. That's, I, I, the minute said any school classroom. I don't know exactly what that means. I'm just asking. No, I don't. I don't. Mm -hmm. But it's all up for debate, you know, so. Uh, uh, it's simple. We tried to draft it simply, and that's a good, very good example. It's it's a matter of interpretation, and you're in the board. Ultimately, the board's discretion, and the community's input. How would you define school in this? Uh, and you could change it around all together. You know, you could say we want to include parks, or we didn't include other things that you might want to include. 
but we drafted it very simply. I would have left it alone, except we don't have a good map for public schools. Now, uh, so process-wise, uh, this would require a four-fifths vote because it's an urgency ordinance, and it will expire at the end of 45 days unless it's extended, and it would require staff actually must report back to the board at least 10 days before the 45 days expire. So we would have to report back, find a board, a board meeting within that time frame, at least you know, 10 days before 45 days, to report back about the any, any uh, additional facts or uh, approaches that we would recommend. And the board would have the uh, right to opportunity to extend the ordinance uh, 10 months, 15 days, which if you add it to 45 would be one year. But if you adopt it today, it'd be in place for 45 days, then it, you'd have an option to extend it uh, an additional two so, so Madam Chair, uh, yes. Leroy, so we have to hear it 10 days before the 45 to? You have to have a report, staff must report back to you. So uh, the, about the, 30, the 35th day. Yeah, and logically at that time is when staff asks you to extend it because okay. you don't want to then, you know, you have two meetings before back, the, back. Right. Before it expires so we can. Before it expires. Okay. And okay. I believe the 45 days is February 28th. I haven't calculated that. Yeah. No? Hmm. Okay. Lori yeah. says yes. Yeah. In any case. I think it's important for us to understand yeah. that. Because we also hopefully will hear, well, I know we'll hear from the Ag Commissioner and, um, you know, when permits are taking place and so forth, it's, yeah, it's we need to backdate it and see what, what the processes are, so. Yeah, I, I, I would, exactly, uh, no, there's a lot to consider. Yeah. Um, now, the, the final uh, slide or document that I have, if, if they can, it's just the uh, general plan map and it, it will show you these existing communities. I know it's hard to see, but the, uh, the existing communities are sort of the pink or the hatched pink or the white. Can I, um, um, Madam Chair? Yes. You, you said public schools. How about private schools? That's for you to debate later. Oh, okay. You know, our, our suggestion is, is our proposal is public schools. Public schools people. now, but we can discuss it. Right. Okay. You know what? You know, that's, that's, a, that's a college. That's now. Yes. Uh, uh, um, it it turns would, out uh, Channel Islands is also an existing community. Okay. So and let's. Part let's, of it is. The Glen oh, community. That's what I was told. Anyway. The, the Channel uh, Line, Madam Chair, the Channel Line just has the Glen the community. Glen community. Uh, the community yes. Glen is designated as an existing I, I community. I would just request that we include colleges right. and universities because then right. we, we also have more Park College. We have Cal State Channel Islands. Oxford College. Oxford College. That's something yeah. that would be up to us. Okay. Oh, absolutely up to you. Yeah. Okay. And it's good for the community to hear your, you know, hear and, this. And, and private schools because we have, you know. Private school, preschool, yeah. bartending school, college. <laughs> You know, whatever, know what the bar whatever, whatever you, whatever you choose. All right, Leroy, okay, if you so. could um, walk us through your map. Is there anything oh, else you want to? No, this, this is it. It's just really hard to see, but, but the, 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 uh, you, you know, the uh, index uh, shows as the pink, the hatched pink, or the white. Now the cities, I think, in this are all showing up in white. But there may be areas. There may be areas outside city boundaries that are are designated urban on the general plan map. But the way this would tie into our draft ordinance is that everything within a half a mile of the pink areas or the white areas would would be in the ba band area. Mm -hmm. Now I think uh, Mr. Williams uh, ha has a map which uh, attempts to 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 apply this, and uh, yeah. it may show you what the result is. And also, I described it as a Venn diagram in a way, because you may come within a half a mile of, of, of multiple trigger points. So you may be in half with a half a mile of two cities and a school, for example. Okay. Uh, but anyway. So you're stating that this urgency ordinance would take a four-fifth vote. It does there, take a four-fifth vote. There is things to be modified based on our discussion um, as to school. The You're, definition and so forth. We can, you could change, that we can change modify. the lang language of the ordinance and then have the vote. I'm not, I'm not suggesting what we drafted is something that you want to actually even vote on. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So so whoever brings the motion, it will be on the ordinance as you've shaped. Or you may choose not to vote at all. 
Okay. So it's up to up to the board. I just wanted to make sure oh. we were all clear on. Oh, that. it's good to explain that to That's everyone. That's very important for us. No, we just made our effort to present. To <coughs> you thought the direction was you can change your mind, or or we may have misinterpreted what you wanted. Uh, it's up to the board. Mm -hmm. So that's really all I have uh, to present. And I know that um, we're the Agriculture Commissioner can give a, uh, to answer some questions for us also. Yes. And uh, looking at some wording to make sure that greenhouses are, make sure that they are odor free if we're going to allow hemp to be grown in them uh, to, to the extent that they can. So, Mr. Williams, if you could, our wonderful Ag Commissioner, come on down. And um, while he's coming, a question for Leroy. There is going to be coming back to us the next phase two, and we're going to be looking at the ordinance that will be a long-term ordinance. And that will include mitigation measures. And I'm wondering if those mitigation measures can include lighting. Is that something that we've already directed you to incorporate? No, you, you have not. Can we give you that direction? Oh, absolutely. But, you know, I think I, you would think of it as general direction to staff. And keep in mind, and then the net, the board will have to give some, um, make some decision to, to authorize staff to take this to the planning commission. So, mm -hmm. okay. yeah, you can't just adopt it. You'll give staff to go make it happen, basically. Uh, so today we can just give you direction about what to put in that ordinance that will go to the planning commission. Um, that really isn't on the agenda yeah. today. Hmm. Okay. Okay. It? Today's the urgency so just the, only. Just that general direction that it include lighting. Right. Obviously, you're going to deal with the odor. In the 45 days, yeah. yeah. Well, if we can make our marching orders, it will be on next Tuesday with some proposal. It said uh, bring it back in January with, uh, but I, sh sure, you know, sh the, the staff will hear what the board says, and I'm sure it will influence everyone. Yeah, I think that was part of the original direction back in the last time the board met as the mitigation measures that we want to look at is included lighting. I don't okay, thank you. Hello, Mr. Williams. Thank you very much for being here today. Um, we have a lot to comment about this, I believe. So I pass this along to you. Thank you and congratulations, Chairwoman Long, for your uh, appointment. Thank you. Um, uh, board members, it's uh, thank you for the opportunity to address you today. Uh, Mr. Powers, uh, I, I have um, a, a several different slides, and depending on what you would like me to cover today, I'd be happy to go over them. Um, the first set of slides that I have is kind of a scope on the production of uh, hemp in Ventura County uh, that I can go over briefly. Um, the second set of slides that I have is a discussion of the board directions and the urgency ordinance. The third set is a discussion of additional mitigation measures for consideration, which may be included in a, a indefinite ordinance. And then the fourth uh, set of slides that I have are some maps that are depicting uh, potential setback, what a, a potential setback would include. And these do actually include schools, um, but it wasn't uh, clear exactly what schools uh, were desired to be included. So uh, you may want to uh, provide some additional directions uh, for in re regard to that. So, Madam Chair, you were just thinking public schools at the time? Yeah, it just includes public schools, uh, K through That's what you were thinking. Yeah, but I think it's important. Anyway, we'll, we'll discuss that. Okay. We'll, private. we'll clarify it for yeah. you. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. So with that, I think I have a slight advance uh, here. Um, so for California, there were a total, this is statewide uh, numbers, 640 registrants in 2019. Uh, 1,324 uh, locations where hemp was produced in the state, uh, 39,500 acres. The top five counties for acreage were Kern, Riverside, Fresno, Ventura was fourth uh, with 3,563 that were actually planted. And then Imperial County comes in at fifth uh, there, as you see. Um, 
this is some general statistic. It's about agriculture in Ventura County. Um, irrigated farmland, we have 91,350 acres countywide. Of that, 50, 57,500 acres are permanent crops, tree crops, uh, orchards, um, and, and do not rotate. Um, and then there's 33,850 acres that is rotational farmland. So that rotational farmland would be the farmland that would be available for planting hemp. So uh, to date, and this has been updated since our last meeting, uh, we've had 53 registrants in Ventura County, a total of 134 sites. Some of those sites are uh, for biomass or oil production, and some of those sites are for propagative material uh, and seed for future planting. Um, in, and, and again, the total acreage, uh, actually the total acreage registered has been raised to 3,798 acres uh, at, at this time. Um, so, the, so that's the total registered acres um, for right now. So this map shows you where in the county last year the uh, crops were planted. This is the results of the crop um, that was planted. Um, we tested, uh, we sampled and tested a total of 99 sites that were being produced for biomass or oil. Of those 99, 96, uh, met the requirements for uh, industrial hemp at 0.3% THC level, which is the intoxic intoxicant that marijuana has. Um, so these are clearly um, less than, you know, meeting the, the industrial hemp requirements. There were 94 uh, sites that were actually harvested. Uh, two of the sites didn't meet their 30-day window requirement and didn't have additional testing done to allow them to uh, continue the, the harvesting process. So we had three sites that failed due to high THC levels that were above 0.3. None of these sites were above 0.6% THC. Marijuana normally is between 5 and 25% uh, THC level, so you can clearly see that None of the sites that were grown here in Ventura County, or at least registered and grown here in Ventura County, uh, were marijuana uh, crops. Um, and we ended up destroying 121 acres of industrial hemp uh, this year, about 3% of the uh, crops planted. This would be the impact of the setbacks that are proposed the half mile. Um, so we have, of the 33,850 uh, rotational crop acreage, 11,000, a little bit over 11,000, uh, is within that half mile uh, setback area. And um, of the 3,798 acres, 1,216 acres is within that half mile setback that's been proposed. So this is a map of the irrigated, the total irrigated farmland in Ventura County, uh, including both permanent and rotational crops. And this is a map of the rotational crops in the county, uh, along with the sites that have been identified as sensitive uh, sites as in the county as well, residential. All right. So most of this, uh, these next slides, uh, Mr. Smith has already covered. And so I just want to briefly kind of go over some of this. Um, so in your December meeting, you asked us to, um, you asked the, the county council to uh, develop a proposed urgency ordinance prohibiting outdoor planting of industrial hemp within a buffer of one half mile from sensitive receptors in the cities. Uh, including residential zoning and school classrooms and around schools and existing communities in the unincorporated areas. Uh, in addition, return to the board in January with recommendations 
for a proposed ordinance establishing schedules or windows for the planting of industrial hemp in the unincorporated areas and exempting from regulation industrial hemp cultivation in greenhouses with adequate odor filtration systems and nurseries where industrial hemp is grown solely for the purpose of producing propagative materials. Now that was the language of your December 10th um, uh, motion. Hmm. So this is what County Council has developed. Um, some have suggested including city or county parks as well as the schools and the uh, residential areas uh, in both the county and the cities. Um, and so we can look at that as well uh, should you choose to ask us to go that direction. And again, uh, Mr. Uh, county Council Leroy Smith has also shared the uh, proposed definite or uh, language for outdoor planting prohibition. Um, there's a potential suggested revision based on the language on both the um, the first part of the the board's directions to us and the second part, uh, which we would add within a fully enclosed structure with odor mitigation measures that are approved by the agricultural commissioner, such as a greenhouse, or propagative plants in containers that are not flowering. Uh, and then there's a definition of what propagative plants means, okay? I, I would just like to say I appreciate that because just calling them a greenhouse and saying if it's in a greenhouse it's okay isn't sufficient. So I, I appreciate that you've clarified it in this uh, suggested wording so that it would have to be go through you, your department to make sure that it is controlled, the odor is controlled. Yes, sir. And, and, and Madam Chair, and how would you control um, a plant from flowering? Um, well, they would have to be moved out of the um, out of the Agreed. half a mile setback area before the formation of buds, uh, which is part of the flowering process. So, as the plant is grown, there's a vegetative process or that starts first that grows the leaves and and the structure of the plant. Mm. And then as it matures, it starts to flower when it be, uh, gets ready to set seeds. So, Ed, if you had an example, 10 greenhouses, and, and what do you have an inspector go out and make sure that they're not flowering, or how, how do you control that? How are we well, going to control it? Uh, two, two different things. There are the greenhouses uh, with odor, odor control. Uh, Scrubbers. Yeah. Uh, there's two different kinds of, of odor control measures that are being used uh, mm -hmm. in, in, this, in, um, in this type of, of production. One is, um, I believe it's ionized water mm. that, is, uh, that is forced into the air that then combines with the terpenes, the gases that are given off by the plants, which then um, uh, uh, neutralizes it the it, yeah. in that way. And then the other type of filtration or, or system that's in place in primarily uh, systems where they're producing seed is um, carbon uh, charcoal filtration systems, actual uh, air pumps that- and, and that controls the odors. Through actual filters that trap both the, the odors and they'll trap the pollen, keep the pollen from, from escaping and, and pollinating plants that aren't aren't wanted. So two different types of systems that are being used. So I, I do appreciate the creativity in regards to your suggestion of um, propagating plants and that they, they'd they have to be moved outside that half mile buffer once they are about to flower. Yes. So that's where we're understanding the urgency ordinance of the smell and the um, medical reasonings for for people complaining so much about the hemp so that's what what you're suggesting is that they could have the hemp plants there until before it f flowers and then you would have to have them removed that that's my yeah that's my understanding of what this unless they're in do. a greenhouse yep. i just want to kind of get everyone's head around that because yep. that that's an important factor on this 
but, so, but, thank you. But, Ed, but just for my, how long does it take to flower number one and who's gonna make sure that it's flowering or not flowering? Are you with me? Um, there's there's uh, kind of two or three different types, different, different types of cultivars. Uh, one of them is kind of a, 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 I believe it's called a short day variety, oh. and that short day variety depends on the, the day length. Um, as the day length uh, decreases in the summertime, that triggers the flowering, and those plants generally take about two months to two and a half months of, of vegetative growth before they start flowering. So we're going to keep and track of uh, who started at what, time, at yeah. what date and so forth? And, right. Okay. And then the, there's a, a different variety that doesn't depend on the day length that mm -hmm. can actually flower, can actually grow and flower within about a month or a month. And but a you'll half. have an inspector, say a, um, greenhouse number one. Yes. You're going to know that it takes X days for it to flower and somebody's going to make sure that it's not flowering. I, I would envision that as being our responsibility okay, okay. in my department to, to ensure. And the uh, ionized water or the charcoal filter, do you find them both to be effective? I'm sorry? Both the odor control methods you described, ionized water and the carbon filter, you find both of those to be effective? Um, there's varying, um, um, I, as, as far as I understand, they're effective and they're being utilized. Um, there's varying opinions on how effective they are. Uh, and so that's, that's, um, so, and the way it's, um, the wording right now is that those measures have to be approved by you. Yes. Yeah. And so you would ensure that they are effective. We would, yes, we would to our, to the best of our ability. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And if they're not effective? If they're not effective, um, then we would need to correct, we would make uh, corrections as to being, allowing people to use that system. Okay. So that, that's something we want to make sure that occurs. So um, if it's not effective, it can't continue, yes. right? Yeah. There's been some complaints in some of the areas where these, uh, these systems are, have been used. Um, so I don't want to lead you down a, a path that says there is no issue, period. Um, we, would, we would try to ensure um, that they were actually functional and that they actually worked. Okay. Okay. And so you, you could put together a process to ensure that they are uh, meeting your standards for the odor control. Yes. Thank you. Okay. And then the definition for the existing residential communities. This, um, these are only applying to these. This part of the definition only applies to the unincorporated area uh, within city uh, boundaries. We, as as uh, Mr. Smith has indicated, we would look at residential zoning as far as uh, what's included in the uh, in the uh, sensitive sites. Um, and then uh, our agricultural uh, uh, policy advisory committee um, has uh, reviewed this. We've, we've actually had, since our December 10th meeting with you, uh, we've had three focus groups that have uh, reviewed these kind of proposals. And we've taken input from all of those groups. And so I'm including in the next set of slides uh, some of those proposals um, that we've heard those recommendations from those different groups. The Ag, Ag Policy Advisory Committee um, has recommended um, in place of the urgency ordinance, um, they suggest that a county ordinance be adopted to tighten the harvest window to no longer than 30 days from the time test results for each individual hemp crop is determined and the proposed ordinance be in effect for no longer than one year. This would allow the industry time to develop their own mitigations and best practices without the need for an ordinance uh, with such far reaching consequences. Again, that's from your Ag Policy Advisory Committee. 
And there, and that suggestion is not including a buffer zone. And that suggestion is not including a buffer zone. Uh, correct. Thank you. That's that's correct. Okay. So um, through the working group or the focus group meetings, um, these are some of the additional uh, mitigation measures considered. Uh, require all crops to be harvested no later than a specific set date. Um, such as October 31st, um, so that based on the triggering of the, the short day length, the flowers would all come up, um, to maturity uh, at a certain point, and they would not be allowed to harvest after that particular date. Madam Chair, that's to the entire county? Um, no, this is, uh, yeah, this is within, I believe, one mile of the... Oh, okay. Uh, sensitive sites was the suggestion originally um, and so excuse me go back. Wide, um, if you choose to go if you choose to uh, require that then that's uh, and, and, and what were you proposing that could be put into place and what were you proposing now just within what instead of countywide or what do you well I think from the discussion that we had with the different groups that made this recommendation that they would do it within a one mile oh. um, uh, of the sensitive areas okay. can I ask another clarifying yeah so for within one mile they would only be able to um, plant by October 31st I thought there was some no, that was it wouldn't be planting, they would It'd be harvesting. Harvesting, right? harvesting. But they have to have it harvested and out of the field by October 31st. For that okay. period. Whatever date. So is. you're only harvesting one time a year? That would that would effectively require just a single harvest. Uh, that's a window you're talking One about. mile yes. area. Yes. And outside that one mile, you could harvest multiple times. Yes. Thank you for the clarification. And so that's the window you were talking about with the one mile they have to Yes. Do. Okay. Yes. <laughs> And then um, a setback restriction, uh, which would include the half a mile from the sensitive sites, uh, where, uh, which is what the urgency ordinance proposals <coughs> proposes at this time. And then uh, the other consideration is, is doing both, harvest restrictions within one mile with no outdoor planting within a half a mile. Um, so those are several different, uh, different suggestions. Additional uh, measures for consideration include uh, provision to allow the California Crop Improvement Association, the American Official Seed Certifying Agencies, and the Canadian Seed and Grain Association um, certified low odor seed cultivars, which do not exist at this time. Um, and uh, we're not sure what they are or would be based on, uh, to be honest with you. But if there was such a certification program uh, to, pro, uh, to allow those within a setback area as well. Um, also to exempt small producers with less than five acres within the setback zone. Uh, also to consider a provision to allow for a grower to obtain waivers or a reduction of the buffer zone with the express written consent of all neighboring property owners within a half a mile from the growing site. Uh, which would be a half a mile buffer uh, from, a di from other residential areas. Um, and then consent is only valid for the term of the registration, which is a one-year period uh, and would have to be renewed upon re-registration. An additional proposal is to reduce restrictions on building new greenhouses within the setback to allow for um, uh, easier production of, at greenhouses. Anyone in compliance with the ordinance should be shielded from nuisance complaints. So, okay. not, not from enforcement or abatement, but from nuisance complaints. Okay. Um, so that's, that's a provision that uh, has been put into other county ordinances. Okay. Could you give um, us an example? Uh, example of that? Uh, Sonoma County, for instance, has that provision that as long as the growers are complying with the provisions of the ordinance, um, then they're shielded from a nuisance complaint uh, on, on the production of hemp. 
that doesn't mean that the board doesn't have the authority to go back and change the ordinance or the, the, the requirements, but they wouldn't be sued uh, based on it uh, being considered a, a public nuisance. Right? So, so an example is you have one neighbor that will com complains, but all the other ones aren't. Is that protection for Potential. that one? Potential. Trying to get it, give me an, Again, more of an example. These are proposals that have, you know, that we've gathered. Okay. And so, um, that's fine. I think it's a reasonable, uh, you know, uh, provision, but that's going to be your choice as to whether you feel that way as well. Okay. Supervisor Parks, were you going to say something? If they're in compliance with the ordinance and they've met the, like if they're in a greenhouse, they're not having odor coming out or they're taking their plants away before they flower, uh, so they're in compliance with the ordinance, what kind of nuisance complaint would occur in those situations? Mm -hmm. I mean, um, somebody may just not agree with it being planted next door. Okay. Um, they, they could complain based on that. Um, okay. But not on odor because that should not have that. Well, hopefully the odor would be taken care of. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> um, if we can, I'll state this now because we'll have a lot of speakers here. If we can hold our comments to ourselves and let the person at the dais have the respect and we'll listen to them. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, keep going. Um, Additional measures that were raised during our focus uh, group sessions uh, were to limit the use of lights uh, in greenhouses at night uh, within the setback zone um, to, con oops, excuse me, uh, to conspicuously post regularly spaced signs along public roadways that specify this is not marijuana, industrial hemp, no trespassing. Uh, or something similar to that. And the Food and Ag Code already requires language um, signs to be posted on, on each property um, where hemp is being grown to identify it as industrial hemp. Um, but we could add additional requirements for what that language might state uh, in the county ordinance. Uh, also, a uh, suggestion to consider reducing taxes on all farm properties within the setback zone since they no longer have the option to produce uh, industrial hemp and so felt that the, the value of their land wasn't as great as it would have been uh, otherwise. Is that within the half mile? Um, within the setback. Could they plant other, uh, another of course. crop other than hemp? Okay. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, also, a uh, uh, proposal to reduce water charges for areas within the setback zone, uh, similar to the last proposal. And then the last uh, proposal is to require the same distance setback as required for the state schools program, the safe schools program, excuse me, for restricted pesticide notifications uh, to schools, which is one quarter of a mile rather than the half of a mile. Um, so these are all proposals that uh, were made during our discussions with different uh, groups and so these are, I'm bringing these forward to you to consider putting into the, the long-term uh, indefinite ordinance. And then this map actually depicts um, all of the uh, existing communities as depicted uh, as shown in the county general plan map it also includes all residential residentially zoned areas within cities uh, including mobile home parks as well um, and it also includes um, schools I don't know if you can see if this pointer does this actually work yeah it does uh, this for instance is a school um, that is right out in the middle of the Oxnard Plain. And so it's a grammar school that would be uh, buffered against the production of industrial hemp uh, within whatever setback zone you select. Um, okay. And is that uh, PV and Olds Road? Is that Pleasant Valley and Olds, Olds Road? I believe it's uh, <coughs> Laguna. It's um, Laguna School. Yeah, okay. Elementary School, yeah. Mm -hmm. Not Pleasant Valley. Yeah, not pleasant. It said, okay, Laguna's okay. Okay. Uh, 
Okay. Um, that is all the general. I, I do have some specific maps uh, with with uh, more, um, you know, city of Camarillo, Moore Park, some of those areas. If Can you show us those? If you'd like to see some of those as well. So this is Camarillo and what the half a mile um, setback zone would look like from the residential areas and schools. This is Moore Park. Um, unfortunately, I, this particular map, I'm sorry, does not show the actual hemp production sites that were, were grown this year, but the next one does. This is the Tierra Rajada Valley, and the purple, uh, the the purple uh, line depicts a half a mile, and this depicts a quarter of a mile. Uh, as the Safe Schools Act would do. Okay. Fillmore. Uh, this is the city of Fillmore with a half a mile setback. The Piru area. Uh, this is out on the Oxnard Plain. This is the city of Ventura. And that's all the maps that I have. Ed, Ed going back to the Camarillo um, map, I didn't, that's pretty close to Nyland Acres, isn't it? Between the uh, Oxnard and uh, uh, yeah, I believe the Nyland Acres would be that's that, that's covered too. Then cause yeah, that would also be covered. Okay, uh, for the most part. Let me see. And I think so there's, there's also Oxnard. a there's Oxnard. There okay, uh, okay. And so yeah, there's the Nyland Acres area. Okay. Where's Thousand Oaks? Mm -hmm. um, Thousand Oaks was on the. I didn't have a full map of Thousand Oaks, but um, page 19. It shows on the Moore Park area, and this area down here is all Thousand Oaks. And then where's Simi Valley? So, uh, I don't have any. We don't have any hemp registered in that area at all, and, and don't have any uh, that was grown this year. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, supervisors, do you have any further questions for Mr. Williams? Just, uh, looking at your list, uh, there are definitely some things to include in the longer term ordinance that we're going to be coming back with. Um, you know, if there are low odor seeds, those kind of things. Um, I appreciate also uh, lights that you mentioned. Um, but there, there's actually, and also the harvest window, but there's actually one that I think might be good to include for the urgency ordinance. And that's the one, if you have the permission of the property owners within the half mile, that it's OK. That, to me, sounds reasonable. So I'm just going to put that out there to the board. Let's say that again, too. Um, the idea that if you have the permission oh, okay. of all the property owners within a half mile, that it's OK to grow, then that should be, I think, sufficient. So everybody has to sign off on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The only question from legal counsel is that, is that yeah. acceptable because you're, there's, we would need to find It would out. just be an exemption. Um, no, I, uh, you know, I have not re seen this until today, this proposal. So I, I think there are legal questions with that. Okay. To allow neighbors to veto or not veto or use. So we'd have to. Okay, so that, that, that could be yeah, something we could look at for the, uh, the longer term ordinance. Um, if, I could, if I could address that, um, Sonoma County actually has that provision in their, in their ordinance that was just passed by their board uh, last week. I mean, it does make sense. I, I know um, in the city of Thousand Oaks, at, at one point, you could have chickens if all your neighbors say it's okay. No roosters, but you have to get the neighbors to sign mm -hmm. off. And that kind of idea that they understand that you have it and they're not, they don't have a problem with it. But if one says no, that, then you right. can't do it. So it makes a lot of sense, I think. So that, that's, if not to something we can put in today, uh, something that we could put in into the uh, longer term ordinance. I'd appreciate the suggestions. There's a few of them I, I would support uh, when we get to that. And, and also, uh, I, the uh, private schools, uh, K to 12, I think, should be included. 
private schools? Private schools, yeah, because there's, a, mm -hmm. there's quite a few private schools that are. But I would have to state you, we probably should be consistent with the state, and they have a peak uh, pre-K. Yeah. The preschools, state registered, state registered preschools. Mm -hmm. Yes, so similar to what your uh, children need. safe schools, preschools for pesticides yeah. would be. That would be the I'm same. Consistent. You want to be consistent, is what yes, I would suggest. They're all children, regardless of where they go to school. In. We should I understand be selecting things. Yeah. It should be consistent with other state regulations that we have. Mm -hmm. Okay. Make it uniform. State public preschools or private preschools. The, the, no, I think you have public schools already, but I wanted to add private schools. Right. The private Including private preschool? Yeah. Well, they're, they're children. Yeah. Well, I, I, yes. There is a, there, in, the, in the Safe Schools Act, exactly. uh, related to pesticides, there is a provision for um, private schools and, and uh, the preschools to yes. register. As long as they're registered with the state, then okay. it would be... Uh, they are included in the... Oh, okay. they're included? Okay, good. Mm -hmm. That's how we would clarify it, and it would be the same as what we currently are using, yeah, which sure. would make sense, I would think. Likewise, I agree. Okay. okay. Uh, except that we would do a half mile. What's that, ma'am? A half mile versus a We would do a half mile. With uh, yeah, so that's what's being proposed, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And then in your additional measures is also the, uh, the use of lights. And that's what you were talking about earlier? Yeah, that's for, that would be for the future one then, right. mm -hmm. because we can't do it with the urgency one. OK. All right. Um, is there any other further questions for Mr. Williams? We can always bring them up yep. later on. Um, we've heard from legal counsel. And I know we also have 57 speakers. Well, so, Thank you. so I have already suggested as of 2.30, we're going to do a minute and a half. Uh, they, oh, great. That's, That's what this process is all about, is to hear from our public. Um, so we are going to move to the public uh, comment section. If I can get my screen working. We're good. Sorry. Charlotte. Public hearing. <sighs> all right. So we have on our uh, first one is Charlotte. Uh, Perry Holt Grin, and then on deck will be Chris Williamson. So we will start at a minute and a half. Followed by Drew Tillman. <coughs> Where? Just oh, by, by Drew Tillman. So we'll set it up one through three. Thank you. Hi. Thank you, board. I appreciate having a voice. I am the owner of the Viking Ranch in Ventura. We are a 150-acre ranch that burned during the Thomas Fire. We have spent considerable time looking at what we can grow. Hemp was what we decided to do. We are very invested in that, uh, having received our ag uh, permit. And quite a bit of expense has gone into this. I was really glad to hear the ag commissioner address the fact that not everybody is in the same category of growing hemp. We do not intend to put the hemp in the ground. We are going to grow starts, and we are kind of bottled into this um, uh, ordinance, and we feel that uh, there needs to be more time for everyone to look at um, what each grower's intent is. We will not flower the plant but yet we are kind of locked into this ordinance. So we've been coming in fighting for that. And we're hoping that uh, it goes on a per case basis. So I appreciate your time and I appreciate the audience having their feelings, but not every case is the same. Thank you. And, and your plants will not are not going to be grown and flowered on your property? We are going to be um, doing that on the property. And unfortunately we are a little bit short of the half mile from a residential area, which is the um, Los Cabos area. But we will be having, we have purchased um, the houses, the wiring houses, but there will be no odor from what we're doing. We are gonna be just doing the starts, the little three inch starts. So it will never go to flower, but we're kind of locked into this. So we've been fighting for our rights to be able to grow. 
And so you're going to grow the three-inch starts. Are you going to grow them to uh, when they flower also? No, I think your clarification no. is that you're growing the them. The answer is no. Flower. Yeah, we're just okay. going to do the little starts. That's so that, yeah, yeah, they're going to be about actually. five inches long and, okay. and, uh, and a pat in packs. But uh, we will be doing it outside. Right. But right. there will be no there will be no odor. Okay, right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Next up is Chris Williamson and Drew Tillman. Good afternoon, supervisors. My name is Chris Williamson. My address is two four two Anacap Island Drive, Camarillo, which is in the University Glen neighborhood located behind Cal State University. I'm the chair of the Homeowners Advisory Council. We have six hundred homes out there and about two thousand people living on the state land. Um, there's 7,000 students on campus during the day, handing out a, my letter, and living on dorms and apartments right on Potrero Road, and the hemp is grown directly across the street under the power lines. Uh, and there's 700 staff during the day, and there's a daycare center. Um, last year, hemp was grown uh, very close to campus along Potrero and Lewis. In the afternoon, as the sea breeze came in, the hemp would blow into the neighborhood and stay there because we're surrounded by hills. Um, you could smell hemp inside your home into the evening and late at night. If you can't, couldn't open your windows, if it bothered you, it would almost get to, to me personally, it's almost to the point of nauseous. It reminded me of my college dorm days. <laughs> uh, the campus and the 600 homes uh, is not included in your proposed map because it's designated a state or federal facility in the general plan there. I'm asking that you designate it, include it in there, and suggest in the long-term ordinance you look at additional geographies such as the Census Bureau's urbanized areas or census-designated places, and within cities, uh, not some commercial zoning allows Thank housing. You. Thank yes. you for your testimony. Thank Madam Chair, yes. I thought that the uh, university is covered. Uh, isn't that cover the, the glens? Uh, or is, uh, the, the existing residential community on the map. It's so I'm not sure where that's at in relation to it's the right above the college. Uh, right above the library here there at, uh, at the university. We'll have to check in on that one. Yeah. I think we did. The Agricultural okay. Commission. Ready? Office, yes. Not. Okay. My name is Drew Tillman. Hello, supervisors. I want to address the uh, section one of the urgency ordinance. Section 1B refers to indoor planting in a structure with all the windows, vents, or other openings covered or closed. This method of odor control would eliminate ventilation needed to control humidity and prevent mold growth. It would also make the structure uninhabitable for workers who tend the crop. A minimum, a minimum quantity of fresh air is a building code requirement. Since this configuration is not possible, I don't know why it was included in the document. Plants could not be grown indoors or propagated in these conditions. Um, I'll skip the light mitigation issue because that's being addressed. Section 1C refers to designations on the Ventura County General Plan land use maps. In the January 8th meeting at the Ag Department, the Ag Department stated that Spanish Hills and Sterling Hills in Camarillo, along with Groves 1, 2, and 3 in Somas, are not considered residential communities. To me, that shows a bias that I hope you will remedy today. There's an inherent conflict of interest in this process. Uh, farmland and farmers will not be cherished and appreciated if their contribution to our neighborhood is a skunk odor, along with headaches, nausea, coughing, eye irritation, sore throats, allergic reactions, and other respiratory problems. The unintended consequences of hemp cultivation could be the end of Ventura County agriculture as we know it. Thank you. Thank you. Celine Burns, next up is Philip Moser and then Stefan Sanders. Thanks for having us speak. I want to thank Linda Parks for being attentive to our neighborhood's concerns. We're, uh, I also live on Groves Place. Um, we have uh, 30, about 30 lots in the Groves Place um, area that I live in, um, probably generating about a half a million dollars a year in tax revenue. We're very concerned about the lot at 3900, the foot of Groves Place. It's 3900 Groves Place. There's a growing operation that's using greenhouses that's just, you know, they've just purchased the lot. It's an LLC. Um, so we just feel that our property values are going to be greatly affected in that whole portion of Groves Place. 
as well as Drew had pointed out, that they're not considering our Groves Place area a residential neighborhood, and it is a residential neighborhood. You know, we're talking about the setbacks from schools and protecting children. When children come home from school, where do they go? To their house on Groves Place, you know, which is, we have a hemp growing operation right at the foot of Groves Place. I'm also concerned about turning Ventura County into a patchwork quilt with all of these you know, small regulations, a greenhouse is okay, you know, as long as you're set back from this lot, you're okay. It's, I don't know how they're going to have the manpower to monitor this Thank patchwork you. quilt that they're creating. Thank you for your testimony. Next up is Philip Moser, and then Stephen Sanders and Nana Matters. Thank you. My name is Philip Moser, and I'm a resident of Moore Park and live directly adjacent to a hemp field. It has a, had a massive negative impact on my life and my family's. This is not a minor issue. There's a wholesale revolt going on across the country from residents who have been suddenly and unwittingly subjected to the horrific odor and health impacts that comes from growing these plants. I find both these ordinances and Agriculture Williams uh, proposals woefully inadequate. We need clear setbacks and regulations without loopholes like greenhouses, waivers, or limited harvest dates. I read you to urge you to read about these proposals and their ineffectiveness. In a December New York Times article, a hemp grower in Carpinteria said they are now on their third uh, system to mitigate these smells. That means they have failed twice. Residents there have had to endure multiple growing seasons and had to repeatedly fight to not to be exposed to noxious odors put out by a private business. Thousands of Ventura County residents should not be the guinea pigs for 53 farmers' private economic gain. I find it hard to believe that the supervisors, if you lived across the street from these fields, that you wouldn't be taking immediate action to put a stop to this. I ask that you treat my friends and family with the same respect that I think you would treat your own. Cities around Ventura County have voted for bans and moratoriums. Thousand Oaks, Moore Park, Fillmore, Ojai, there's many others. And unincorporated county land should not be used as a loophole to circumvent the will of the people as we have expressed it. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next up is Sam, uh, Stephen Sanders. Again, keep your emotions to yourself, please. Uh, motion. I'll do my best. Thank you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the clapping is, we need to keep this moving. Okay. Uh, my name is Stephen Sanders. I'm a local real estate and uh, construction and land use attorney. I practice in Simi. I bought a house with my wife a couple years ago in Moore Park in the Serenata community. I did not expect the time uh, a year, year and a half later that we would be uh, up all night smelling uh, hemp odors and skunk um, or that, you know, I would get headaches and eyes watering when I'd walk my dogs. I know that many of my neighbors are suffering uh, right alongside me. Um, I would say, first of all, I represent cannabis industry uh, clients. Uh, I, you know, I and myself am a licensed contractor. I've been a construction lawyer for many years. I haven't seen any successful odor mitigation. I think the idea that we're going to be able to have greenhouses that are fully contained units makes no sense on the scale of growing that they're going to be contemplating. Um, and you know, as the other gentleman mentioned, you know, the worker safety hazards and all the things that go with that makes no sense at all. Um, it doesn't make sense to me that there's no standard other than what the agricultural commissioner's belief is, whether it's in compliance. There needs to be a legal standard applied to whatever the uh, enforcement mechanisms are. Um, I would also point out that this, this shouldn't be equated to the safe schools program and the occasional spraying of pesticides um, because this is a 24 hour a day constant uh, source Thank of uh, nuisance. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Nina Matter, Matra, and then Brenda Kusick. And the third one will be Bob Kusick. Thank you. Hey, thank you for allowing me to speak today. Uh, my name is Nina Matera, not Matera, <laughs> and I live in Moore Park. Uh, I've been there for 18 years, and I can tell you that if this was in Moore Park when I was looking to buy my home 18 years ago, I wouldn't be buying there. Um, I'm concerned not only about the odor, which was horrible, it caused headaches, infiltrated my uh, garage, as well as the house and my kids who live in the front room closest to the farms. 
I can also tell you that um, I can't walk around my community. I can't enjoy my backyard during the period which they're talking about harvesting is the period that we spend the most time outside in our pools and enjoy. So what I can ask you is that you don't just, as they stated, leave us as a guinea pig. It is a problem that needs to be studied greater than 45 days, needs to have no growth for 45 days, not a half mile. It was discussed a mile, now it's a half mile, not enough. Please hear us, find a win-win situation that an ordinance can be put in place that not just they get to grow and we get to try it out. That's not win-win. It is not. Please, if you live there, understand that that is not the situation that we want to put ourselves and our family in, daycares or anybody else, businesses. So I'm asking that you uh, um, consider that. The last thing to leave you is crime. Crime. Nothing was addressed about crime. Thank you for your testimony. Brenda Kusick, then Bob Kusick, then John Christ. Good afternoon, board. Thank you for giving us a chance to speak. Um, my family's been in Ventura County since before California was a state. Some of my relatives came with the Spanish land grant. I have lots of neighbors and friends and relatives who are ranchers, farmers. I myself sold avocados for a few years and delivered them to Bob Huber's mother every month. That said, and understanding that the farmers need to have use of their land and their crops, this is no longer the time of the Spanish land grant. Ventura is basically an urban area in many, many areas. And while we all enjoy the lemon groves and the avocado fields, those things that make Ventura County uh, more beautiful and a great place to live, the hemp crop is not working when it's near the cities. The smell is like 400 skunks got run over and then thrown into your backyard. It has literally made our neighborhood unusable. So the bottom line for me and for most of my neighbors in Moore Park is that hemp, at least for me, is not a problem, but it's the wrong crop to grow near cities, houses, and schools. It needs to be grown somewhere else. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Bob Kusick, then John Christ, and John Vagay. Okay. Thank you, board, for giving us a voice. I've been a homeowner in Moore Park for 18 years. I've been a resident of Thousand Oaks for 22 years. Um, and the, the odor and the smell is really overwhelming. Um, more than just that, I'm, I don't have a problem with hemp, and I'm absolutely pro-agriculture in Ventura County. It's one of the things that made this county what it is today. And I absolutely believe in landowner rights. They should be able to grow uh, crops that make the money, um, but not this crop, not in this neighborhood. We can't do it. It's, it's just absolutely overwhelming. And I'm really afraid of what it will do to the property values. I have a lot of investment in my property, and that's a big part of my retirement plan. I would hate to see that jeopardized over smell of a crop. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. John Chris, then John Begay, and Sophia Lara. Good afternoon, members of the board. Mr. Powers, uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak. I'm John Chris, the Chief Executive Officer of the Farm Bureau of Ventura County. And first, I just want to say I appreciate the immense amount of time and effort your staff has put into trying to develop good ideas for how to, how to address this issue, uh, particularly Ed Williams, our Agricultural Commissioner, and, and your CEO, Mike. Um, they've done a lot of work, and I, I appreciate that. I just want to point out that farmers are members of this community, too. They live in these communities, and they have no interest in being bad neighbors. Um, it's really unfortunate that the 2019 hemp season caused so much conflict with residential uh, you know, homeowners and residents. Um, nobody wants to see that happen again. And so, you know, we really are just fine with taking some appropriate steps to mitigate these potential conflicts. Nobody has an interest in, in perpetuating that. But we believe it's really important to be flexible and proportional in your approach. Um, the board, in our belief, should adopt the least restrictive measures necessary to address the issue effectively, rather than starting out with sort of the easy, lazy, and dumb approach, which is just slap a blanket ban across the county. Um, that doesn't recognize the complexity of land use in Ventura County. And lastly, I just want you to think about the really broader implications of the actions you're contemplating here. You're, you're declaring as a severe threat to the public good a crop that's legal and recognized as such by both state and federal law. 
and you're preparing to tell growers how, when, and where they can grow their crops. And if you don't think that terrifies the agricultural industry, you haven't been paying attention. Thank Thanks. you for your testimony. John Begay, then Sophia Lara, and Dieter Wolf. Am I saying your last name right? Supervisors. Um, apologize, I got a splitting headache, but uh, I am actually a farmer. I, uh, I raise avocados, and I was 20 years a grape grower in Northern California. And I'm very sympathetic to the farmer's needs and so on. But I'm really worried uh, that the supervisors are, you know, you're facing making policy and law here. And uh, I, I think that there's a lot of misinformation out there about this. And um, I'm very concerned about the greenhouse potential for proliferation there. And uh, I think the Ag Commissioner himself said uh, a lot of the filtering processes are untested and unproven. And I'm very concerned we're going to end up with a proliferation of greenhouses and a lot of odor issues and so on. And he didn't address the hardening off issue, uh, taking these plants, putting them outside adjacent to the uh, greenhouses and, and uh, just prior to flowering. And we could have a lot of odor from that. And uh, anyway, I just, I think you need to really fully understand the facts and, and um, understand before you make policy. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I hope your headache goes away. Sophia Lara, then Dieter Wolf, and uh, Esla Kaplan. Uh, I just wanted to uh, address the board. Thank you for allowing us here today. I wanted to start with the Ag Commissioner continues to say that they, these flowers only, these, uh, the smell is only when it flowers. It's not. All of, our, all of us can tell you that it, the, this, this smell is a very long duration. Um, I don't understand why they need a, a window of nine months from April to the end of October with a 30-day grace period on the front and the end of that, extending that. Um, if this flower, if this only takes two months to flower, why are they doing this? Because they're rotating the crop so many times, which means there's many times that there's going to be flowering during that April through October um, time, time frame. Um, we don't want any indoor or outdoor plant, uh, hemp or any cannabis, no greenhouses. They're not effective at mitigating the odor. The setbacks need to be farther than half a mile. That's an arbitrary number that has not been studied and is, has not been shown to be effective at any odor mitigation at all. Um, there's too many loopholes, confusing and vague proposals. Um, I just worry that you know, it's, it's going to be even unenforceable for the Ag Commissioner to enforce this on the farmers. Um, he's even said that, um, you know, he, the Ag Commissioner does not investigate every odor complaint either. So he has really no idea how bad it smells for us when we're complaining. Thank you for your testimony. <clears throat> Dieter Wolf, Elise Kaplan, and Jonathan Lopez. The farmers are writing the rules now. <clears throat> the following applies to after the 45 days. Uh, long term, just say no. The overwhelming out outturn at the Board of Supervisors meeting in Moore Park confirms what we already know. Somebody dropped the ball, and together with the bravado of a few cannabis farmers, the many hardworking, taxpaying families had reached a breaking point. Mostly, most recently, Moore Park, Camarillo, and other cities have put a stop to it, and now the county has an opportunity to pivot on this issue and keep Ventura County running harmoniously together. FYI, I supported SOAR, but I do not see greenhouses working to solve the issue. I draw this conclusion from 34 years of dealing with odors as a commercial property manager. I am <clears throat> not sure about the half mile <coughs> as I live in the inversion uh, area. For anyone to compare the cannabis odor to broccoli uh, or onion means that they have, uh, they actually have no idea what they're talking about unless they have breathed it. I personally feel that the Ag Commissioner has ignored and misrepresented facts to your homeowner constituents requiring us to come down here and he needs to be replaced with a better, more balanced Commissioner, one that will perhaps develop a way forward for farmers that does not trample on, the, on my right to breathe. With thousands of residents and 53 farmers, the decision is obvious. Please stop the toxic hazardous odor for good. Thank you for your testimony. Elise Kaplan, then Jonathan Lopez, and Anthony Volinger. Good afternoon, members Volering. of the board, and thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Elise Kaplan, and I've lived in Ventura County my whole life. I'm with Vertical Wellness, and we oppose this moratorium. 
This is not an issue warranting an urgency ordinance as there are currently no plants in the ground and thus there's currently no immediate threat to public health or welfare. This ordinance is being considered largely because of anecdotal claims made by residents in the same county that voted to preserve ag land through SOAR. Passing this ordinance opens up a slippery slope state of affairs where all ag land in the county is at risk for becoming unusable anytime a group decides they don't want that particular crop anymore. This urgency ordinance is contrary to the purposes of SOAR and the right to farm ordinance. Furthermore, we ask that you realize this was year one and mistakes were made across the board from the federal regulators all the way down to the local farmer. Please allow hemp farmers and the Hemp Farmer Coalition time to innovate alternative odor mitigation solutions and create a comprehensive, workable, permanent ordinance. These solutions cannot be explored or established if the farmers are not allowed to farm in the meantime. Please allow us to do our due diligence and be good neighbors. Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan Lopez, uh, then Anthony Volring, and Charlotte Craven. Good afternoon, members of the board. Uh, I just want to say thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Jonathan Lopez, and I'm with Company Vertical Wellness, and we oppose this moratorium. Um, you know, a lot of stakes mistakes were made in this first year, you know, up and down the board from federal regulators to local farmers. Uh, we have a coalition, a coalition, the Hemp Farmers Coalition in this county that we've already been working with. We've had a few meetings already and in that time we've had, you know, we see areas where we can improve um, such as there was no established planting season or harvest window uh, this past year. So we said for about, that maybe extended the smell for about two to three months, even more, um, because there was no set established season. Um, also, you know, we have the opportunity to properly regulate this legal crop. And I ask that you take the time to really look at the implications that you're setting for not only the next 45 days, but beyond that. Um, and I'd like to just finish by saying I'm a first-hand example of the good that hemp can do. Um, I graduated from college last year in 2018 and I was looking for jobs and drowning in student debt and no one was going to take a young guy with no experience and I found the, the company that I work for now and they were able to start me off with a salary. I was able to, you know, make a, a, a living wage, you know. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Anthony Volring. Then Council Member Charlotte Craven and then Mark Rosenbell. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair and Supervisors. <clears throat> My name is Anthony Vollering and I'm involved in two greenhouse operations in Oxnard in the Plains. Uh, one happens to be on Gonzales Road and one on Rice Avenue. Presently, we do have tenants that grow hemp. So, personally, I don't grow hemp. I recognize that odor is a potential problem. However, I'm not aware of any problems or complaints with regard to the two locations I just mentioned. So, I would suggest that the proposed mitigation measures that you uh, initiated the previous meeting will not affect present locations because uh, there are no complaints. Hemp is a legal crop. We have legal greenhouses. We have leases that are legally binding. We did already do away with our flower crops. So we cannot just go back because obviously we, our clientele is gone. So I want to just ask you to be careful with whatever restrictions or stipulations, limitations you put in place, that this existing situation will not be hampered and impaired. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Council Member Charlotte Craven, then Mark Rosenbaum, and Mark Kendam. Last Wednesday night, the City Council of the City of Camarillo <clears throat> uh, voted to place a ban on growth of hemp within the city limits. Excuse me, I've got what Jeff had. <laughs> this is something that Camarillo residents have been complaining about for a long time. If you look at the Camarillo map, we are completely surrounded. There's groves over by Spanish Hills on the west, 
over on the east by Leisure Village, north of us, and the vast majority of what's grown in the county is south of us. But it doesn't matter which way the wind blows, we get the odor, and the people knew it. And this odor prevented our residents from the enjoyment of their property. So you have the farmers who have a right to plant what they want. You have the property owners and homeowners who have a right to enjoy their property, and there's a big problem there. We believe that the, one, the half mile is much too small. We believe it should be a one mile border or buffer, whatever you call it. And you also need to look at the map. Camarillo, for some strange reason, calls rural exclusive zone, a zone that is full of houses but has no lighting and no curbs, no sidewalks. That's rural in Camarillo, so that needs to be included. Thank you very much for your testimony. Mark Rosenbaum and then Mark Van Dam and Dave Norman. Good afternoon, Supervisors. Thank you for uh, your time today. Uh, my name is Mark Rosenbaum. I'm an attorney that represents uh, Serenata Community Homeowners Association, which has 534 homes. Uh, it is located adjacent to La Tierra Road. Uh, I, my law firm provided the supervisor with a letter dated January 9th, 2020, which set forth the parade of horribles that all these homeowners have been enduring during this crop, this entire season. I want to point out a few things, though, quickly. You have a problem. The proposed moratorium has so many exceptions to, you, to it that it will be, you will be unable to determine if the problem is solved. If you set a proper buffer, which should be one mile, and there is no odor, then you can start to add those exceptions of greenhouses, of um, plants that are not flowering yet, but you have a problem that's not addressed. Additionally, the proposed moratorium also doesn't address daycare facilities, health care facilities also uh, that are within the region. It's limited to schools. Also, you have a situation where the proposed exceptions will swallow this, this rule, especially the one about five acres or less any good lawyer is going to go ahead and create a situation where every owner will own in a separate LLC five acres or less. Thank you very, very much for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Mark Van Dam, and Dave Norman, and Jeanette Lombardo. Chair Long, Supervisors, Staff, Mark Van Dam from Moore Park. Thank you for your continued interest and open minds in this issue. I'll keep this simple. Hemp is good. Farmers are good. The noxious smell of hemp is not good. Farmers need to farm, but this is a new crop. The homes were here first. The schools, the parks, the hospitals and businesses were here first. They were here before hemp was legalized for growing. The half mile buffer zone is a good starting point, but should be reevaluated at a later time as well as the effectiveness of greenhouses and fully enclosed structures. This issue needs to come back to the board, this board, where reasonable and fair regulations can be formalized. We also need an advisory board comprised of farmers, residents, and city representatives who can work together. The APAC and Ag Commissioner represent farming interests. The additional measures consideration presented slide did not come from residents. Those were recommendations from farmers who sit on the APAC. This is not about hemp. This is about the odor that was never an issue in the past. You have had not had this room filled with complaints about farming until now. Thanks. Thank you for your testimony. Dave Norman, please hold your clapping. Dave Norman, Jeanette Lombardo, and then Christopher Danch. Thank you, board. Dave Norman, city manager of Camarillo for the next 75 days. <laughs> congratulations, by Thank the way. Thank you very much. A I sad loss it. for Camarillo, but congratulations you. to you. The agricultural commissioner's buffer zone map does not account for the city's rural exclusive zone, which allows for residential development as a permitted use in our zoning code, and is also a designated residential zone in our general plan. In practicality, this means that the Spanish Hills and Sterling Hills neighborhoods and also the uplands neighborhoods are not included as a contributor to the buffer zones, even though these are long established neighborhoods. 
In addition, there are no buffer zones around Cal State Channel Island's dormitory housing or around base housing at Point Magoo, all of which are all of which these situations must be addressed. We also ask that you consider parks and golf courses to be buffered because they are heavy recreational uses. We thank you for your consideration. Thank you for your testimony. Jeanette Lombardo, Christopher Danch, and then Stephanie Mayer. Good afternoon, my name is Jeanette Lombardo and I own California Food and Agribusiness Advocates. I am a consultant that has just organized the Hemp Farmers Coalition. We are opposed, of course, to this moratorium. I agree with the Ag Policy Advisory Committee, the Ventura County Ag Association, the Farm Bureau. We have a right to farm. We, um, everyone here that's complaining signed their loan documents at closing stating that they realized that. We don't believe in setbacks. We believe we can manage this problem with best management practices. And we, this is not an urgency situation. There is no hemp in the ground. Hemp came to America, uh, to North America in 1606. There is no health issues. There is no safety issues. Our farmers out here have security on every one of their sites. So the issue really is welfare. And what is welfare? But well-being and happiness. And clearly, there's a lot of people in this room not happy. We are hearing the neighbors' concerns. Uh, we know the gr growers want to ease tension. We know what's happening in Sonoma at 600 feet. We feel that is reasonable. They are similar to Ventura County. They have the same urban interface issues that we do. You're elected, you get to decide this. God bless you. We think we can find the middle ground. If we can't do 600 feet, we need to look at possibly a quarter mile, which would be 13, 1,320 feet. Thank you for Thank your you. testimony. Christopher Danch. And then Stephanie, Stephanie Mayo, and then Monica Arudi. I apologize for messing up names. Great. My name is Christopher Danch. Uh, I'm with the uh, Hoban Law Group, uh, a law firm uh, that is both national and international, that works in part to see the development of hemp as a true agricultural commodity and using it as the, the amazing plant that it is to produce many things. We believe that the current craze for CBD is misguided. Uh, that's not, it can be, in our terms, just the gravy and the actual use of the plant and its 25,000 plus industrial uses uh, is the meat and potatoes. We are entering a period of time of, of resource depletion, which is going to include the reduction in the affordability, availability, and quality of fossil fuels. That's real, that's a geologic fact. And we are looking at that in climate change and other problems that require adaptive responses to this problem. This amazing plant is part of that adaptive response, something we've all lived alongside as humans for about, I don't know, a couple of thousand years. And it needs to be something that as a major agricultural county, you take a look at how this up and coming crop, not for CBD, but for all its amazing uses in the future as a long-term view, how this county can accommodate this as a major agricultural county, because it's coming. And this plant is something that needs to be regarded as an agricultural commodity and developed as such, taking into concerns of people who are in the area as well. So I urge them in the long term to see how this can happen, not if or wouldn't. Thank you happen. for your testimony. Thank you. Stephanie and then Monica Aruni and then Gazil Nazel. I think I'm getting tired. Sorry about that. I know. <laughs> and you <laughs> sound sick like me, and you were sick back in November, so sorry yeah. about that. Darn it. <laughs> um, I'm Stephanie Mayo. I live in Serenata. I've been up here a few times now, trying to hope this resolves soon, because it's mm -hmm. really feeling like it's drawing out. We had the meeting in Moore Park. We thought everybody heard us. We were all on the same page. And then our residents are going, what's going on? No one's hearing us because now we have all these loopholes and waivers and we feel like we're not safe with what's gonna be grown, we don't know. Like, are they gonna grow something and surprise us like, like they did last time? Um, the half a mile setback at the end of the last meeting, they were, t Steve Bennett had asked the Ag Commissioner about the other, we have some other Ag areas besides the Tierra Rajada plant, uh, plot 
And I don't know if it's going to cover that, so someone needs to look at that because we don't want to. I mean, the breeze is going to come, and it's just like a little a little ways over. It's still going to come and, and affect us. Um, and in terms of greenhouses, it's not working in Carpinteria. All you got to do is look. I mean, we're worried we're going to have greenhouses. The light's going to come in. We're going to hear fans, and it's still not 100% odor-free. I mean, that's what the Carpinteria residents are complaining about. All we have to do is do a little research. And um, as, oh, the nurseries, too. You know it smelt before it bloomed? Thank you. And then it also smelt after they harvested. So the plant smells even though it's not blooming. Monica Arduni, then Grisella Nazel, and then Lynn Matthew. Okay, I'm Monica Arduini, and I, I probably should go by my married name, Smith, right? No, you're fine. It's <laughs> me, not you. Well, thank you for having uh, uh, me to speak again to you very quickly. Um, and most of my neighbors, I thank them for saying most of the things, points that I wanted to hit about. But I wanted to talk about the greenhouses. I think they should be uh, not outside the setbacks because I do believe that any ventilation system they have is going to still blow out up into my neighborhood. And when they use language like this odor mitigation tool is promising, this odor mitigation tool might help, uh, it's, that's not a proven fact. And we can't wait for them to develop something before we you know, decide it's OK or develop a, a seed that it doesn't smell. And the other thing I want to talk about is the um, please be conscientious of any loopholes that are, is suggested by the hemp commissioner and by the farmers, I mean the ag commissioner. And uh, because, for example, a five uh, acre waiver would allow them to subdivide that big lot, you know, on Tierra Hata, and they'd be outside the setback boom, you know. And um, I think that's pretty much all I have time to talk about. But uh, thank you for having us. Thank you for your testimony. Grisella Nazel and then Lynn Matthews and Debbie uh, Slezik. Hi, I'm Grisella Nazel. I've been here a few times. I know every time I come, I talk about the same thing, about me having migraines and the smells that are really bad. I feel very bad for the farmers, especially you guys, you know, with the fire and all that, and I'm so sorry for that. I, I hope they find a way to be able to plant, you know. But really, close to our homes is really bad, and, and it affects everybody. We've been all complaining. I, I don't think the greenhouses either work, because as she said, you know, you just need to go by Carpinteria and see what's going on there. I don't know about the half a mile zone. Maybe it would be better, better more than that. I just want you guys to think and, and remember that, you know, we are not happy with what happened last year. And it was all throughout summer. We could not enjoy a day of summer last year because we couldn't go outdoors. It was really bad. I, I don't have much more because I already said so many times. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Lynn Matthews, Debbie Slezak, and then John Slezak. Hello again. I've been here many times as well. My name is Lynn Matthews, and I live in the Serenata community. Uh, and the hemp is being grown right across in the Tierra, Tierra Hada Valley. And with the inversion layer, it just holds that odor in there, and it comes into our homes, into our cars, into our um, uh, everything. And we can't go outside either. Uh, this last season, the smell lasted from late August to late December. So I'm hoping that you'll approve the um, urgency ordinance today, but also approve permanent setbacks uh, away from homes and schools and parks. And I would also be against greenhouses or growing starts within the setback area. And, and according to the Right to Farm Act, we only have three years to prove something is a nuisance. So we don't have time to explore low odor varieties, which I'm not sure they'll ever exist. Um, and I think we've already proved it's a nuisance um, by all of the complaints from our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Debbie? And then next is uh, John and then Sherry Ackerman. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Debbie Slezak from Serenata. First and foremost, we need setback ordinances now, and we want them before the next, in front of the next planning season. I oppose an ordinance permitting allowing exemptions in any form of the construction of greenhouses. Greenhouses, in fact, will create more health and safety issues, including air and noise pollution. 24-7 fans and dehumidifiers are needed. Light pollution, the LED lights will be uh, unbelievable. The impact will be a negative effect on human health and the change in the night sky. Semantics. We are tired of hearing from the Ag Commissioner odor, low odor, no odor, sensitive receptors. It is known and has been stated these hemp cannabis, sativa, indica are what the strongest breeds specifically with um, uh, the high terpenes. And keep in mind by the greenhouses, and this is by Director Dr. Laura Hoppard, uh, keep in mind that no matter what, there's no odor, contro odor control out there that's going to be 100% in greenhouses. Financial impact, we have to disclose our property values are at risk, and we have to disclose if we go to sell nuisance, noise, neighborhood problems, and odor. It is not anecdotal. The health concerns of chronic bronchitis <coughs> um, becoming more pronounced and apparent. These are not anecdotal, and these are people who have seen doctors. Um, we also know that there is no filtration system. Cannabis has much stronger smell than almost any other odor in the world. And who are these people Thank you for your that testimony. are going to be constructing Thank you these, for your testimony. Thank you. These John greenhouses. Slizak, then Sherry Ackleman and uh, Marty Douglas. Good uh, afternoon. I guess it's still the afternoon. I'm John Slazak. My wife, Debbie, and I are concerned residents in the <laughs> Serenata Belfiore tract in Moore Park. We're about 300 yards away from 90 acres of hemp groves planted in mid-2019, which are causing a public nuisance in our homes, parks, and schools. The Serenata residents have been requesting an urgent moratorium against the cultivation of hemp in the unincorporated Tierra Rajada Valley where it is directly adjacent to the Serenata tracks. The hemp groves in the unincorporated valley are causing a public nuisance in violation of civil code sections 3479 and 3480 in the adjacent incorporated Moore Park Serenata residential tracks. We support that part of the proposed Ventura County ordinance that provides for a buffer between the planting of any hemp and any residential area, although we believe it should be a one mile buffer rather than a one half mile buffer to uh, protect uh, the residents. However, creating a buffer and then allowing loopholes in the form of greenhouses would, which have questionable efficacy would not solve the nuisance and would introduce new problems. We do not believe there should be an exemption for the growth of hemp in any uh, buffer zone, especially a, only a one half. Thank you very much. Sherry Ackerman. Buffer zone. And then Marty Douglas. Thank you. And Carol Hunter. Thank you, Thank you so much. Hi. Thank you for letting me speak as well. I'm nervous. <laughs> I'm Sherry Ackerman and a resident of Moore Park who's been aver adversely affected by the planting of hemp in the unincorporated area of Ventura County. I'm asking that the Board of Supervisors vote in favor to adopt the urgency ordinance today so we can get proper regulations moving forward for the future. I agree with all the homeowners here regarding the stink, so I am just going to comment on couple sentences that I did see while reading the ordinance, and that was before I did see today. Some of these sentences may be truncated for uh, timeliness. Section one, temporary prohibition, uh, prohibits planting a half a mile within a residential community or school. Um, that sentence fails to mention public parks or recreation. I'm a tennis player. I play at Miller Park. Um, the park has well, you know, it's recreation. I don't want to be inhaling it. Uh, the children who um, practice softball there, though they should not have to have that either. So I think it needs to mention the recreation, and it needs to be farther than a half a mile. My home is almost a mile from the Tierra Rajada crop, and it's like it's in my backyard. Uh, next is the Prohibition B refers to outdoor planning, however, allows greenhouses. 
greenhouses are going to bring their own set of nuisances. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, light pollution, energy. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next up is Marty Douglas. Carol. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Sorry, it goes by quick. You did well, though. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Um, I believe the standard should be no smell for people to have to smell this horrible, noxious, sickening plant. Um, how do you get that way? A firm setback and a half a mile is just not enough. We've had lots of testimony as to how this smell carries way beyond that. So if you do that, you're going to have people upset coming back saying that it didn't work. Are you going to be locked into that or can you fix it later? Um, that would be some help. No greenhouses, they do not work right now. Um, they should be doing their research elsewhere and then coming with it when it's complete and then you can stamp it off like, yes, we've proven that it works and now you can do it. Not, the people are guinea pigs, so we'll just let you keep going and let's see, five years, we don't know, however long it takes. No loopholes been discussed. Um, they're gonna have a lot of little farms everywhere. The attorney can help them out and make that happen. Um, add please, private schools. All children are important. Preschools, all daycares, private or public or any which way, all colleges the whole college. I wouldn't even send my child to Cal State, Channel Islands right now. I've been out there and smelled that stench. And it's all day long. I know people that work there. It's not just at certain times. You need to add businesses. Is it all right to be at work and have to be suffering from these symptoms? No. Um, and all recreational facilities need to be protected. Harvest by October 31st. If you vote for that, are you saying that it's all right to Thank make people sick testimony. until October 31st? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Carol Hunter, then Terry Bogdanwitsk, and Tony uh, De Devera. Oh, I just had Carol Hunter, thank you. No, oh, you're passing. That's what I was, I was gonna say, I didn't get you. Okay, Terry. Thank you. Hi, I'm Terry Bogdanwitsk. Huh? Oh, sorry. Please go ahead. I'm Terry Bogdanowitz from, um, I'm a, uh, the HOA president of Groves 3 HOA in Somis on Groves Place. Um, I'm actually very concerned. You have a very difficult job in front of you. Uh, the fate and quality of, of thousands of homeowners may be in your hands today. Uh, the stench from the proximity to Hemfields is a known fact. The negative health effects exhibited in residents near Hemfields is a known fact. Negative impact on home values is a given. I'm a realtor, I can promise you it will be. Um, would you personally want to live next door to one of these facilities? That's a question you really need to ask. If property values decrease, taxes will decrease, so the amount of taxes paid by all homeowners will decrease. Uh, as for greenhouse regulations and odor control, again, you're in unknown territory. I was a former inhalation toxicologist for DuPont, and years of studies are required before unleashing an unknown compound on the unsuspecting public. And if that did happen, the company would be totally liable. So to control odor in a greenhouse, the structure would first have to be airtight. The facility at 3900 Groves Place is absolutely not airtight. Visible openings can be seen in the plastic. Thank you for your testimony. And uh, the half mile Thank radius. You for your testimony. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. I, I gave you a little bit more because it was 123. So. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate you being here. Nicole uh, Lurunk, and then Audrey Overton. After uh, Tony. Tony's up. Hi, my name is Tony DeGuerra. I'm a resident of Ventura County for 45 years. I'm a farmer. Uh, we grew quite a bit of hemp this year. I guess, you know, I'm just going to wing it this time. I don't want to make a statement. Um, I understand we all, as farmers, understand the odor issue. I think the main thing everyone needs to understand, this is a first-year crop. I think there's a lot of opportunity and uh, options for the board to consider on regulation. And I think there needs to be a safe, understandable buffer put in place, but also some time for us to develop. It's, like I said, it's a first-year crop. We harvested late. The odor issues 
came from the crop being in the ground too long. So going forward, I think there's a ton that can be done for the odor. And I think to over-regulate it isn't necessary at this point. Thanks. Thank you for your testimony. Nicole, then Audrey Overton, and then Lucas uh, Seibert. <coughs> okay, thank you. I'm extremely nervous. <laughs> Um, I live in Moore Park next to the Tierra Fields, and when my four kids found out I was coming here to speak to you, they wanted to come and tell you a few things about how the hemp field by our home has affected their lives. Um, but unfortunately, the time didn't work for them to come today, so they gave me a few quotes to share with you. A quote from my nine-year-old, kids can't enjoy playing outside because the hemp smell is super duper stinky. The smell makes my head hurt. My 12-year-old said, when it was growing, we couldn't play outside because of the wretched smell. Now that it is gone, we are really enjoying playing outside again. I wish you could see the scowl that my 7-year-old said or made when he was talking about how he can't ride his bike when the smell is out there. And my high schooler can't practice basketball in our backyard because the smell makes him so sick. Um, so as you talk about these things to figure it out, I don't want to raise my kids here while you're figuring it out and have that smell affect their lives. It's been persistent and noxious since the day it was planted and it only got worse as it progressed. Um, it causes us headaches. My husband is causing migraines. He used to only get them once every four to five months. Now he gets them every week. Um, and this Christmas was the first time my kids played outside over those two weeks of vacation more than they had since it had been planted the entire time because we finally had some relief. Um, I'm just asking you to consider setbacks. A mile would help us, a half mile would not protect our home. And there's plenty of open space far from neighborhoods and schools where it can be grown safely. But kids should be able to play outside without getting headaches and getting sick. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next up is Audrey Overton, then Hi. Lucas Seibert, and Jean Johnson. Hi. Um, I think I've talked to you guys before. Uh, my kids, uh, we live in Santa Ana. And my kids go to school in Camarillo or at SRCMS. Their, their school is a mile away from the hemp farms, and they smell it because we have to drive back and forth. So, you know, a mile setback, I don't know if that's the right number, but they do smell it at the school. And both of my kids have sinus issues now since July, never had it before in their entire life. They're both healthy kids. They both swim on competitive swim teams. And, you know, they're tired of having sniffles all the time. And I don't, I don't like to give them meds. It's just they're too young, 12 years old. So, um, you know, that, that setback, I think, needs to be reviewed. I think, um, you know, I am a realtor in the area, so I can tell you that clients do not want to live near hemp. You know, I don't know why anybody would want to, um, but it will eventually decrease the values. People right now are not selling because they don't th they think that their house will be worth less, and I'm sure that's the case. Um, and I wouldn't be able to bring buyers, you know, into Serenata because other than Cantera, which doesn't smell as much. But um, so anyways, I just wanted to let you guys know that, and hopefully you guys, good luck. <laughs> Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Lucas Seibert, and then Jean Johnson and Bob Simic. Uh, Yes, good afternoon, uh, members of the board and chair. My name is Lucas Seibert, Community Development Manager for the City of Ojai. I'd like to read this into the record if I could. On December 10th of 2020, the City of Ojai attended the Board of Supervisors meeting and read into the record our concerns regarding the regulation pertaining to the industrial hemp. Recently, the City Manager, James Vega, attended a meeting on January 20th with the Agricultural Commissioner and several representatives from other cities, as well as representatives from the Supervisor's Office and unincorporated communities of Ventura County. The buffer zones were discussed further at that time. The proposed urgency ordinance includes establishing a one half mile buffer from residential uses and existing residential uses within the unincorporated areas and schools depicted on a map which is attached to the draft ordinance, urgency ordinance. The city supports the establishment of one half mile buffer. Additionally, the city of Ojai supports the position of the city of Camarillo, uh, which, which is that letter is dated January 9th which urges the board to include as part of the buffer the following additional uses, hotels, motels, golf courses, schools, any school, and parks, and urges the board to implement this standard countywide. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Jean Johnson, then Bob Simic, and Rob Roy. Good afternoon, Supervisors. I'm Jean Johnson, and I cover California for a national nonprofit called Vote Hemp, which has been educating about hemp for 20 years. Um, last year, half a million plus acres were registered in 30 plus states, and there's been no regulation anywhere else in the U.S. based on odor or health issues. Um, granted, with 
the, with the climate in California, which allows for a longer season, that the issues could be accentuated here, and that's, that's controllable. As the agricultural community knows, your severe restrictions would set a very dangerous precedent that could allow banning of livestock and other odorous uh, agricultural commodities. California had over 40,000 acres of hemp registered last year and across 28 different counties. Um, of those counties, the vast majority had no ordinances or land use restrictions. Um, and of the top 20 ag counties in California, all but one either allow or will be allowing in this year the uh, cultivation of hemp. So 28 counties grew in uh, the past year and wanted to talk a little bit about setbacks that were found in other places, just so you have, and I have that information, I'm happy to share that for those counties um, that, that implemented these policies. Uh, Merced had 200 feet from property lines, 300 feet from special receptors. San Joaquin, 200 feet from res residences, 1,000 feet from special receptors. Uh, San Luis Obispo has pre prepared its ordinance, and they're looking at 300 feet from setbacks from residences. Thank you for your... And I urge you to not you be highly restricted. Morning. Thank you. Appreciate it. Bob C. Mack, and then Rob Roy, and Chad. <laughs> yeah, good afternoon, or good evening. My name is Bob Simak. I'm with the United Water Conservation District. And I wanted to focus my comments on, in the context of water resources. Um, three points. Uh, 80 to 80 to 100 percent of the water that's used in agriculture is groundwater. In 2014, the state mandated that all groundwater basins should be sustainable. Uh, that's point one. Point number two, um, there's two options. Uh, of getting into sustainability. One is through um, using less water, conservation. The other one is to secure more water. Point three, because water is a scarce resource, the cost of water will rise, period. Point four, uh, besides labor, water is one of the key el uh, economic components in agricultural operations. Uh, therefore, any crop that potentially reduces the use of water, like industrial hemp, uh, should be, um, would help us maintain uh, sustainability, water sustainability, and at the same time, uh, maintain the economic viability of the agricultural industry. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Rob Roy, then Chad Ferguson, and Anne Meek. Uh, Good afternoon. First of all, congratulations. Thank you. Board members, Mr. Parks, Rob Roy, Ventura County Ag. I'm here today basically as a matter of principle. And the principle is, is that this county has locked up agriculture until 2050 because they want agriculture. They want farmers. We have a a state right to farm ordinance, we have a local right to farm ordinance, and yet we have one neighborhood out of the entire county, and most of them are right here in this room, that is seeking to control the issue here. The bottom line is, is there are hundreds of thousands of other people in this county that aren't here today, that aren't complaining, uh, th that, excuse me, that aren't complaining about this issue, uh, and yet we have a group that's trying to shame these farmers into really essentially go out of business. Uh, there's a lot of reasons stated why this crop is good. It's lawful, creates jobs for more farm workers and other farmers in the county and all kinds of ancillary uh, industries. So I think you have a difficult balancing test here on the right of these farmers to exist uh, and the right of these folks to have the enjoyment of their property. But I don't think this board should be shamed into forcing these farmers out of business. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Chad Ferguson, and then Ann Meek Schindler, and then Richard Barron. Barn. Hello, Chad Ferguson. I oppose the moratorium. Thank you for the board for listening. Our oceans, according to John Abraham, Professor University of Minnesota, says our oceans are absorbing the heat from five Hiroshima bombs every second of every day, 365 days a year. 
What you're gonna vote on is an environmental issue, not for people's immediate health, but for people's long-term survival. U.S. fertility studies shows median P level, phosphorus level decline in North America is upwards of 6%. We have had a 16 to 19% reduction in soy just this year across the whole United North America. I want you to look at it at a different picture. There are over 50,000 uses for hemp. It takes less water to produce this crop than any other crop. Jacques Cousteau, Noam Chomsky, Stephen Hawkins have all encouraged us and said we have got to reduce our carbon footprint. Hemp is the number one carbon credit crop. The paradigm shift is right now. You guys have the vote in your hands to make it happen. Don't make rash decisions and make this crop not viable in Ventura County. Thank we need this crop testimony. worldwide. Thank you for your testimony. And meet Schindler, then Richard Barron, and Akasha Ellis. Yeah, good afternoon, CEO Powers, Chair Long, members of the board. Uh, my name is Anna Meek Schilder. I am the director of the University of California Cooperative Extension Office and the Hanson Agricultural Research and Extension Center in Santa Paula. And um, I'm sympathetic to, to both sides of the issue. Um, uh, it reminds me in some ways of the issues we've had in the Netherlands uh, with pig farmers, large pig operations. Um, and definitely agriculture sometimes smells, and to me it's, uh, you know, there's an occasional smell you can deal with if it's something that's very long, that, uh, you know, in duration that would be an issue. But uh, my main concern is that um, the current uh, or the ordinance would also include um, our research center, and we would like to do some research on, on the odor mitigation or low, lower odor varieties to study that, and so in a small plot, maybe a half an acre uh, plot, we would like to be able to do research and I'm, I'd just like your consideration as to how we would deal with it because we're located next to Briggs School. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Richard Barron, um, Akisha Ellis, then Kurt Edward Neff. Hello, Richard Barron from Barron Brothers Inc. In, last, in uh, 2018, we farmed hemp in Ventura County under a research MOU with absolutely no complaints. Last year in May, uh, we registered and grew over 80 acres with no complaints. It is, a, as a farmer, it is something that will sustain all farmers. This was the beginning and we plan and we need to plan how to harvest. We started in May is when the, uh, we, we were able to start this year and so we were all scrambling to figure out our harvest methods now we're all ready to go out and start buying equipment and then all these things are happening and with proper um, harvesting in place there won't be fe uh, fields of hemp sitting out there stinking up the place I you know it's something we have to deal with but we, we're concerned and also the Sonata area the farmer that was doing that that grew that he doesn't even want to plant next year. He, he realizes what happened. This was new. We're farmers. We care about our neighbors. So we hope all of you think about it and don't hurt farming. It's needed in this county for jobs and for uh, making the place a, a better place to live. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Nope. Uh, Akisha Ellis and then Kurt Edwards Neff and then Denise Edwards Neff. Hi, Council. Thank you for having me today and allowing us to speak. Um, I also farmed in 2018 under an R&D, and there was no complaints. And then this 2019, we farmed upwards of 700 acres, um, primarily in the Oxnard Plains. We did not receive complaints either. Um, we were able to have about 40, 40 people working for us during the height of the season and then outsourcing the other acreage, another 80 people employed during that period of time. I ask you to please very much consider how your, your decisions will make on what I believe, as another gentleman had said, this plant can heal. It's not just healing us as a human being, but it does begin to clean the soil 
It begins to clean the air, and it does affect and help our children down the road. And that's a huge impact in our county and how we see it can help all of us in this area. Um, it also affects us water conservation. We grew less than a foot per acre. Most vegetables are growing two feet or more as a conservation for this plant. So I hope you very much consider your decision here. The setback of a half a mile will affect half of our acreage that's at the McGrath Family Farm. It's very important to us. We're also inviting Rodale Institute. They we're setting up a chapter there to do organic regenerative agriculture, and we're using hemp as the study. Um, we would very much like to continue to promote organic farming in this county, again, to help our community. I hope you take this into consideration. Thank you very much for having us. Can I ask you a question? Yes, sir. You were talking about yes, sir. this year. Was, was, was that hemp acreage? It was all hemp acreage. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you for your testimony. Kurt Neff, and then Denise, and then uh, Heather McGregor. Good afternoon. Um, my wife and I moved into our home in Ventura County in Moore Park in August of last year. And um, it wasn't disclosed to us that this, there was a stink in the air. I thank you, by the way, for taking my call yesterday. It's nice to talk to you. Um, it wasn't disclosed. From here on out, every home that's, that goes up for sale in Moore Park, it's going to be in the disclosure from the real estate agent and the, seller, and the sellers. We're going to have to disclose this stink. It's, um, property value is going to drop. Homes are not going to sell. Who would want to move into this area when it stinks like this? Um, I urge you today to pass this ordinance. It's necessary, but you need to do more. You need to make this permanent. You need to be decisive, at least a mile setback. No, no loopholes, no greenhouses. Um, it's, if, if you don't do something definitive, we're going to be here next month. We're going to be here in May. We're going to be in June. We're here next year talking about the same issues. People are going to get more and more angry more and more frustrated. It's frustrating today just to sit here. You know, I'm supposed to be at work. My phone's buzzing off the hook. You know, everyone here in this room should be at work. You know, that's, that's where they want to be. Instead, they're here because of how bad the situation is. I urge you to take action today. I urge you to take action as soon as possible. Fix this, fix it now, fix it permanently so we don't have to be here month after month. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Denise Neff, and then Heather McGregor and Rosaline Ayuv. Hello, I'm Denise Edwards Neff. My husband said a lot of things that I would like to say, but let me just start by saying I have a PhD in public affairs and issues management. And this is how our system of government is supposed to work. People are supposed to be able to have input about matters that affect them. And so I appreciate you doing your duty as public servants who've been elected. Um, and yet we come taking our time off from work and um, after having months of uh, uh, facing these challenges in our neighborhood and in um, coming to multiple meetings and we are presented with a proposal that is not fully consistent with what was decided by the board in December where we are uh, trying to decide uh, taking time to decide what is a school and you know I guess that's not public schools and not preschool children is the the proposal doesn't seem very well developed um, and definitive and then we also are listening to a proposal by the Ag Commission Commissioner um, that reflects farmers' interests and is not represented by any residents. Um, and we have no, there's no evidence that some of the solutions will work. Um, I am trained in doing research, so I have done a lot of research. I, these con con complaints and concerns that are not anecdotal, are, there's a lot of evidence across the country in every state in multiple counties in states that have started hemp farming. Thank you for your testimony. Heather McGregor, then Rosalind Ayub, and Sharon Kirshner. Good afternoon, board. Um, I was here in December, and I also commented. Um, I personally, I want to find a compromise between the farmers and the homeowners. I think that's why we're all here, and we have to respect one another. Farming is good. And um, it's a lot of the reasons we moved here. It's a beautiful community. It's open spaces. Um, one of the things is I think there's so many people from the Sarah Monata community because we've had one person organize us. And so I understand that there's not a lot. A lo the majority of the people are from the Sarah Nada that are commenting. But there is, I think, a lot more people would be here if they were as organized as we are. Because I know that there's, I've heard comments from people when I go play tennis and other 
cities, and they've, we've talked about this, but the reason that we have so many comments here and so many people coming and so many people complaining, it's not just Serenata, it's the crop. Um, and I don't want to be coming back here in a month, in two months. This is a lot of effort to come and take out of our time. It really, really is. Um, my kids are eating macaroni and cheese tonight. Um, I'm here. And so um, we need to find a solution. And the loopholes are not a solution. We need to um, figure out a definitive plan that will be a compromise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Rosalind Ayub. And then Sharon uh, Kirscher and Karen Vaughn. R Rosalind, you here. Last call. All right, moving on to Sharon. Come on down. Followed by Karen Vaughn and Matt McLean. Hi, my name is Sharon Kircher, and I live in Newbury Park, and the smell of the hemp across from Cal State Channel Islands is absolutely, it was absolutely awful. I couldn't open my front windows, and that's about three and a half miles away. Our son lived in Cal, at Cal State Channel Islands in that area and went to school there. It was so unbearable that we moved him up to our house. You could not breathe, you could not go outside. So there needs to be a really big buffer zone. A half mile buffer zone is not gonna cut it. The other thing that I find just awful is you have the city of Camarillo saying, I've been to their meetings. It is absolutely horrible. The businesses are doing poorly. The people can't go outside. They can't enjoy their parks. And there is no buffer zone between the county of Ventura's hemp land and the city of Camarillo. And then you have the city of Moorpark. I've been to their meetings. The cities themselves are asking the county to do something. And I'm not seeing that. And a half mile buffer zone is not going to do it. And loopholes aren't going to do it. Something needs to be done. And I, I just feel like there should be a ballot measure. Thank you for your testimony. Karen Vaughn, then Mac, Matt McLean, and Justin Benton. Good evening, supervisors. I'm Karen Vaughn with the city of Moore Park, and I'm here on behalf of Mayor Janice Parvin and the Moore Park City Council. Uh, the city has significant concerns with the ongoing permitting of hemp cultivation around the boundaries of Moore Park. Based on the draft urgency ordinance before you this evening, the city of Moore Park is asking the following. One, that you expand the half mile buffer area to a larger distance. According to feedback from many Moore Park residents, the smell of hemp planted in the Tierra Rada Valley was a nuisance even a mile and more away. Two, that you apply the buffer to the entire city limits and not just based on different uh, land use zoning. No resident, business owner, or visitor to Moore Park should have to endure the smell of hemp. And three, that if you do go with a, a zoning-based uh, buffer zone, that you identify Moore Park College as a school for that purpose. We also want to provide input on your permanent hemp uh, regulations and that you establish a permanent buffer distance that is based on science and not just based on complaints, that you apply the buffer to be measured from the entire city limits, that you establish a limited window of time during which hemp plantings would be allowed, and then most importantly, that you direct county staff to pre-schedule board review of the permanent ordinance within four months of the conclusion of the planting window so that you can evaluate the effectiveness. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Matt McLean, Justin Benton, and Greg Hayward. Hello, board. Uh, Matt McLean. I have a PhD in cannabis history and psychology. I also run a nonprofit research foundation, and I sit on the Industrial Hemp Advisory Board with the CDFA. Uh, I'm here today as a small farmer. I have three small research plots within a half mile buffer. Uh, in Ventura County, we've invested considerable capital into our research facilities, and we employ uh, 15 employees at peak. Uh, and we've done so <coughs> under a one-year CDFA registration of a state and federally legal agricultural product. 
Uh, I'm here today on behalf of scientific research. Uh, we conducted the research in 2018 on the test plots. Uh, inventory accounting of 60 acres in total. Um, to date, there's been a lack of medical evidence presented that the terpenes from hemp are the cause of the symptoms and such are not psychosomatic. No doctors have stepped forward through these hearings to make the corollary. Uh, more importantly, there's no scientific evidence that a half mile buffer will have the desired impact to mitigate the community's concerns. Um, cause of concern for my, myself within this urgency ordinance, there's no exemption for research and development and that would prevent universities and research foundations from working on low terpene varieties that the public so adamantly demands. So I humbly request a uh, research exemption for established agricultural research and Thank you for your testimony. Could I ask a question? Is your uh, research facility associated with the university? Not currently, but it will be prior to uh, the definition changing in CDFA law. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dust, Justin, and then Greg Hayward and Phil McGrath. Hi there, thanks for taking the time to uh, hear us out. Um, I know it's getting long, <laughs> I'll try and make it quick. Uh, my name is Justin Benton, I'm here with California Hemp Council, uh, the Holbin Law Group, and 101 Hemp. Um, I'm just gonna read most of this into the record as fast as I can. Um, we're here to uh, write in strong opposition of item 45 on today's agenda. Uh, item 45 would prohibit outdoor hemp production. Uh, for reasons stated below, that this item unduly infringes upon California's Right to Farm Act fails to consider reasonable alternatives and ignores the unique factors from last year's growing season. California's Right to Farm Act protects agriculture activities, operations, and facilities from becoming a nuisance if those activities have been ongoing for three years. This section shall prevail over any contrary provision of any ordinance or regulation of any city, county, city, or county, or other political subdivision of the state. Uh, California Civil Code 3482.5, the statute does not require the agricultural activity be a specific crop for three years, but rather agriculture activities and operational general. Uh, according to the extent of the proposed urgency uh, and ordinance attempts to infringe upon hemp's production carried out where agriculture activities have been ongoing for three years. Um, finally, Ventura County is, ex is experiencing a perceived backlash based on the new introduction of a crop under unique circumstances, the combination of the hemp registration program commencing late in the year together with unusual weather. Thank caused you for your testimony. You guys have the And your letter. Uh, Greg Hayward, then Phil McGrath, and Adam Vega. Good evening. Ventura County has a lot of points of pride. A sensible discussion on this topic is yet another. Uh, yet another is Water Einstein. Water Einstein is a company that is uh, partnered with Semtech and the Rodale Institute that's just opening up in Camarillo to bring technology and data into this discussion. <coughs> we can help the Ag Commissioner by putting cameras and sensors in, uh, on the farms, on the schools, everywhere that it's necessary to understand what the impacts are and how to regulate it. We can also understand the benefits, carbon credits, oxygen production, soil health, water management, and a myriad of other things are capable. The farmers want to be good neighbors. The farmers, any business owner doesn't want friction with their partners and their neighbors. So Water Einstein is going to bring relief to that. Everybody has said that they, they don't think that the smell mitigation is something that they can expect to be resolved. I can tell you that the money behind it, the technology behind it, is driving for this to happen. And we will see this within the foreseeable future. So thank you again for the sensible discussion, and I look forward to bringing data into this so we all can understand the impacts. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Phil McGrath, then Adam Vega, and Josiah Gonzalez. Good afternoon, board. Um, thank you for hearing me. It's a Good thing we're not a dairy community, huh? I guess nobody would have moved here then, though. You have to address us. <laughs> Supervisor Long, I want to make sure you got the uh, email from the Rodell Institute today. It was late, so maybe you haven't seen it yet, but I want to make sure everybody reads that. It is a wonderful organization that uh, 
is here to promote organic agriculture, and they are coming for the study of hemp, the odors, the terpenes, which is, I don't want to be repetitive, but I did attend the Camarillo City Council meeting last week, and the city councilwoman, Susan Santangelo, so eloquently spoke to terpenes. So as farmers, we plant female plants. We don't want the male plants. The male plants are the ones with the pollen. The terpenes that you get from the female plants are the same as terpenes in roses, same as pine trees. I'm sorry, it smells so bad, but you can't talk about allergies when there's no science to back it. Please. Certainly, it smells bad. Thank you. This address over here. Oh, okay. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that everyone understood that it was terpenes, and we Thank you for do our best testimony. to get the male plants out. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Adam Vega, then Josiah Gonzalez, and Daniel uh, Gabri. Good afternoon, uh, County CEO, staff and board. My name is Adam Vega. I'm a lifelong resident of Ventura County and active member in this community as a District 17 LULAC Environmental Advisor. I've spoken before you multiple times on a wide array of issues, including today's agenda topic, hemp. I'd like to first thank Commissioner Williams for his presentation and highlight the importance of his role in our county. I'd like to apologize for the lack of respect shown by all those who moaned, groaned, and scoffed. As someone who has worked closely with our county, state agencies, and government, uh, governor's office to cancel one of the most harmful and outdated pesticides used today, uh, you know I'd be the first one here scheduling a meeting with each and every one of you, especially Commissioner Williams, and you know I'd be out here speaking before you in forums such as these. Uh, the topic of my 2017 senior capstone focus on incorporating hemp into Ventura County in an attempt to promote a crop which is less chemical intensive, water intensive, and easier to work with. In the two years since I've written that paper, I've been invited to present before the Cal EPA, the Department of Pesticide Regulation, on model outreach strategies focused on safe, sustainable, and climate smart agriculture. Hemp is a key crop which we cannot afford to lose. Next time you eat, remember the hands that picked your food. Remember the type of agriculture they'll be subjugated to. Because if you don't believe me, see how debilitated you feel after bending down, picking strawberries from sunup to sundown. How nauseous you'd be from working in blistering heat around petrochemical-based pesticides and fertilizers. Odor and health impacts? Look at the data. Look at the thousands of pounds of petrochemical-based chemicals and fertilizers used in the county, in your neighborhood, before you complain about odor and health impacts. Let's see the ELISA, the RAS test. False alarms like these are disrespectful and detract from those who are truly impacted by harmful agriculture. The farm workers and communities that look Thank like me who testimony. live in communities Thank you and for your two testimony. Sacrifice zones that Josiah you Gonzalez and then Daniel Gabri and Olga Gabri. Good evening, board. Uh, I've heard a lot of the uh, complaints and um, all the other concerns that all of your constituents have here today. I, I just to avoid repetition, I just wanted to uh, let you know that I'm here based on principle alone. Um, I do believe that hemp is a very, very valuable crop. Uh, it has the potential to not only heal soil, but wa water, uh, including s soil sludge, sediments, and surface water and groundwater. Um, I've heard a lot of people say today that, um, you know, uh, people are not going to want to live here. Uh, I disagree with that because I grew up in Fillmore, California. I grew up in this county. Uh, I've actually been wanting to leave uh, Ventura County because I don't feel like there's enough opportunity, especially having a, being a current graduate of California Lutheran University. Um, looking at hemp and what it can do for our county, that's actually changed my mind. So there, there is going to be, you know, um, different opinions in terms of who's going to want to live here and who's not. But at the end of the day, okay, hemp can provide not only healing for our environment, our groundwater, but also provide jobs and provide a future for people who live here, who are struggling here, and also want to continue to live here. Okay, Me being someone who grew up in this county, I would prefer to stay here. And I think hemp, having a future in Ventura County, means that I have a future in Ventura County. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Daniel Gabri, then Olga Gabri, and Sienna Maria Sesama. Hi, my name is Daniel Gabri. I live at 1347 Pleasant Valley Road in Camarillo. I bought the house originally 30 years ago. I'm out in a rural area. If you look on a map, you'll see I'm surrounded around agriculture area. It's the only property that's a half acre there. So I sit out there. I have no interest with farmers or anything. And I always see them out there and I chat with them and whatnot. 
But anyways, if, literally, if I cross the street, um, 50 feet, I'm already right in, in front where, the, uh, where it's being planted. And so my right 10 feet, that's not being planted there, but there's where I'm at. I'm surrounded around egg. Anyways, um, I've been through it all. Um, the, what do you call it, the uh, strawberries, the cilantro, the um, tomato, even Brussels, uh, those Brussels sprouts, um, parsley, everything. Nothing has ever bothered me than this hemp. Um, the smell, when they first planted it right in front, of, there in front of my house, I thought it was tomato. I go, oh, wow, they're planting tomato. So every time I'd wake up in the morning, it'd be like there was a smell, and I'd go, wow, what's going on? So I'd get a deodorizer. No, it's still, the smell never went away. I decided to go across the street and go check it out for myself, and sure enough, it was hemp. So um, the smell is just very, very strong. It's literally like skunk. And I don't know, there's, I found out inside the house there's only one way to take care of it, is baking chocolate chip cookies in the morning and in the evening. But what do you do when you go outside? Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. A I'll go Gabri, and then Sienna Maria, and then <clears throat> King. Yes, hi, Olga Gabri. I live in Oxnard. And I just want to say, I think uh, maybe more Park and Camarillo got the stinky stench of the crop. I have nothing against hemp or its uses, but if we can't do something about the smell, I just don't think we should permit it because it infringes in people's quality of life. <coughs> I'd go and visit my brother who he says lives right across the street and I'd go home to Oxnard and I would still have the smell on me. If I got stopped by an officer, he might even think that I was smoking it and I'd be harassed for that. Um, <clears throat> one of the council people in Camarillo said, yeah, do they steal avocados? Because we had, they gave the records of what people were stealing from the fields. People would go with trailers and take the hemp. Yeah, people steal avocados, but they don't go with some methamphetamines on them as well. So I think that adds to our crime potential for Ventura County. I think that we should prohibit the hemp, period. Not temporarily, I think it's something that should be stopped. The headaches, the nausea, you just cannot escape from it. If somebody lived there right across the street or within that half mile, that buffer's not gonna do anything. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. testimony. Sienna Maria, then Cynthia King. And that's the end of the speakers. My name is Sienna Marie Sesma of Mary Jane Services. We work with hemp and cannabis businesses with the licensing and compliance throughout Southern California. We understand the concerns from the community because this is so new. And I request that the Board of Supervisors consider that hemp is simply another agricultural market for our county and a potentially lucrative one that brings benefits to our farmers, our economy, and thus to our community. Please do not impose an unfair disadvantage on our agricultural sector. Hemp having an aroma is no different than any other, many other agricultural products. It is not toxic, and typically only female seeds are grown, which means pollen levels are at a near zero. Hemp requires a minimal organic pesticides and is a huge water saver, all great things for our community. By saying yes to hemp, you can help keep more farming families in business, repurpose our established agricultural infrastructure within counties where costs are high, and every competitive advantage must be utilized to survive. Agriculture provides thousands of jobs, and the industry must be allowed to evolve to keep these jobs. We all gain from safe access to medicine and the products made from hemp cultivated right here, therefore keeping it local. Let's position ourselves as a trusted location for, highly, for high quality hemp production. The growers in our area are not the drug cartel. They are local farming families. We are asking that you let our farming families grow a healthy product and to continue to honor their right to farm. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Cynthia King. Hello, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I didn't come here today planning to speak, but I'm a member of a small farm family, and when somebody said the houses were here first, that did it. <laughs> <laughs> the King family has been farming this land across from Fillmore for 107 years. 
we've been there a lot longer, not me personally, but <laughs> although I am older, but <laughs> we've been there a lot longer than many of the houses in Ventura County. And um, we've had a really hard year, a really hard year. I think it's important for people to understand the reality of farming between having the person who was leasing our land up and stop paying rent for eight months and then abandon the field full of nutgrass and the high heat wave that we had in July of 2018 that caused 98% of our avocado crop to drop when they were little baby avocados just dropped in the ground. So those have conspired to give us a really hard year that we're barely surviving. And we're looking at what else can we do in that, in that 30 acre field. We've already been turned down by people who also grow row crops because of the net grass that the previous tenant left. We looked at maybe we'll put oranges back in. That's what the grandfather had planted. But HLB and the citrus psyllid makes Thank that you. not work. Thank, Thank you. you for your testimony. OK, clerks, this is, that was the last testimony that we have. Um, that I will public, you have not turned in a card. You need to turn. You did. Your name? Dan Holton. Dan Holton. Do we have him? Good. Please go right ahead then. Sorry, we missed you. Apologize. Thank you. We've got your 90. Keep it short and sweet. Uh, Dan Holton, the property that my wife and I own, uh, it's been ranched and farmed for over 100 years. We lost our orchard in the Thomas fire, avocados and citrus. And like the young lady that preceded me, uh, what's the best crop to grow that doesn't use a lot of water and is actually very beneficial. It's only beneficial to the soil. It's beneficial because it's a low water usage and it's got medical issues, uh, properties. So thank you for seeing us through the first year of unique grow. Uh, that's the best way I can describe it. There are solutions out there, and I know with your wisdom, uh, we'll come to a good solution, and hopefully in the next uh, harvest will be even better, and thank you. Thank you for your testimony, and I apologize we missed you. All right, with that then, it closes for public comments. Thank you very much. There was a lot of really good feedback from our community, and I just want to say thank you for your time, first and foremost because I know today we won't please everybody, but I do want to say thank you so much for your information and your feedback. I just want to set that tone, first of all. Um, I, does any supervisors have any uh, questions for our Ag Commissioner based on the feedback that we had? Supervisor Zaragoza? Yeah, where's Ed? I, in the map, Ed, I... Um, if you can come down, that would be wonderful. When I saw the Camarillo map that, you know, the... Laurie. And I spoke about the nylon acres. I didn't see the complete covering of nylon acres, or did I miss it? How do I see the... You, you know how you had your uh, your um, map up there, and... Um, that question wasn't real clear. Um, when you sh is that the cam camera map? There you go. This is the, this is the overall map. Um, and the Nyland Acres area, let's see, is, is this area right in here. Oh, okay, but it is complete. Okay, so the That's green... That's all in, in the half mile. Uh, the green center. part would be uh, west of Santa Clara then? Yes. Okay, okay. And the other thing, too, is uh, in the committee, have you set up the committee of, uh, of uh, ag uh, uh, growers and so forth and also the public uh, person, I think... Uh, well, since the since the December tenth meeting, we've met with three different groups. Mm -hmm. uh, we met first with a small focus group of growers, uh, who came up with a lot of these proposals. Uh, we also met with the Ag Policy Advisory Committee, which is a public meeting which had both uh, growers and some residents. Mm -hmm. Although uh, it was mentioned tonight that the uh, number of residents was uh, not not. Uh, as as many as the growers uh, and then and then uh, last Thursday we met with a group of about 20 25 uh, representatives of uh, 
City of Ojai, City of Moore Park, City of Camarillo, uh, Somas uh, mm -hmm. community area, and other residents who had uh, expressed an interest in assisting with uh, with this preparing this ordinance. Yeah, I think uh, if I can remember correctly, there's an individual from Moore Park, but. Mark Van Dam, or Van, I, I think was his name. Yeah, Mr. Van Dam that was he wanted invited. To, he, to, he wanted to participate. Uh, um, to to the APAC meeting yes, as well uh, as the community meeting, but he wasn't able to to, to attend. Uh, apparently, he wasn't. He was out of town at the time. I think it really would help tremendously if we had a private individual meet, you know, with a group, you know, if, if he can be invited to that, and I'm, I think he's from Moore Park, if I'm not mistaken, you know. So yes, he uh, was he was invited to uh, two of the meetings. Two me well, continue to invite him because I think he wants to have. Uh, <laughs> he can give. Us, what? Anyway, anyway, go ahead and 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 invite him again, you know, to make sure we, that he gives us input from the from the public. Uh, hmm. I did have a question for you in regards to the city of Camarillo was requesting that the RE, RE zone in Camarillo also be included. Um, that's more Spanish Hills, Sterling Hills area, or are you familiar with those zone? Yeah, if you, um, and, and we understand that, and we're, you know, that's, that'll be your prerogative, and we're more than open to doing what you ask us to do. Um, I just wanted to point out this is the area that we're talking about. Spanish Hills is inside here, which is actually already buffered significantly by other uh, residential areas outside of that. So it is, um, and I, I'm not sure exactly, to be honest with you, uh, where Sterling Hills is on the map, but uh, that that I could, uh, May need to be may, may need to be included. Okay, and then the oh, come on, and, uh, that way. And Mr. Williams, and then also um, there was a question in regards to research and development. Is there any special rules and regulations on the research and development side of things? Um, any any research institution under um, Senate Bill One Fifty Three that was put into that went through the legislature this year has got to actually register with my office. And um, so we do have some um, purview over those um, uh, um, research uh, operations. It's not the same level um, as uh, for commercial production, um, but there is, uh, they have to tell us where they are and what they're doing. So. Okay. And then, does that also include the UC Hansen? That location? would be that would be considered a research institution. Okay, because that was a request that I had heard, and I wanted to understand that. Along with it, um, we are also with the schools on the safe schools that we were talking about earlier that had to be registered with the state. Okay. Um, that would also include uh, the city colleges or the um, state. It it only goes through. Um, 12th grade it does not include universities and and colleges mm -hmm. um, so that would kind of need to be addressed separately okay and then along however uh, I will mention that there is a daycare center at Cal State Channel Islands which would be uh, you know should be registered with the state and that would have the same effect uh, if if you chose to add that Right, yes, it is registered with the state. Um, and so then the question is that half mile buffer from that one location versus the, the uh, actual U uh, university that would include the University Glen on that, or if that was an RE zone, but I don't think so because it's on state land. Yeah, the University Glen would actually be included okay. uh, because it's it's behind uh, Cal State Channel Islands from the agricultural areas. Okay, so, so that's that, a good clarification. That's good because I, I um, Chris Williamson was concerned about that. You know, he's one of the first speakers that spoke about having coverage there right behind the university. So that covers it. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Supervisor Parks? If we, if we were going to uh, include the universities and colleges, um, that would include Moore Park College. 
we just say, well, Cal State Channel Islands has a preschool, so we don't need to include all the colleges. Is there a, something that would buffer more part college? Um, and, oh, well, let's, let's see. Um, I'm not sure exactly where more park college is. I'm sorry. It's, it's, it's there's a high school on campus, so that would take oh, care I of the buffer. Okay, well, that's that's good. That would be northeast. Other colleges are in the middle of a, you know, uh, urban areas, essentially. So, okay. Well, that's and that's good. helpful. The reason why we ask also is the city of Moore Park called that out. Mm -hmm. And so we are trying to work with our cities as partnerships as also. I want to make sure that people know that and recognize it. Um, any other questions for uh, Mr. I, um, Gims? No. Uh, Supervisor Zarco. But I don't have a question. I, I just want. Um, I do have one question. If go go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there is a lot of concern about the effectiveness of odor control in greenhouses, and um, we've been given the fact that the odor comes from the flowers, you know, the budding and the flowers. So um, the idea that I'm thinking about is just don't allow in that half mile buffer plants that flower. And that would mean it would exclude those greenhouses that would be growing flowering plants. So um, what percentage of, you know, greenhouses are actually growing flowering hemp plants? Um, it, actually, that's not, a, um, most of the greenhouses that are producing propagated material are actually growing cuttings and for, for transplants. Um, there are some that will be growing for seed, um, but it's less than, um, the majority you know, are than for regular nursery uh, production. Um, so uh, there might be a, a few, and there's about 8%, I believe, of the uh, acreage in the county that's been registered for, sea, uh, for uh, propagative material. So the greatest majority, 90, 90 plus percent, is being grown for, for uh, biomass and, and oil. Okay, that, that's good to know, because that, and that's kind of where I'm heading, thinking about it's so difficult. We're watching what's happening in Carpinteria. Mm -hmm. The um, technology needs to catch up <laughs> to the flowering. So the idea of just don't allow flowering plants, whether they're in greenhouses or otherwise, in that setback. That would have a significant impact on any odor issues. On which? That on would have a significant impact it would on be very effective odor for issues. Odor and then we don't have to worry about the tremendous process of trying to guarantee the greenhouses aren't going to have odor. And what it what is nice about this is that we do look at it every year because they have to come and re-register. So the idea that if we do the half mile um, and not allow flowering within that half mile, that might take care of our problems. If not, we can come back uh, and, and look at that again and see if we need to extend that distance. Bye. On that question with the greenhouses, the research and development. So yeah, I, 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 that I, was a question. Yes. I think that there was some discussion on if we can elaborate right. on that. I, I agree that um, it's important to allow for the research and development. And there, I guess there are registered uh, state, the, uh, the state, state law has allowed for the registration of these research firms. So. I'd be in favor of considering allowing for that research. So uh, you know, the Hanson Trust and well, yeah, and the reason being is so that we can have better crops, no smell. Yes. I mean, I want to advance this technology. So if we don't, if we don't let them do the job they're supposed to do, how do we evolve? Right. And again, if it turns out that that's a big problem, we can look at it for the following year and say, you know, we can't do that either. Right. So it, it gives that opportunity. So I'd like to make some comments. Um, address that issue just yes. a little bit. Mm -hmm. That was actually one of the suggestions that were made during one of the focus groups is that um, small acreage of research facilities be allowed within the half a mile. And the discussion was no more than five acre. Okay, uh, that's good size. to have that restructure. Oh, so that's where that was coming from. Yes. 
Okay, because I, I think we know where the current research facilities are. My concern would be any of the future ones, so then everyone turns into be a research facility so they can be within the buffer. I don't think anyone would want that. So that's my question. They have to be affiliated with a university or college after the state and federal laws. Okay. Align. Supervisor. Uh, I'd, I'd like to make some comments. Uh, I'd like to make, I, I know we've been here for hours and hours, and we've been, we've been here since 8 o'clock this morning. But I want to thank, um, Madam Chair, I want to thank uh, our Ag Commissioner, and I want to thank our County Council for, for this report, for excellent report. And to Ed Williams, I think you've done a good job, and, and to the folks, you know, don't shoot the messenger. Ed, you know, is working for the county, working for staff, and he's he's not the one that's either working for the farmers or for the, the uh, he's working for both entities, the farmers and our residents. And, and I, I just want to use that old adage, don't shoot the messenger. He's the one that's being given directions to, to give us information here. And again, um, I believe that uh, we're going in the right direction. You met with a lot of the constituency that uh, you spoke about just the other day you know, over at, the, at your, uh, at your um, office. And again, the county council has worked diligently and quickly in this. And as we all know, the, uh, the passage of the Federal Ag Improvement Act of 2018, the Farm Bill, hemp became an illegal crop in communities across the United States. And now here in Ventura County, we have about 3,600 acres registered folks that can grow uh, hemp. But I believe that some of the folks I mentioned today that they reported uh, they get sick. And I believe that the odor is real. And I believe that uh, one of the things that we researched in my office was that the Agency for Toxic Substance and, and Disease Registry says that odor is... Uh, an illness could be an illness, and that uh, it, it attacks children and elderly folks, pregnant women are the most sensitive to those odors. And of course, some of the uh, symptoms that was shared before, those headaches and shortness of breath and wheezing and high in nose, throat, infiltration, you can see with our chair what's happening to her. <laughs> nasal, <laughs> they have. <laughs> nasal congestion and so forth. But I, I also have, uh, put health and safety first and, 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 or hot water. and I think it's really it's really important so I support right now the the 45 day urgency ordinance and also I support you know the half mile sensitive receptors and because of the schools and I also want to add all schools private schools and so forth because I think our children are extremely important for all of us hospitals and residential zone areas and of course within the county and also city churches and so forth. And except, you know, also there, there's an exception. I think hemp has many benefits grown in the right place. Uh, it was shared, it saves water, it's, it's virtually pesticide free, it's a soil redemption, has soil redemption properties, carbon capture, and it has many, many uses that I think are really important to all of us and to the farmers. But I think grown in the, in the right uh, areas, in the right place, it can help us. So I think that the benefits of hemp is a worthwhile crop. And by having all of us work together, the, the residents, you know, and the farmers, and making sure that we have the right uh, odor um, uh, uh, conditions, and, and, and make, make sure that it really helps for both parties. So I, I really support, you know, the ordinance that, uh, that, uh, that was mentioned before. Uh, the 45 days and, and also the uh, half mile sensitive uh, receptors for that was proposed by staff. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Supervisor Huber. Yes, I uh, thank you for being here. I, uh, I, grew, I grew up in Kern County, which is a huge agriculture county and I've been around agriculture since I'm all my life actually. And um, one of the things that has occurred to me as we discuss this is because um, the bottom line on all this discussion, because it was gone over this a couple times, is the smell and how, how harsh it is on people, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, has, any, has anybody involved the Air Pollution Control District on this and gotten a report back from them and an analysis from them how we, did, how we deal with it from, the ex, from that expert point of view? Um, actually, we've talked to um, uh, the Air Pollution uh, Quality Control District and 
Um, they agree that there are volatile organic compounds that, that these plants give off with terpenes, um, but they have also stated that they don't have any um, uh, direct data because they're, they don't uh, regulate agricultural operations. So they, they know that there are some, some uh, volatile organic compounds that are given off, but they don't, they don't have uh, data on that yet. Um, I also spoke with um, Dr. Levin, our county health officer, and asked him if he had any, uh, had heard of any issues or any concerns related to uh, the hemp odors, and he, he did not. Uh, he hadn't heard of any uh, issues, um, and um, so so that's what I have to go on. Okay, I'm just surprised because the, the bottom line on this is this, this is not a, just a first, this is we've had multiple discussions on this, and everybody keeps coming back to this terrible, terrible, terrible odor. Okay, and uh, why the air pollution control district wouldn't be involved already and get their feedback on that, because this is what this is, air pollution, and that's their job, to control orders. And to, I, I'm just surprised. I'd like to at least have us consider sending it yeah. over to them and get some feedback from them, because that keeps coming up. And the whole bottom line on this is the, is the air pollution. But, Madam Chair, you know, as you and I were, the, yes. all of us are APCD, and yes. I think that we can ask La Lockie, you know, to give us a report on that, and I think it would be appropriate that, that we have it at the APCD. In fact, we had a meeting today for APCD, but we can surely bring that, uh, agendize that item before the APCD. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Council Member Pollock had already requested that. Exactly. Right. Getting something back on the VOC. From more part. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Along with the questions on the urgency ordinance, uh, the board is directed the ag directed to come back with a recommendation on the proposed ordinance established. Are we prepared to come back in January 2020 for a proposed ordinance? I think we should give more time. I agree too. The more, we need more time. Then. And I also uh, found that a lot of the items that you are looking at are really worth looking at. The from the waiver, if all your neighbors are okay with it, then you know that half mile doesn't have to affect um, the idea of more and better signage and low odor push. You know, encouraging the low odor plants, um, but and and the look at, at lighting. But the the, the concept of uh, trying to get that all tomorrow so you can have it on the next Tuesday's agenda. It just doesn't seem realistic. So I, I'd like to give more time to that. Yeah, that's why I want each staff so right. I agree. Uh, Leroy would be probably, Leroy would. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. He's all stop me. <laughs> so, Thank you, Leroy. <laughs> uh, we, can, we can work to quickly draft um, language and have it ready. Um, Our next board meeting is the 21st. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I don't believe we'll have it ready to put into the, sire, the, the system by tomorrow. And, we, and we're going to be off-site next Tuesday. Mm -hmm. We're going to be in Thousand Oaks. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, we would just encourage you to do it at the you know, quickest available time that mm -hmm. you, you can do it. <laughs> you know, February. Right? February sounds good if that happens. In February? Yep. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm just in February. So the reason why I'm stating that is because I don't want our public to think that we're just letting things slide. We are trying to be conscious of what our staff's expectations in reality can do and also make sure we are setting the tone of, of getting on this. And more steady too. Yes, mm -hmm. and to the, make sure we're doing accurate mm -hmm. decision the, the presentation tonight, the additional mitigation measures was um, our attempt to meet your request from the December 10th meeting. Mm -hmm. And I, I see this as the bottom line is a delicate balance between protecting our residents and, and, and protecting a, a crop that could be a major right. crop in this county. Right. Mm -hmm. So then that's part of it is, is having the ordinance come back to us in February then. Um, mm -hmm. The second, first one is the uh, thing today that is a four-fifths vote, which is either a agreement to move forward in this urgency or to make any amendments or modifications to it and then approve it. I, I would like to uh, suggest that we take staff's recommendation. <clears throat> we have a, a good uh, ordinance here. I'd like to make two changes to it, though, and that is to uh, allow for exempting legitimate research institutes.
that um, that's something that our agriculture commissioner can look at, and they have to be five acres or less. And then secondly, um, I'd like to uh, modify 1B, Section 1B, to include wording from our agricultural commissioner. So uh, for purposes of this ordinance, outdoor planting means any planting other than, and what I'd like to say, other than uh, propagating propagative plants, and you describe those as propagative plants in containers that are not flowering. Propagative plants include live plants, seeds, seedlings, clones, cuttings, transplants, and other propagals used to establish uh, plants for planting. So uh, the greenhouse exemption wouldn't be there. Uh, certainly if they want to propagate in greenhouses, that's fine, as long as they're not flowering. And I think that's the key. In that half-mile buffer, no flowers. And then we don't have to worry about what kind of odor control is going on in the greenhouses. If technology comes and it gets good, you know, we can, again, we can look at this every year as uh, each time these registrants have to re-register. So those are the two changes that I would and, make. And in your motion, you'll include uh, private schools and all schools, too, then? Yeah, so that the mm -hmm. third needs to be included into the uh, schools. That's as, right. uh, Supervisor Zaragoza stated to the state uh, registered schools, yeah. uh, the pre-K through is K through 12, though, is isn't that, it? Is that what the state registry does with the pesticide safe school program? Yes. I, I, yes. Okay, so and then, then we'll be using those same yeah. schools. May, Madam Chair, I think licensed daycare centers. Sorry, we're, we we are we are was before you as approving an ordinance. We need the exact language. That's why I'm I'm trying to get it. Okay. So what is the exact language? Licensed. Yeah, licensed. Where, where is that appear going to appear in the ordinance? Oh, let me get that. I think we should put like section one up, mm -hmm. and then edit it. Work on on the board or something and work on that. Okay. And section one refers to any school depicted on the map, right? So we're instead going to go any school. So will we strike any licensed? Yes, licensed daycare. Daycare or private schools or right or as as well as public schools yes so would, any licensed in. daycare Just section one private or public school state state license yes any, any state, state, state license. licensed daycare public mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. private school right do we have to call out what grade um that would be your so schools will cover everything okay right? So the reason why I asked that is for higher education for colleges. So, to so we already cover. found our two colleges both have either a daycare or a high school, right. so it's That's covered right. in that there. Covers it, yeah. Double checking for clear well, I, I need to get the exact language. Yes. Any state licensed daycare? Public. Co daycare, comma. Comma. Public. public or private. Comma. Co or private. Public, school. comma, or private. Okay. K through or, uh, K, schools. K through 12 school. I think if you just left school, any state licensed daycare, college. comma public comma or private school. All right. Mm -hmm. And so that will require a half mile buffer then from those areas. Well, that does not tell you. You have schools but we're, already listed. Is that a K through 12, or is that does that include colleges? Does that include K through professional schools? If you do not, if you do not include the daycare center, so. 12, then it should uh, it potentially include uh, colleges as well. Well, it's hard to read up there, but I say we're, we're going to strike out of A. We would strike after where it says any school. We would strike depicted on the map attached here to right. and made a part thereof. We'll strike that. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to have to then define school somewhere. We could uh, define school right in 1A by using a parenthetical, or we could add what I would suggest is we add a, a subsection D and say for purposes of this ordinance, comma, quote, school means, and then fill in the blank. So, um, so licensed daycare centers, um, it was pointed out, it was suggested that there could be county licensed uh, daycare facilities. That's right. So, so that should be included, any, any licensed daycare uh, center, 
public schools and private schools, mm -hmm. colleges and universities, I think would cover the rest of it. Any licensed daycare center? Yes. Comma, public schools, and comma? Public and private schools. And private schools. Huh. Was it public and private schools? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That would be my suggestion. The public and private schools? And then also including licensed. colleges? No, just have that separate, and colleges comma. and universities. Comma, colleges. Comma. And universities. And universities. Mm -hmm. So it would be school means any licensed daycare center, comma, public and private schools, comma, colleges and universities. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And you take off the <laughs> depicted on the map, on the map attached. Right. We would delete as depicted. That's going to be depicted on the map and attached here too, and made part there. Oh. We would we would delete that. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Now I don't. Um, I'm not, I didn't follow the outdoor planning change. Do, do you want to substitute in the language that was on the PowerPoint? Um, this is, yes, but just um, section II. <laughs> BII from the PowerPoint. Yes. So it's to take out one. Oh, you weren't going to make a D, I think. Right? On section 1B, we would add. Uh, the section II talking about propagative plants, those are the only ones that are other than what can be outdoors. So it would read, it would be amended to read uh, section 1B would be for purposes of this ordinance, comma, outdoor planting means any planting other than planting propagative plants, yes, comma, in containers, comma that are not flowering, period. And then we go on, quote, propagative plants, end quote, include live plants, comma, seeds, right. comma, seedlings, comma, clones, comma, cuttings, comma, transplants, or other propagules used to establish plants for planting, period. Mm -hmm. So that, that would be how 1B would read. Right, mm -hmm. right. And that would be the motion. That it's a motion. And all, but there's also to include um, RE zones. You know, if we include RE zones, yeah. Yeah. you've got 10 cities with rural exclusive. That's this called they're in there. large so lots okay. zoning. Yeah, and we'd have to do that throughout the entire county. Okay. Okay. However, there's residential zones near some RE zones, like uh, was pointed out. So no, those, would, okay. yeah. those would be covered. Be that Venn diagram, so they'd still right. be covered because they're near other residential right. areas. All right. I'm just double checking everything. Okay, so that was the motion. So we have the and again, we have items. that year to you know come back and look and see if anything needs to be tweaked. Well, motion. and this is a 45-day urgency ordinance. Just a reminder. So motion cleared everybody. So the motion, and then there was yours amendment. I thought. That's, that's okay. Address and, and so status. then one is the exemption for the research and development. No, excuse me. Where that is. Okay, we need to plus I, I would I haven't totally I, I'm not hundred percent sure but I'm almost sure we're dealing with industrial hemp research hemp for research has been allowed in the statutes for years mm -hmm. okay. that, that, that that's really a different issue than industrial hemp so it should be a, I don't think we could ban it if we wanted to okay, okay. great well, I'm glad issue. we're talking about this okay Okay. That makes it a lot simpler. Excuse me. With Mr. Williams, were you going to say something? Yeah, I'm, I can't comment on that, uh, Leroy, directly. I'm not certain of that uh, at this time. I would need to look um, at the code. You know, I, I suggest we can use the 45 days to study that, and if that's a problem, we okay. can clarify that. And that's the whole idea behind it. Okay. So then, then um, the motion. Mm -hmm. Yes, Mr. Williams. One other, um, and I... Uh, one other possibility is to um, include um, base housing or, or oh, yes. military housing in the setback uh, or as one of the sensitive uh, receptors. Um, Point Magoo has a, has a residential area that's, that's um, right next to agricultural areas. Um, so I'm it's not sure base. if that's something you want to consider also or not. Do you know what the zoning is? Or? 
I, it's military. It's federal property, so I don't believe it's. It's, it's in. It's in the base. Yeah. So, um, that would be a concern that you can't say federal. We. I don't think we can. We have no jurisdiction. Federal. Mm -mm. Sorry. I think that's something we're going to have to look at. Okay. Yeah. In those forty-five in those days. Forty-five days. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um. Uh, this is a to tough one. Yeah. Okay, so okay. let's, if maybe um, Lori. Lori can read it. Could, <laughs> I'm like tentative to put you on the spot here. Um, but I want to make sure that the community that is here is um, clear with what the motion is. So it would be. Leroy, you're going to have to help me out here. So I've got uh, st approved staff recommendations with the changes exempting legitimate research facilities. Modify one. I think, I'm sorry, Lori, but I think we leave that out. Okay. Because we just approved the uh, staff recommendations. The board letter has five recommendations, right. which include CEQA findings. Right. So what we ask is you approve all the staff recommendations. In the board letter. In the board letter. Recommendation number four is adopt the ordinance attached. So we would say modify the attached ordinance that you're ask, that you're adopting to reflect the changes we stated on the record mm -hmm. to uh, amend section 1A, 1B, and add 1D. We, we already stated the exact wording of those changes, mm -hmm. and I don't think we need to restate it. But those are the only changes to the proposed ordinance. Mm -hmm. 1A, 1B, and we added 1D to 1D. define what schools mean. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we ask is you adopt recommendations one through five, number four as amended. Uh, number four requires the four piss vote. Right. And then also to have the ordinance come back in February. That's Sometime in February. The other ordinance. <laughs> okay. Potentially. Just want to make sure that that's stated. Okay. Sure, but that, sure. that's separate from the urgency ordinance. Right. And I'll, I'll second that. Okay. So who first did it? <laughs> We so have a motion and a okay, thank you. So we do have a motion and a second. Sorry, I was looking at my documents, not the screen. Um, any further discussion? If we can all vote. That's it. Okay. So from what I hear, this uh, urgency ordinance will be back to our board ten days before. We have to make a, a report back at least 10 days before the 45 days. So we'll report back. And it's likely at that same time we'll suggest extending it or, or letting it expire. Okay. And know. so on that also will we be hearing from uh, the commissioner on regards to the proposed mitigation, mitigation future? I would hope before that date we, we'd be back with uh, a recommendation for the permanent ordinance. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, I, I just want to appreciate everyone's hard work on this. Uh, City, County Council, CEO's office, the Ag Commission, all the growers and community members that have been a part of this, also the City Councils. Um, this is a very tough issue for everybody. And um, we will be having more discussions on this. But thank you to everyone for your patience and your consideration and your balance. So thank you very much. Thank you. The word adjourned. Is there anything else that we need to do? All right, so today's meeting is adjourned. You Thank you. Your, your oh, I get to first time I get to use it. Wow. The big one. <laughs>